Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see title what if Naruto became the forbidden child of Artemis the goddess of moon. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. As the village of Konoha celebrated the anniversary of the defeat of the nine-tailed fox just like it had for the last 14 years, a lone figure could be found leaping from the rooftops, invisible from all the civilians and the shinobi. The form was that of a woman but her identity was being shielded by a white cloak that was hooded and kept her face from sight. This woman was an immortal or to be more precise an Olympian goddess. The elemental nations were known by the Olympians and the other minor gods and were visited from time to time. When she arrived in the elemental nation for the first time she marveled at its beauty and how untouched the forests and the wilds were. However she was not expecting to fall in love during her time there but yet that was what exactly happened. His name was Minato Namikaze. The moment she saw him she felt drawn to him. It was not because he was the Hokage of the village or that he was the strongest in the village but because he was just so different to most men that she met. Most men she met were pigs in her eyes, only caring about their pride, their power their wealth, themselves in general. But yet there was this man who was the complete opposite. He was warm, kind, respected everyone round him and even his enemies. He was loved by everyone in the village and yet he was never arrogant, never why, and was never full of himself. He just took it in his stride and got on with his life. But what also intrigued her was that he was a demi-god. Unlike most that went to camp half-blood, he never did but yet he knew what he was. He said even though he never met her, his mother was a goddess and that she talked to him sometimes in his dreams. When she found out who Minato's Olympian parent was she could not believe it. To say she was shocked was an understatement. It was the last person she had ever expected to have a demigod child other than herself. But yet she fell in love with him and spent two wonderful years in this world with him. Then the miracle happened, she was pregnant with her son. At first she had these confused feelings, not completely sure if this was the right thing to do. But when the months went by and when for the first time she saw her child on the monitor of the hospital screen, all she felt was love for her son and wanted to do the whole nine months pregnancy just like normal mortals would. She didn't have to due to being a goddess and there were different methods to conceive and give birth to a child but she wanted to do this the old fashioned way. This way she bonded more with her child the nine months she carried him. Then the big day came and after hours of excruciating labor, which she promptly shouted at Minato telling him, you did this to me you bastard. But then finally her son was born and right then and there she had never been happier than holding her son in her arms. When her son opened his eyes they were sapphire blue just like his father but she could see a twinkle of silver just like hers. Her heart melted and her son quickly took an unmovable place in her immortal heart. But the happiness was quick to end. On the very same night, the village was attacked by the nine-tailed demon fox and the worst had happened. The man she loved gave his life to protect the village he cared about and was left with no choice but to seal the beast into their son. She was weak from just giving birth and was stuck to staying in bed. That night she silently cried as she rocked her son to sleep, failing at keeping her tears at bay. The afterlife was different in this world and his spirit would not go to the underworld like those in her world did. Instead his spirit would go to their world's afterlife, a place she could never visit. Plus now her son carried the power of a great beast that strength could at best match the mighty Typhon, the bane of the Olympians. It had been 14 years since that night and 14 years since she had been to the elemental nations. It had been 14 years since the man she loved had died and 14 years since she had to make the most heartbreaking decision in her entire immortal life. The day she had to leave her son behind. She was an Olympian goddess and the ancient rules stated that all demigod children had to be raised by their mortal parents. But her love died and her son was left without their mortal parent. She wanted to take him with her but her father, the king of the Olympians Zeus, the only one other than her who knew of her son's existence forced her to return to her world. Before she left she was given one last hour with her son, something she was grateful for. She spent that hour with her little boy and safely hugged him into her chest as she gently rocked him to sleep and sang him a lullaby. Once the hour was up, she gave him to the four people she felt she could trust with her son. The third Hokage Hiruzen Serutobi, Kakashi Hitaki the student of her deceased love, 
Jiraiya the Toad Sage the mentor of her love and Tsunade Senju, someone she slowly came to see as a friend. They promised her that Naruto would be safe and looked after. After kissing her son and muttering how much she loved him she handed him over and disappeared, not to be seen again in the elemental nations for a long time. But now here she was in village of Konoha to check up on her son after 14 years, hoping that he turned out just like his father and be one of the few or only male she would come to care about. She jumped and ran with such grace and elegance as she leapt across the rooftops and was not making so much as a sound as her foot would land before immediately taking off again. She glanced over into the distance to see a giant parade of sort taking place with the majority of the village looking to attend. But as she made another jump across the rooftops a small explosion sounded through the area that caught her off guard. Her heightened senses alerted her immediately and quickly whipped out a pair of small hunting knives, slightly larger than those of a standard kanai and the blade was much sharper and had vine-like designs along the small hilts. After shaking herself back to normal and finding the location of the explosion she headed over to investigate and to see if anyone was hurt. When she arrived she found herself looking upon a very odd sight, there was a large group of people massed together with what looked like a boy with black hair that spiked up at the back which she had to admit looked like a duck's ass. He was wearing a blue top with a high color with a crest she recognized as the Uchiha clan crest. Standing next to him was a girl around the same age but with bright pink hair and wore a red battle dress with black shorts underneath. Behind her was an older woman who looked a lot like the girl. The goddess could only assume that was her mother or was someone of family relation. Next to them were two Chunin shinobi and then behind them was a mass group of civilians all of whom were wielding things such as shovels, pickaxes, brooms etc. What's going on? She thought as she studied the scene that stood in front of her. In front of this mass of people where the explosion seemed to originate from, she observed and could just about make out a human figure within the smoke but it was hard to make out due to the smoke obscuring the figure. It took a minute for the smoke to clear when she began to make out certain details of the figure. The figure looked like a young boy around the age of 13 to 14, the same age as the two in front of the crowd. She began to make out his clothes or what was left of his clothes which were orange in color. Then she saw his skin color and noticed it was slightly tanned. But what she saw next left her completely horrified and made her feel as if someone had just injected ice all through her body because she felt cold all the way to the bone. The young boy had blonde spiky hair and from the one eye that was open she could see they were sapphire blue in color and could just make out small twinkles of silver in them. On his face were three whiskers like birthmarks on each cheek. When the smoke completely disappeared and the young boy could be seen clearly she put a hand to her mouth as she saw his body was covered in cuts, bruises and stab wounds. There wrapped in metal ninja wire coated all over in his own blood was her Naruto. Her son. She took her hands away from her mouth and dropped them to her side. She began to clench her fist which caused her knuckles to go as white as a sheet of paper and golden ichor began to seep out from how hard her fist were being clenched. Her eyes were glowing silver as small wisps of silver danced around them and began glaring daggers towards the group of people and was also gritting her teeth with such force that if she was not immortal, they would have smashed and cracked. Anger and rage began to flood her system as an angry tear made its way down her face. Above in the sky and not realizing how out of control her emotions were becoming, the moon in the sky began to turn shades of red which was beginning to catch the attention of a lot of people. The clouds in the sky began to part and the wind was beginning to pick up which began to frighten every villager and shinobi in the village. What the hell is going on? The moon is red, it must be the Kayubi, it must be doing this. So that's why, she thought. These people thought that her baby boy was the Kayubi. She could not believe how blind these people were. However she stopped her thoughts when she noticed the duck-haired boy pulling out another kanai and was aiming at Naruto's chest. Seeing enough and not allowing her son to be hurt any longer, she leapt from the rooftops and landed between her son and the boy that was about get his face rearranged. Her silver eyes bored into the eyes of the boy causing him to take a step back from the intensity they had. After a few moments of silence and the crowd beginning to shout who the hell she was, in a hushed voice that commanded power she said. Get away from my son, then all Hades broke loose. With Naruto moments earlier, have a good night Naruto. Tuchi shouted as Naruto jumped of his stool at the Ichiraku's Ramon bar and began to walk down the streets of Konoha at a quickened pace. The day was October 10th, the day the fourth Hokage defeated the great nine-tailed fox and currently the big festival to commemorate the day was in full swing. 
There were big parades going down the streets with many holding sparklers, food, and drinks and just having a great time in general. The big reenactment of the Kayubi's defeat was just beginning which no doubt would bring all the shinobi and civilians towards it since it was always a big favorite for the village. Coincidentally today was also the birthday of one Naruto Uzumaki. He was 14 years old today and thus far it had proven to be somewhat joyful. He stayed away from the villagers as much as he could and luckily they did not bother him, despite being a ninja now, he still could not harm the civilians of the village. Even thought quite a lot were beginning to show signs of letting go of their hatred for him and become somewhat civil towards him, there were still those who treated him like the plague and would not be changing their minds about him anytime soon. He got some presents from his sensei Kakashi which was new kunais and shurikens made of chakra metal. From the pervy sage he received the Icha Icha book series. This of course gave him a beating from Suande, telling him to stop corrupting him. He even received a few presents from his friends such as Shikamaru. Kiba, Lee, Neji and even Hinata. However he did not receive anything from his teammates Sakura or Sasuke which as of recently he was not very surprised about. Ever since he had managed to bring Sasuke back from his attempt to join Orochimaru and brought him back beaten to a pulp, Naruto's relationship with the two began to dissolve pretty quickly. Sasuke was put under house arrest where his license as a ninja was suspended for three years and Tsunade had Jiraiya put chakra seals on his body to stop him from using chakra and his Sharingan. The civilian council of course did not like this but Tsunade just told them to go to hell. This prompted the boy to completely blame Naruto saying Naruto was taking away his goal of getting revenge on his brother and that he was hindering his true power. He swore that he would make Naruto pay greatly. With Sakura she just followed Sasuke like a loyal little puppy. Just when people thought she was beginning to get out of the fangirl phase, she began to sink even lower. Even Ino who had got out of the fangirl phase would look at her with slight disgust. The way she was acting not only prompted Tsunade to now only teach Ino how to use medical ninjutsu, but it caused Naruto's crush on the girl to pretty much dissolve. It's nice out tonight. Naruto said to himself as he got closer to his rundown apartment in the more shady area of the village. There was no one around so the area was pretty much barren. Everyone was at the festival, congregated into one part of the village which left everywhere else silent and unpopulated. As he walked down the empty streets Naruto looked up at the sky to see it was another clear night and the stars and the moon was shining brightly down from the night sky. He didn't know why but ever since he was little whenever he looked up at the moon and the stars he felt this odd wave of relief and warmth spread through him. He told no one this but he loved the night sky and he just felt like all his troubles were washed away and felt at peace. When he was on missions with his team, while the others slept he would silently look at sky. Plus whenever he looked up at the sky he felt as if someone was watching him. It would have freaked Naruto out but the feeling didn't feel bad, it just felt right for some odd reason oddly comforting. Naruto shook his heads from his thoughts and continued to walk down the deserted path. He saw his apartment building and looked in the direction of his apartment. He could just about see it and felt a little relieved when he saw it was intact. In the past his home had been firebombed and broke into numerous times, especially on his birthday due to the fuzzball inside his gut. He did want to move to somewhere slightly nicer before but no one would take him in. The only reason he could live here was because the owner for the building was quite a shady character and as long as he got the rent money, then he did not care who lived there. Snap! Naruto was taken out of his musings and thoughts when he felt his right foot hit some kind of wire before he suddenly found himself wrapped in ninja wire, his arms and legs firmly pressed against his body. What the hell? Damn it! Naruto said aloud not believing he let his ninja sense dull like this. He had let his guard down as he stared into the night sky and it had just cost him. We got him folks. A voice called making Naruto swing his head to see two chunin shinobis coming out of the dark alleyways between the buildings with a rather large group of civilians following behind them. Did you really think the little yearly fox hunt was not going to happen just because you're a shinobi? The chunin said coming up and giving Naruto a light slap across the face and a smirk making his way on his face. Naruto growled towards the large group but that only earned him a punch to the gut courtesy of the same shinobi. Temper temper. The chunin said waving a finger in front of Naruto patronizingly infuriating Naruto even more. What's the matter dope? Got nothing to say. An all too familiar voice called. Fox got your tongue. 
Naruto looked at the group of civilians as they began to part down the middle to reveal a smirking Sasuke Uchiha walking towards him with his eternal servant Sakura following closely behind him. Behind her was an older woman who had pink hair just like Sakura. That must be Sakura's mom, he thought before he got another punch to the stomach but this time from Sasuke. You know I always wondered how you beat me, it never made sense that you had this unimaginable power deep inside you that just seemed to come out of nowhere but now I know how you beat me. You have the nine-tailed fox sealed inside you. It was not your power that beat me, it was the fox. I knew all along you could not beat me without help. It just shows how weak and pathetic you are. Oh and this coming from the guy who used Orochimaru cursed seal. Yeah I see you did it all by yourself. Naruto said snorting with sarcasm but was on the receiving end of a hard slap from Sakura. Shut up demon. Sakura screeched out causing Naruto and some of the other to wince at her high-pitched voice. You don't talk in Sasuke presence. You're nothing but dirt underneath his feet, she said with many nodding in agreement. You do realize that what you're doing is treason, I'm a shinobi of this village. You think we care dead last? Sasuke said snorting. Once I'm through with you, I'm leaving this pathetic village and heading straight for Orochimaru. I already have my guides with me he said getting a look of confusion for Naruto. The two chunin with the mob smirked and pulled their shirts down slightly from their necks to reveal to similar curse marks to the one Sasuke has on him glowing slightly from the power that was within each of them. You work for Orochimaru, Naruto said glaring at the two but felt a pain in his shoulder and saw a kanai had been thrown by one of the chunins and was now lodged in him. Naruto gritted his teeth, trying to let the pain get to him. We must admit your village's security has become very poor but then again by the looks of things we are doing the village a public service by getting rid of you once and for all. The second chunin said as the crowd behind them began cheering and swinging their weapons around in the air. Bastards, Naruto muttered as he struggled against the ninja wire but found that he could not move a muscle. When will you see that you will never be accepted in Konoha? You are better off dead, it no wonders your parents abandoned you. They must not have wanted a failure of a son not that I can blame them. Sasuke said sneering causing Sakura and the others to chuckle. Shut your damn mouth. My parents did not abandon me, Naruto shouted trying to keep his anger at bay. Oh then where are they? Sakura said feigning surprise and looking all around her. Naruto gritted his teeth again trying to think of a good comeback but was struggling to think properly with the ninja wire pushing against his skin and the kanai still embedded in his shoulder. Come on everyone. Let's finish what the fourth started, Sakura's mom shouted as everyone began to cheer and Sasuke and Sakura's smirks got wider. The crowd then got closer to Naruto and Naruto shut his eye for the inevitable. For the next five minutes Naruto could only hang there and take the abuse and punishment as he was kicked, punched, stabbed, slashed, slapped and more. He could feel every single hit and the stabbing would send a fire-like pain going through his body. When the crowd took a step back Naruto was a bloody mess with many gashes all over his body and purple and black bruises already beginning to form where he had been hit. Now for the finale. The Chunin said as Sasuke walked up and placed an exploding tag on Naruto. He then stepped back and nodded at the Chunin next to him. Said Chunin smirked before he made a hand sigh with his hands. As soon as he did the tag exploded causing a small explosion to go off and Naruto to be engulfed in smoke. Everyone began smiling as they thought the finally killed the demon but frowned when after a few minutes the smoke began to die down and saw that Naruto was somehow still alive. The fire from the tag should have killed him but somehow he was still alive. But by the looks of it, it was barely. It was when Naruto's form was completely out of the smoke that everything around them began to crazy. The moon in the sky began to glow brightly with a reddish tint in it startling everyone who looked at it. The wind began to pick up and the clouds in the sky began to part away from the village. It must be the Kyubi. It must be doing this, one of the members of the crowd shouted as Sasuke reached into one of his pockets and pulled out a kanai. With this I will be one step closer to my goal, he thought before he charged at Naruto. The kanai in his hand was held tight and aimed directly at the beaten blonde's heart. But that's when it happened. Out of nowhere a hooded figure appeared in front of Sasuke and caught the kanai with ease. The hooded figure was a woman from what they could tell and small strands of hazel brown hair fell out of the cloak. However what startled everyone was the intense glowing silver eyes that sent shivers down their spine. 
Naruto who was barely conscious managed to lift his head high enough to see the figure and stayed awake long enough to hear the hooded woman say. Get away from my son. Present hearing the five words come out of her mouth everyone in the crowd began to shout and curse the woman in front of them. Sasuke tried to get out of her grip but it was too strong. Her glare intensified on him before she knocked the kanai out of his hands and backhanded him into a wall. Sasuke. Sakura shouted as she ran over to the boy but was instead on the receiving an end of a hard kick to the stomach that sent her crashing through a window. Pathetic. The goddess muttered thinking at what a disappointment Sakura was to women everywhere for being so blindly obsessed with a disgusting boy who cared about nothing but himself. Who the hell do you think you are? Don't you know who I am? Sasuke shouted but then regretted it when he found two small blades now lodged in his shoulders and pinned him against the wall. He then felt a strong punch to the gut causing him to vomit the contents in his stomach before the world went black and then blacked out. Now for you too, she said as she glared at the two chunin who stood their ground and the two marks curse marks on their necks began to glow orange and black markings began to spread. You won't survive fighting us lady. How about you give up and just give yourself to us. We promise to be nice and gentle. They said licking their lips and causing the goddess to look at the two in disgust. Here's my answer, she said and as quick as lightning a bow found its way into her hands and she fired two arrows directly at the two chunins. The arrows were so quick that neither one of the chunins saw it coming before the arrows hit them dead center of their chests and piercing their heart. The two were dead in seconds and dropped to the ground like flies and the arrows in their chest disappeared into silvery wisps. She looked at the dead chunin before setting her sights on the crowd in front of her who were too stunned to speak and many were trying not to wet themselves. Get lost, she muttered with so much ice in her voice that Konoha's resident ice queen Kuranai Yuhi would have wet herself. Not needing to be told twice the group scrambled together before they ran off and disappeared not ever caring about taking Sasuke or Sakura with them who were still out cold. As soon as they disappeared she quickly made her bow disappeared before getting out a hunting knife and ran towards her son and began cutting the ninja wire. It only took a couple of seconds since celestial bronze was one of the strongest metals around and could cut through almost anything. When the ninja wire came off Naruto's beaten body he began to fall to the earth before the goddess caught him and lowered his body down softly to the ground and placed his head in her lap. She looked him over seeing all the damage on his body along with old scars that made ice once again flow through her body and tears cascade down her cheeks. My baby I'm so sorry, this should have never had to happen to you. I should have taken you with me like I wanted. Damn you father and damn the ancient rules, she said. She then pulled put a small bag that carried big pieces of ambrosia. She cut them into small squares and gently put them in Naruto's mouth helping him to swallow it since he was unkunasu and hurt. She then pulled out a small vial of nectar and allowed a few drops to drip into Naruto's mouth. Once she felt he had enough she capped the vial and put it away. She looked over his body and already began to see Naruto's body beginning to mend itself. However when she looked closely she could also make out a small reddish glow coming from the wounds. So the Kyubi heals his wounds quicker. At least there is one positive to having the beast sealed inside of him. As the nectar and ambrosia was doing its job she felt the presence of a large group heading towards her. She recognizes a few of the signatures and scowled slightly. After a minute squads of Anbu landed behind her some distance away with Suande, Jiraiya and Kakashi standing there. All three looked at the scene in front of them and saw the unconscious Sasuke pinned to the wall and the out cold form of Sakura, then at the two dead chunin. Whoever you are step away from Naruto and remain where we can see you. Tsunade bellowed but the goddess did not move from her spot and continued to stroke Naruto's hair. Anbu restrain her. Tsunade shouted and the team of Anbu went closed in around her but before they could get closer silver chains shot out from the ground and wrapped around the Anbu and forcing them all to the ground. You promised me, she whispered but the three Konoha shinobi heard what she said. Who are you? Why you are caring for Naruto and what the hell did we promise you? Tsunade said as Kakashi and Jiraiya was examining the woman in front of them. They found her presence very familiar but they could not pinpoint it. You promised me you would look after him. You promised you would care for him and yet I find him beaten near death and by the looks of it this is not the first time it happened. Who are? Tsunade never finished the sentence since the goddess's head turned around to face them and all three saw her silver eyes glowing with wisps around them dancing like firelight. All three shinobi went as pale as a sheet of paper and had a cold chill run up their spine. 
M my L lady. Kakashi managed to stutter out before he, Jiraiya and Suande got on their knees and bowed. What an honor it is to see you again. How may we? Be silent. She shouted with an aura of command leaving the three wincing. Why did you not keep your promise? I thought that I could trust you. The three shinobi were shivering slightly, the power she was letting out was insane. It was Jiraiya who managed to gain the confidence to speak up first. My lady we can explain. I could not care for him when I had my spy network to look after and keep updated. It was for the good of the village. Sensei was taking good care of him from what I understood. My lady I lost so many people close to me here and Minato was one of them. I could not bear being around here anymore. I would not have been a good carer for him anyway with my drinking and gambling. Tsunade said trying to convince the mighty immortal in front of her. Minato sensei was the closest thing I had to a father and Naruto looked so much like him I could not be around him. It brought back to many painful memories, Kakashi said trying to tell her his story but he knew from the look of her face it was not going to work. The three gave their excuses but the goddess was not having any of it. Excuses. Those are nothing but excuses. Start telling me what his life was like. I want to know if he was seen as a hero like Minato wanted him to be seen as, she said but she saw the three gulp and look each other, she knew that was not a good sign. So for the next 10 minutes the three explained what Naruto life had been like despite neither wanting to. As she heard how her son was treated and seen throughout the village her temper was beginning to flare again so much that it was affecting the weather and the moon again. Though she was happy that her son had managed to somehow stay sane and positive. He managed to find those that cared about him and his personality was a lot like his father which she was grateful for. He was fierce when protecting his friends. Not only that he always seemed to treat girls with respect, something she felt great pride over that her son inherited that trade from her. Well almost all girls except for Tsunade that is which made her inwardly chuckle. Once the three finished explaining it was just silent. The goddess turned back around and kneeled before her son again stroking the whisker-like marks on his cheek which made him giggle slightly in his sleep. The nectar and ambrosia was still healing him but it looked like most of it was nearly complete. So of the four that I trusted, it was only Hiruzen that actually did as I asked. My lady once again we couldn't ACKK. Jiraiya stopped mid-sentence when she suddenly appeared in front of him and had started choking him with one hand. B-S-L-I-E-N-T you pig-headed man. I should have this village leveled to the ground for the things they have done to him, she roared putting the fear into the three before she calmed herself. But Minato would not want that since he cared for this village, however I see now that Naruto being in this world was a mistake. Therefore I will be taking my son back to his real home on earth. In the world of the Olympians. Suande, Kakashi and Jiraiya shot up from their positions on the ground to protest but one look from the goddess shut them all up immediately. But he is needed here. I have taken him on as my student and have just begun training him, Jiraiya said but she was not having any of it. I care very little what you want man. I have made the mistake of leaving him here once before, I will not make that mistake a second time, she said before put her hand on Naruto's chest and a bright light engulfed them. Please wait, Tsunade shouted but it fell on deaf ears as the goddess and Naruto shot into the air in a bright silver light before they completely disappeared into the darkness. The three shinobi fell to their knees knowing that they did not keep their promise to her and would now pay the price. All three only had one thing on their mind. We screwed up big time, next day New York City. Naruto groaned while his eyes began to flutter open and he found himself staring at a ceiling that he did not recognize. Normally it would be white ceiling that belonged to a hospital but yet it wasn't. He knew he was not in his apartment because the bed he was in was way too comfy to be the one in his apartment. Groggily and shakily he sat up and looked around. He looked around and did not recognize the place he was in. It was a nice room with a set of drawers and cupboards sat against the wall that was made of oak. There was a TV on a nightstand in front of him and a balcony terrace next to the window. As he sat there he began to piece back together what had happened the night before. He was tied up in ninja wire and Sasuke, Sakura, some of Orochimaru goons and some villagers decided to beat him since they saw him as a freak of nature. Then he remembered Sasuke about to deliver a final blow before a hooded figure appeared in front of him. Naruto's eyes widened when he remembered the words the figure said before he passed out. Get away from my son, mom, he whispered us as he whipped his head all around the room but there was no sign of her which caused his head to droop. 
However he caught the sight of letter that was on top of the set of draws and Naruto groggily stood up and walked over. He unraveled the letter and began to read what it said. Dear Naruto I'm sorry that I could not stay with you until you woke up but I'm afraid you cannot see me until the time is right. First let me tell you that I am your mother. I'm sorry that I could not be with you while you grew up but our family has certain rules in place that forbid us from raising our children. You will soon come to understand why. Since you do not know who your father is allow me to tell you. Your father's name was Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage of the Hidden Leaf Village and the love of my life. He loved you with all his heart despite only ever being able to hold you in his arms the one time. When he died it broke my heart but nothing has ever been more difficult than having to leave you behind. I had asked people that I thought I could trust to watch over you and raise you in my place but only one of them actually did what I asked. After discovering what your life was like I took you out of that world and bought you to mine. I know it may be difficult to adjust but you will come to love your new home and I know you will make friends very soon. I have enrolled you in the boarding school called Yancey Academy since you are still required to go to school in this world. In the draws you will find clothes I have picked up for you, the world's currency, some history books so you can learn about this world and a map of the city you are currently in. Also I have left a few jutsus that I have kept with me since from what I have been told you are currently practicing your wind element. But I must ask you don't use your shinobi powers out in the open. This world is a lot different to the elemental nations and therefore everyone is just a normal civilian that don't know about other worlds and special powers. My son I know this is a lot to take in and I know you have questions but all I ask is that you be patient and all will be revealed in time. I love you with all my heart my baby boy and I will be watching over you always. Love your mother PS read up on Greek mythology. I guarantee it will come in handy in the future. Naruto slowly put down the letter as some tear made their way down his cheek. They were not tears of pain but of joy. Joy knowing that his mother did not abandon him like many said she did and that she did truly love him. He placed the letter down on the top of the drawers and opened one of them and saw the clothes. They were black and dark green with bits of silver on them. Him pretty good. Might need to find some orange for it later thought. He thought before he turned his attention to the other contents of the drawers. In a plastic bag were rolls of green paper. He looks at it before figuring out it must have been the currency here. The dollar huh? Weird name, he said aloud before putting it down and looking at the map. He spread the map out on top of the bed and was amazed at the intricate details. He then saw the giant book that said world history on the front in big bold letter. When he opened the first page, all the letter began to get all jumbled. This happened a lot. Even back in the academy when he read books or scrolls the words would become jumbled. He would tell the instructors but they would just say he was lying to get out of doing any work. Beep beep Naruto was bought out of thought when he heard loud sirens and beeps coming from outside. Deciding it was time to see this new world with his own eyes, he opened a pair of sliding doors and walked out onto the terrace. What he saw made his eyes widen like saucers. There were buildings the size of Gamabunta made out of steel and all sorts of metals. Hell some of them went all the way into the sky. Never in his life had he seen a building built as high as the ones he saw here. He looked down towards the streets of the cities and saw hundreds if not thousands of people just walking around casually. There were metal machines racing around on wheels that confused the hell out of Naruto. Whoa! Was all Naruto could say as he stared at his surroundings. Never in a million year did he imagine things like this. Buildings as tall as the sky and machine that were racing around on roads and the people not caring or minding them at all. It left Naruto's mind completely boggled but Naruto took a deep breath. Mom would not have brought me here if she didn't think it was the right choice. As much as I will miss the leaf, this is my new home now and I actually have a parent out here. It will take time but I can get used to this place. Just one step at a time, he thought. He looked at his surroundings again and smiled. He then puffed out his chest and took in a deep breath before he shouted out. Look out world because Naruto Uzumaki has arrived. Naruto stared outside of the school bus window as the bus made its way down the streets of New York passing the skyscrapers and the people by. His clothing had changed since he arrived to New York, he decided it was time to hang up the orange but he wore an orange shirt from time to time since he didn't really feel the need to stick out anymore. He was currently wearing black jeans with black converses, a white shirt with a picture of a wolf on the front wearing sunglasses with the motto, I howl for you, at the bottom. Over that he wore a dark green zip-up hooded jacket. 
Seven months had passed since Naruto had arrived in this new world and it had taken him a long time to get used to the place. On the first day he was nearly hit by a car four times, he had given a waitress a hundred dollar tip much to his embarrassment and waitress's joy, and pulled out a kanai in the middle of Times Square by accident when a car siren went off which startled him greatly. After a few weeks of adjusting and learning about this world culture he headed off to the boarding school that his mom had enrolled him in and quickly moved into one of the dorms. He was surprised to find that he was sharing a dorm with two other boys which meant he could not practice his jutsus or chakra control in the room. So he had to compromise and at night would make a shadow clone to stay in his bed while he went off for a few hours and train in a deserted forest area. His control over his chakra had significantly gotten better and could now tree walk and water walk like it was second nature. He focused on the leaf cutting exercise and the rock cutting exercise so he could improve on his wind manipulation. He did that very quickly after he discovered the pros to shadow clones. Since then he practiced his wind jutsus that his mom left for him. When he joined Yancey Academy they quickly discovered that Naruto had a slight learning deficiency and found out he was dyslexic meaning he had difficulty learning things from books and trouble reading since the words would just jumble around in his brain. Not only that but he had a DHD, basically meaning he could not keep still. When he thought about it, it now made sense to why he struggled so much in the academy and why he could never stay in one place for too long. However because of his learning difficulty he was placed in the year 2 year bellow where he should be since they felt it would be where he was most comfortable at and could help him the most. The day he moved into the dorm he quickly befriended the two boys he was sharing with. They were two boys whose names were Percy Jackson and Grover Underwood. Percy was 12 and had black hair and sea green eyes. He was a little shorter than most but then again Naruto had a bit of a growth spurt since he came to this world since he now stood at a respectable 5 foot 4. It's turned out Percy had dyslexia and a DHD too which Naruto had admitted it was quite the coincidence. However they both became quick friends since neither liked school all that much and preferred goofing off. Then there was Grover Underwood who Naruto had to admit did not look like a 12 year old. He looked the same age as him but Grover just said he had trouble in school and was redoing 7th grade. Naruto didn't think much of it so he just shrugged it off. Grover had Caucasian skin color with curly short curly brown hair and brown eyes. But unfortunately his legs were crippled when he was little so he had to have crutches to help him walk. Yet that never stopped him when enchilada day came at the school cafeteria, he could not move any quicker. Not only that but with Naruto heightened sense he swore Grover smelled like a goat while Percy strangely smelled like the ocean. He shrugged it off thinking they were just wearing strange deodorant. But the three became good friends and since they shared a dorm room together the three were pretty much inseparable. When they found out Naruto didn't have any parents, they sympathized for him and Naruto was even invited over to Percy's for Christmas. Naruto was quick to make friends with Percy's mom Sally Jackson and she was delighted to see Percy finally make a friend. Though Percy's stepfather Gabe Ugliano was not too happy about it saying they should not waste money on the punk. But Naruto paid for his stuff and didn't spend any of the Jackson's money much to Gabe's delight. Though when Percy asked Grover he just said he already had plans and would see them after Christmas break. They didn't hear from him at all during the break until they returned to Yancey Academy. Naruto found it slightly odd at Grover's mysterious behavior but he let it go. Everyone had their secrets, he knew that better than anyone. Right now they were on a school trip heading towards the Metropolitan Museum of Art that was being led by the Latin teacher Mr. Brunner. Mr. Brunner was a middle-aged man with scraggy thinning brown hair and beard and was confined to a wheelchair and always wore a tweed jacket. Despite his appearance he was definitely one of Naruto and Percy's favorite teachers. He told interesting stories in class and was always up for a joke. On rare occasions he even brought Roman and Greek armor and weapons. Because of this, it was easily one of the only classes that Naruto and Percy did not fall asleep in. But Naruto could not help but have his guard up around the man. The man had just appeared one day, took over the Latin class and had quite an interest in both Percy and Naruto. At first it was only Percy but after a couple of days and a lot of staring at Naruto, he began to take an interest in him too. You stare any harder the people might combust, Percy said as he jabbed Naruto in the ribs causing the blonde to roll his eyes. We could only hope, he smirked getting a small chuckle from Percy. Guys don't joke about that, Grover said in a panicky voice causing the two to stare at him incredulously. Lately Grover had been quite panicky a lot of the time lately. 
he was either worried about something or he kept drinking way too much coffee. Right, both Naruto and Percy said together before shaking their heads and going back into silence. As the bus entered the parking lot and the class began to hop out, Naruto looked in front of the giant museum in wonder. Even after all these months of being in New York, the buildings in this world still amazed and confused him. Come on everyone, Mr. Brunner said as he managed to get himself out of the bus, stay together and don't wander off. Don't want you to get into any trouble now do we? He said glancing over towards Percy and Naruto. Why did he look at us when he said that? Percy asked while Naruto just shrugged. We do have a bit of a reputation in school, he said to which Percy rolled his eyes before they followed Mr. Brunner. The class made their way into the museum as they walked past the giant pillars at the front of the museum and Naruto couldn't help but notice how much Mr. Brunner and surprisingly Grover's face lit up when they saw all the Greek and Roman artifacts. The first stop on the little tour was to look at a bronze chariot that was enlaced with ivory. Mr. Brunner went on to explain how the chariot was used and that it was supposedly created by the Greek gods Athena and Poseidon. Apparently it was Athena who created the chariot but it was Poseidon who supplied the horses. Bet racing in one of those would be fun, Naruto whispered to Percy getting a grin of approval from Percy. Chariots racing around Central Park, sounds fun and dangerous, Percy whispered back. Exactly, Naruto replied making Percy again roll his eyes at the blonde. Grover meanwhile looked at the grinning duo with worry. Gods these two are really going to be the death of me. Keep up Jackson, Uzumaki. Mrs. Dodds said sweetly when the two noticed that the group had moved on while they were talking. She was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a black leather jacket, even though she was 50 years old. She joined just after Christmas break after their previous maths teacher had a nervous breakdown. She really did not like Percy for some odd reason and she constantly called on him to answer questions she knew he did not know. For the next hour Mr. Brunner took the class all over the museum. He explained the different armors Greeks and Romans used, different strategies that were used at certain battles such as Battle of Troy. Meanwhile Naruto, Percy and Grover were standing at the back of the group somewhat paying attention when the class bitch as Naruto and Percy called her Nancy Bobofit began to throw a small piece of bread at Grover which stuck to him since they had peanut butter and jelly on them. Nancy Bobofit was this horrid beast of a girl that had wild red frizzy hair and was a very butch and messy person. She was sweet one minute to the teachers and then a real bitch when the teacher had their back turned. She constantly teased on a lot of the school kids, especially Percy and Grover because they were different from everyone else but she would not go near Naruto since an incident in the past caused her to become very wary of him. Let's just say she chose the wrong day to pick on him and found herself pinned to the wall with pencil going through her clothes and pinning her to the wall while a sign was put on her saying, Escaped monkey please return to zoo. Despite this and Naruto's reputation in school, unfortunately Grover was still the subject of a lot of teasing and bullying due to him being crippled and it made him an easy target, though it didn't happen as often once Naruto joined Yancey Academy and got involved. All those who tried to bully Grover either got scared off by Naruto and Percy or were subjected to Naruto's pranks that had began making a name for themselves during his time at school. There was one time when a group of kids tripped Grover over and dumped their food on him just because he was a cripple. Neither Naruto nor Percy took too kindly to that. However the next day the group of boy found them hanging by their underwear on the school flag pole while the American national anthem began playing in the background causing everyone in the area to roar with laughter. The boys didn't have clue how it happened but Percy and Grover both suspected Naruto had something to do with it if the menacing grin he gave off was any indication. As the group made their way through the hallways of the museum both Naruto and Percy were looking at the mosaics and dishes that were against the wall or being held in special class cases so that they could to be touched or ruined in any way. They recognized some of them from the stories that Mr. Brunner spoke about in class. There was one with Jason sailing across the ocean in the Argos with the Argonauts. Another was of the Battle of Troy depicting the giant wooden horse the Greeks used to trick the Trojans which ultimately led to the Trojans' demise. The main one that was there was the biggest of them all and depicted the twelve labors of Hercules. The first one was of Hercules, the demigod son of Zeus fighting against the Nemean lion. It depicted his great and superior strength as he held the Nemean lion up in the air with his hand wrapped around its throat with a giant club in his other hand. They looked over to another one of the labors to see him capturing the golden hind of Artemis. When Naruto saw this he couldn't help but frown slightly and have a twinge of anger towards it. 
It just seemed wrong to him for some reason but he knew from the stories that the hind did escape in the end yet Hercules still passed the third labor. They scanned through the other labors which included defeating the Aramanthian boar, capture the Cretan bulls, obtain the girdle of Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons and the rest. They then got to the final one which showed Hercules fighting Cerberus and capturing it, but when he looked at it Naruto only had one thing on his mind. Cerberus would make one badass summoning. The two moved on from their spot and they walked into a giant room at the center of the museum with Mr. Brunner wheeling himself over towards a shrine of sorts. He gathered all of the students around a 13 foot tall stone column with a big sphinx on the top, and started telling everyone how it was a grave marker, a steel, for a girl about their age. Naruto, Grover, and Percy somehow found themselves at the front of the class instead of the back where they usually remain and had to look interested in what Mr. Brunner was saying. Mr. Brunner began to explain what the carvings on the sides meant and actually managed to catch both Naruto and Percy's attention because it was actually kind of interesting but yet everyone else around them was talking and having their own conversations. Yet when Percy or Naruto told them to shut their traps, they got the evil eye from Mrs. Dodds. However when Nancy Bobofit snickered about some of the statues being naked, Percy had enough and shouted at her to shut the hell up. Of course this caught everyone's attention as well as Mr. Brunner's. Mr. Jackson, do you have something you wish to say? Mr. Brunner asked clasping his two hands together. No sir. Percy mumbled out while the other began to snicker at him but quickly shut up when Naruto gave them his own evil eye. Well then perhaps you can tell me what is happening in the picture, he said motioning over to a picture on the steel that showed a man sitting on a throne with child in his hands and his mouth wide open. You are M, Percy said starting off before getting a bit of confidence once he recognized the pictures. That's Kronos eating his kids, yes, Mr. Brunner said obviously not satisfied. And he did this because, well, Naruto heard Percy say as his friend racked his brains to figure it out. Kronos was the king god and. God? Mr. Brunner said frowning before Percy quickly corrected himself. Titan, he said quickly correcting himself. He didn't trust his kids, who were the gods. So, um, Kronos ate them, right? But his wife hid baby Zeus, and gave Kronos a rock to eat instead. Then when Zeus grew up, he tricked his dad. Kronos, into barfing up his brothers and sisters. Eu! said all the girls behind them, causing Naruto, Percy, Grover, and Mr. Brunner to roll their eyes. Then there was big fight and the gods won. Percy continued and finished the answer, getting a nod of approval from Mr. Brunner. That's correct, he said. Then the world became ruled by the twelve Olympians' gods, with the most powerful being the three brothers Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades he said pointing towards three small figures. Ever since they overthrew their father they have been rivals ever since. On many occasions the gods came down to earth and how should I put this, he said in thought before Naruto spoke up. Hooked up because they couldn't keep it in their pants, he said getting a round of laughter from everyone even Mrs. Dodds and Mr. Brunner. That is correct Mr. Uzumaki, can you tell me the correct term for these children, he asked Naruto. Naruto thought for a second knowing he read about this as he racked his brains to find the answer. They were called demi-gods right? Part mortal and part god, Naruto said getting a nod from Mr. Brunner. Can you perhaps name me some demi-god heroes? Mr. Brunner asked directing the question towards Naruto again. You are M. Hercules and Perseus was one's right, they were both sons of Zeus, he said getting a nod of approval from Mr. Brunner. Plus there was Theseus who was a son of Poseidon. That's correct, very good Mr. Uzumaki, good to see you were paying attention in class. However they heard snickers coming from the class behind them and Nancy Bobofit saying, like we're going to use this in real life. Like it's going to say on our job applications, please explain why Kronos ate his kids or name a demigod. And why Mr. Uzumaki, Brunner said, to paraphrase Mrs. Bobofit's excellent question, does this matter in real life? Naruto thought for a moment, it was an interesting question Mr. Brunner had thrown at them but one he was completely unprepared for, so he just shrugged. I'm sorry sir but I really don't know. Mr. Jackson how about you? He asked but he got the same answer from Percy. I see. Mr. Brunner looked disappointed. Well, half credit to both Mr. Jackson and Mr. Uzumaki. On that note, it's time for lunch. Mrs. Dodds, would you lead us back outside? 
said teacher nodded as the group ushered outside and began to walk back down the hallway. The group passed the other artifacts and Naruto looked around at any that he missed. Naruto quickly noticed Percy was not next to him but quickly saw him talking to Mr. Brunner. Naruto shrugged it off and continued to walk. As they got halfway down the hallway there was a small split in the side of one of the walls that led into another room. Curiosity getting the better of him he walked in and looked at what was there. When he entered he stopped and marveled at the sight of a well-preserved Greek statue that was stood in the center of the room. The statue was of a woman who wore a dress that stopped just above the knees and was barefoot and her hair was in a sort of bun. She carried a bow in one hand and an arrow in another. Then at her side was a wolf. When looking at her features Naruto had to admit she was very beautiful but was not quite sure who it was. He looked around and spotted a small plaque in front of it but couldn't make out the worlds thanks to his dyslexia. Artemis. A voice called out making Naruto turn around and sees Mr. Brunner wheeling himself into the room. Goddess of the hunt, moon, childbirth, wild animals and chastity. Hey sorry for getting separated from the group, I wanted to see what was in here and when I saw the statue I couldn't help but feel a little drawn to it. Mr. Brunner looked at Naruto as if he was trying to figure him out before he shook his head and a small smile graced his face. That's okay my boy, it is good to see a young man like yourself interested in history. Odd combination isn't it thought? To be the goddess of childbirth yet also the goddess of virginity. It kind of contradicts itself don't you think? Many have thought that but it's best not to argue with the titles of a goddess. Fair enough. She took an oath right? To never have her be in a relationship with a man because of some guy called Orion who was killed and he was like her boyfriend or something. Something like that. Some say she mistook him for an animal when hunting one day, others say she was tricked into shooting him by her brother Apollo. Meanwhile others say she never loved him to begin with. The only one who could answer that is Artemis herself. Naruto chuckled slightly. You talk as if she is real, he said before Mr. Brunner turned his wheelchair around. Come let's go for lunch, we don't want to keep everyone waiting he said. Naruto nodded and followed after. It was only until later that Naruto realized Mr. Brunner never answered his question. During lunch the class was gathered on the steps of the museum as they watched the traffic on both the roads and the walkways as most were out from work and heading out for lunch. Up in the sky it looked like a nasty storm was brewing since dark clouds were heading over the city. Lately when Naruto watched TV it spoke on the news that all around the world floods, hurricanes and huge storms were forming leaving many scientists confused about out the strange weather patterns. Then you always had the guy with a giant sign around him saying, end of the world is near. Naruto sat on the edge of a fountain with Percy and Grover as they ate away at their lunches while Naruto dug into his ramen. No one could ever understand how he managed to keep his ramen warm and Naruto would always just say that it was a trade secret and left it that. Despite being in this great new world Naruto greatly missed good old Ichiraku's ramen. He even had dreams about eating it again but he made do with what he had. You get detention again? Grover asked looking at Percy. Nah, he said. Not from Brunner. I just wish he'd lay off me sometimes. I mean, I'm not a genius. Got that right, Naruto said chuckling earning him a punch on the arm from Percy. Hum okay, Grover said shrugging. Can I have your apple? He said getting another chuckle from Naruto while Percy passed over the apple. Naruto looked over towards his class to see some of the guys were pelting pigeons with Lunchables crackers. I swear boys are so stupid, he muttered to himself before he stopped and thought about what he just said. Why the hell did I just say that? Nancy Bobofit was trying to pickpocket something from a lady's purse, and, of course, Mrs. Dodds wasn't seeing a thing. The three began to chat quietly about the trip and what they might be doing over the summer when Nancy Bobofit walked up to them with some of her goons behind and decided to dump her lunch onto Grover. Oops. She said grinning with bits of Cheetos stuck in her crooked teeth. Percy was angry and jumped up and looked like he was about to hit her before Naruto quickly grabbed and sat him back down. Don't. You will just get yourself into more trouble like you always do. Don't sink down to her level. She will get what's coming to her eventually that much I can promise. Percy who did not look very convinced sat back down but his eyes didn't look away from Nancy Bobofit. That's when something very unexplained happened, as Naruto was sitting down eating his ramen and thinking of new ways to prank and torture the Bobofit beast. 
Nancy suddenly fell into the water fountain making a loud and audible splash which caught the attention of everyone including the teachers with Mrs. Dodds making her way over. Mrs. Dodds Percy just pushed me, she cried out but neither Naruto nor Percy was listening. Both were trying to figure out what just happened. Naruto was not looking at Nancy when it happened but he swore at the corner of his eye he saw what looked to be some sort of tentacle made of water grab Nancy and push her into the fountain. Mr. Jackson comes with me now honey. Mrs. Dodds said as she looked directly at Percy making Naruto shake out of his thoughts. No wait I pushed her, Grover said trying to stand up but without his crutches it made it a little difficult. Percy was a little stunned that Grover was trying to cover for him while Naruto was a bit put off that Grover wanted to take the punishment. However Mrs. Dodds was not buying it and she then lead Percy away back inside the museum where Percy was most likely going to get another scolding and another detention. Why did you say you pushed her? I might not have been looking in her direction but I know you were sitting down. I, Grover said trying to think of something which amused Naruto at the constipated look Grover got when he tried to think of a suitable lie or excuse. Grover really was an awful liar. Oh fine don't tell me, Naruto said in a huff before standing up. I'm going to the bathroom, he said heading back into the museum. No wait, Grover said but Naruto was already inside the building. Damn it, Grover said as he looked over to Mr. Brunner trying to get his attention. With Naruto. Ah man where the hell are the bathrooms, I'm bursting here, he thought aloud as he tried to follow the sign on the walls to the bathroom that just led him around in circles since he couldn't read the signs properly. This is getting ridiculous. Damn dyslexia, he said before he heard a scream come from one of the room to his left. That sounded like Percy. I recognize that girly scream anywhere. Naruto said before he began to sprint towards the room where the scream originated from. Percy where are you? He called out and noticed that no one else was around. That's odd he thought before he ran into the fall where he heard Percy scream. Naruto run. Percy suddenly said appearing in front of him from round a corner and running towards him. Percy what the hell are you? Where is it? A deep scratchy voice called not sounding very human before a figure appeared behind Percy. Whatever it was had eyes as black as coal with a grayish body with sharp teeth and leathery like wings on its back. What the hell is that? Naruto thought to himself never seeing anything like it and he had seen a lot of weird things before he noticed it was about to take a swipe at Percy. Pushing Chakra to his feet he ran towards the creature and delivered a hard kick to its face knocking it back and hitting the wall behind it. I won't ask again. Where is the lightning bolt? The creature asked with Naruto taking a look towards Percy. What the hell is she talking about? Naruto asked getting in his fighting stance. This was a bad day not to bring my weapons pouch. I don't know. Mrs. Dodds took me away to talk and then she turned into that. Then she started ranting about me stealing a lightning bolt. Stealing a lightning bolt? But that doesn't make sense, and did you just say that thing is Mrs. Dodds? Naruto asked looking slightly wide-eyed getting a nod of confirmation. Come here honeys. She yelled as she spread out her wings and began to flap, charge over towards them. While Percy had a look of fear cross his face, Naruto was keeping it together and trying to think what to do. I don't have my weapons with me so that's out. I kicked her but yet it doesn't look as if it did all that much. I'm going to have to use a jutsu. Percy, Naruto called getting his attention. What I'm about to do I need you to swear that you will keep it a secret and that you will not tell anyone about it, understand? Naruto what do you, do you understand, Naruto repeated with a bit more force. Percy realizing this was not the time to argue just nodded his head. Right, Naruto said as he looked directly at Mrs. Dodds. Take this he said as his hands began to make hand signs. Wind style. Wind palm. He shouted as a blast of wind shot out from his palm and hit Mrs. Dodds square in the chest and forced her back and into the wall she hit before which caused a hiss of pain to escape from the Mrs. Dodds lips. Percy meanwhile was gaping like a fish out of water as he saw what Naruto just did. H how? Explain later, Naruto said as he saw Mrs. Dodds getting up again. Man what does it take to keep this old bat down? Mrs. Dodds got up again and charged towards both of them again anger clearly shown on her wrinkled, monstrous face. You will pay for that. Percy and now Naruto were a little worried since Naruto's attack didn't seem to be doing much. Naruto was not seriously contemplating using the Rasengan. 
However they were both brought out of their thoughts when they heard the screeching of wheels get closer to them and when they both looked over they were surprised to see Mr. Brunner there in his wheelchair. Percy! Naruto! What ho! He shouted as he threw an item to both of them. Both boys caught the items. Percy and Naruto looked down to see what they caught and saw that they both now had a pen in their hands. Both boys looked at each other then back towards their items before shouting out, What the hell are these supposed to do? Percy not knowing what to do with the pen just decided to twist the cap to see if there was some sort of hidden weapon in the pen but immediately retracted his hand when the pen suddenly became a sword the length of his arm. Whoa! Both boys thought before Naruto tried to do the same with his but saw it wasn't a twist pen but more of an ink pen. So he yanked the cap off. As soon as he did the cap and the pen both turned into a pairs of long hunting knives. Well, Naruto said. Let's see what these bad boys can do, he said before he charged towards Mrs. Dodds with Percy very shakily going with him. Die honeys. She said before she met Naruto who used his shinobi speed and flexibility to dodge a swipe from her talons and give her a quick kick to the ribs before with both of his knives stabbed Mrs. Dodds in each shoulder earning a big hiss of pain to erupt from her mouth. Finish her Percy! Naruto shouted as Percy ran towards her and while having one of his eyes closed slashed down at Mrs. Dodds leathery torso before she erupted into nothing but gold dust. Both boys looked to where Mrs. Dodds previously was and didn't understand what just happened, did they just kill her or did she just disappear? Both boys looked at each other before letting out a loud sigh, they looked over to where Mr. Brunner was but saw that he was gone. They put their weapons back into their pen forms before they left the hallway, not wanting to explain the bit of mess they made in there. When they got back out they were interrupted by Nancy Bobofit. Where have you idiots been? Mrs. Kerr is about to take us back in the museum, she said sneering. W who the hell is Mrs. Kerr? Percy asked but all he got was Nancy rolling her eyes and walking away muttering idiots. Both boys even noticed her previously wet clothes had now somehow dried themselves. Confused they then walked over to Grover and he gave them the same answer but he was stuttering slightly so they knew he was lying. So instead they turned their attention to Mr. Brunner. He looked up, a little distracted. Ah, that would be my two pens. Please bring your own writing utensil in the future, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Uzumaki, he said. Er okay. Both boys muttered looking at each other before handing them over and Mr. Brunner putting them into his front pocket. Sir, Percy said, where's Mrs. Dodds? He stared at the two boys blankly, who? The other chaperone. Mrs. Dodds the pre-algebra teacher Naruto said looking Mr. Brunner square in the eyes. Naruto saw a tiny show of deception but it quickly went away as if it was never there before Mr. Brunner let a frown appear on his face and sat forward, looking slightly concerned. Percy, Naruto there is no Mrs. Dodds on this trip. As far as I know, there has never been a Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy. Are you both feeling alright? Say what, both boys said together not quite believing what they just heard. You boys may have just got Mrs. Kerr's name mixed up with someone else perhaps an old teacher from a previous school. Don't worry about it boys. Mr. Brunner said before wheeling off. Come it's time to get back into the museum. As he wheeled away both Percy and Naruto stood there with dumbstruck looks on their face with only one thing coming to mind with everything that just happened. What the hell? It was weeks after the big incident with Mrs. Dodds turning into some kind of flying monster and still everyone had denied the existence of Mrs. Dodds. Naruto and Percy spend days after the trip going from student to student trying to see if they knew anything about Mrs. Dodds but they would always look at them both as if they had gone insane. All said there had never been a Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy and that Mrs. Kerr has always been the maths teacher ever since winter break ended. However there was one person who could not completely convince them and let them realize something was up. Grover had always been a bad liar. When he lied he stuttered. His brow began to get a little sweaty and he always tried to avoid people gazes. This is exactly what he did when they asked him about Mrs. Dodds. He would say that he did not know what they were talking about and that there was no one by the name of Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy but they knew he was lying. Although Naruto managed to keep on track in school and keep a somewhat decent grade of AC since he was able to handle pressure better than most and had his clones to help him, Percy was struggling which was clearly evident since his grades went from a D's to F's. The next problem Naruto had was explaining to Percy how he made that wind attack, 
He had tried to think of some sort of excuse but Percy knew he saw it come from his hand and the weird hand signs he did and words he said with it. In the end Naruto sighed to himself and explained. At first of course Percy was skeptical saying it had to be a lie, that there could not be things like ninjas or another world out there. But once Naruto did his shadow clone jutsu and made numerous copies of himself he quickly took it back. It left Percy gobsmacked and from then on he believed him. To say Percy was shocked was an understatement. For days he would just stare at Naruto as if he was Superman before Naruto quickly swatted him on the back of the head and told him to stop staring. He did eventually but it still left Percy thinking Naruto may have been a superhero in disguise. Right now the two were in their dorm room trying their best to study for the upcoming Latin exam. Grover had gone for a walk so Naruto was able to use his shadow clones to help study for the upcoming exams. Percy meanwhile was only interested in learning and revising for Latin. He wanted to impress Mr. Brunner and didn't want to fail after Mr. Brunner had shown great interest in him, pushing him to be the best that he can be. Uh this is impossible. Percy groaned as he threw his guide to Greek mythology textbook against the wall. I'm reading and reading but it's just not sticking. It going in one ear and then out the other. Keep trying Percy. You'll get it. I mean we have dyslexia, it always going to be harder for us than it would be for others. This coming from the guy that can make infinite copies of himself to do his homework for him. Naruto shrugged. Not my fault I'm too awesome. The laws of school don't apply to me because the awesomeness coming off me. Percy rolled his eyes before picking up his textbook off the ground. How am I supposed to remember the difference between Chiron and Karen? It's exactly the same. Actually one has an A in it and the other has an I in it. Bit of a difference, Naruto said looking up from his Latin textbook. You know what I mean, Percy growled out getting more and more frustrated and he did not want to fail this Latin class. Why don't you ask Mr. Brunner for help? I'm sure he is still in his office and since you are one of his favorite students I'm sure he will give you a few tips. Percy looked up from his book slowly hopeful, do you think that would be okay? I don't see why not, he is a teacher after all. So if a student need help, it his duty to help right? I'll even go with you. I could use the walk. Yeah okay, thanks, Percy said getting up from his desk and exiting the dorm room with Naruto following closely behind, telling his clones to keep up the good work and if they hear someone getting close to their room they must dispel. So there Naruto and Percy was as they climbed the stairs of Yancey Academy as they neared the office to their Latin teacher Mr. Brunner. As the two walked along the corridors where all the teacher's offices were located, they saw all of them were dim and dark except for one. When they got closer they saw Mr. Brunner's office still had its light on meaning he was in and the door was left slightly open. Percy was about to walk in when the two overheard two voices. One was easily recognizable as Mr. Brunner's but surprising the two was that the other voice belonged to Grover. Curiosity got the better of the two before they leaned in slightly so that they could just about make out what they were saying. Worried about Percy and Naruto, sir, they heard Grover say surprising them both. Usually it was the other way round and they worried about him. Alone this summer, Grover was saying. I mean, a kindly one in the school, now that we know for sure, and they know too. We would only make matters worse by rushing them, Mr. Brunner said. We need Percy to mature more and Naruto is very mysterious. There is something about him that is different from the rest. That made Naruto's eyes widen. Do they know I'm a shinobi? How the hell could they have figured it out? But they may not have time. The summer solstice deadline. Will have to be resolved without Percy, Grover. Let him enjoy his ignorance while he still can and we will keep Naruto in the dark along with him. Sir, they saw her. Their imagination, Mr. Brunner insisted. The mist over the students and staff will be enough to convince them both of that. Mist, Naruto thought, but they have been asking question, I don't know how much longer I can lie to them. You have to Grover. I know it's difficult and they have both become your friends during your time here but it will be safer. Sir, I, I can't fail in my duties again. Grover's voice was choked with emotion. You know what that would mean. You haven't failed, Grover, Mr. Brunner said kindly. I should have seen her for what she was. Now let's just worry about keeping Percy and Naruto alive until next fall. Thud. Mr. Brunner stopped talking when Percy accidentally let his textbook slip from his hands causing a loud thud to echo through the hallway. 
He was paying such close attention to the conversation that he did not realize it was beginning to slip from his grasp. Damn, Naruto thought before he grabbed Percy's arms and led him away from the room. They quickly picked up the textbook before Naruto and Percy stealthily but quickly ran back to their dorm room. Back in the hallway, Mr. Brunner spoke. Nothing, he murmured. My nerves haven't been right since the winter solstice. Mine neither, Grover said, but I could have sworn. Go back to the dorm, Mr. Brunner told him. You've got a long day of exams tomorrow. Don't remind me. The lights went out in Mr. Brunner's office and the two left but as the two walked a strange clopping sound echoed. Back in the dorm room Grover walked in to see Percy and Naruto reading their textbooks with Percy sitting at a desk while Naruto was sitting on his bed with his back against the wall. Hey guys. Grover said walking in and heading over to his bed as he put his crutches down to the floor beside the bed. Sup Grover. Hey G man. Geez purse you look awful, is everything okay? I'm fine. I'm just tired and this Latin exams is doing my head in. As Percy and Grover talked Naruto looked up from his book and eyed Grover carefully, he didn't understand why he was talking to Mr. Brunner about him and Percy. It was as if the two were in cahoots about something that involved both of them but either Naruto or Percy knew anything about it. Were they in some kind of danger? Is Mr. Brunner a threat to him and Percy in some way or is it the opposite? He knew now he might have to keep a watchful eye on the two. The next afternoon, both Naruto and Percy were leaving the three-hour Latin exam both very mentally exhausted. The test itself had been far more difficult than they thought. The words on the paper just kept swimming around for them both getting more and more jumbled. Despite all the late night studying they did and with Naruto even using his clones for help it did not help in any way. Though Naruto managed to do slightly better than Percy, it still was not a passing grade. Both were slightly worried Mr. Brunner may have found out they were there last night listening to the conversation but both sighed when he just wanted to give them the results of their exams. Percy, he said, don't be discouraged about leaving Yancey, it's, it's for the best. Percy is not going to take this well, Naruto thought as saw the downcast look on his friend's face. Okay, sir, Percy mumbled. I mean, Mr. Brunner said wheeling his chair back and forth, like he wasn't sure what to say. This isn't the right place for you, it was only a matter of time. Right, he said, trembling. No, no, Mr. Brunner said. Oh, confound it all. What I'm trying to say. You're not normal, Percy. That's nothing to be. Thanks, Percy blurted. Thanks a lot, sir, for reminding me. Percy then picked up his backpack and walked out. Huh that could have gone better, Naruto said with Mr. Brunner looking to where Percy walked out and nodded. Perhaps I was a little too hard on him, Mr. Brunner said aloud. You just wanted him to be the best. What teacher doesn't want that for his student, Naruto said getting a look of appreciation from Mr. Brunner. Yes well how about you Mr. Uzumaki? Will you be joining us again next year? Naruto thought for a second before shrugging. I'm not too sure. Since Percy is not coming back, maybe I'll go where he goes. Keep him company. Mr. Brunner nodded. You're a good friend, Naruto. The world could use more people like you, he said. I guess, but then again, I'm one of a kind, so where would the fun be in that? He said as he too began to walk out. Take care, Mr. B. He said as the two gave each other a wave before Mr. Brunner returned to grading papers. Later on that day, Naruto sat on the bus with Percy and Grover as it made its way to the bus terminal with many other kids formed their school on board. Naruto was going to stay a few days with Percy until he went back to the apartment that he still had curtsy of his mom, which he woke up in. Surprisingly, Grover was heading towards New York as well and was even on the same bus as them. While Percy thought nothing of it and thought it was nothing more than a coincidence, Naruto was feeling a little cautious around the guy. During the whole bus ride, Grover kept glancing nervously down the aisle, watching the other passengers. It occurred to both Naruto and Percy that he'd always acted nervous and fidgety when they left Yancey, as if he expected something bad to happen. What's got him so rattled? Percy asked getting a shrug from Naruto. Let's find out, he said before he and Naruto leaned over the seat in front of them and looked at Grover. So, Percy said, Looking for kindly ones, Grover nearly jumped out of his seat and had a look that made him look like he was having a heart attack. Wah, what do you mean? You are M. Well, we kind of overheard you and Mr. Brunner talking the other night. What was that all about? 
Percy asked with Naruto giving a cheeky nod. Grover's eye twitched. How much did you hear? Not much. What's the solstice deadline? Naruto asked like it was no big deal. It was nothing. I was just telling Mr. Brunner that maybe you two were overstressed or something, because there was no such person as Mrs. Dodds, and. Grover, you're a really, really bad liar, Naruto said pointing towards Grover's ears. Whenever you lie your ears go bright pink, just like they are now. From his shirt pocket, Grover fished out a grubby business card. Just take these, okay? In case you need me this summer. The card was in fancy script, which was murder on Naruto and Percy's dyslexic eyes, but they finally made out something like. Grover Underwood Keeper Half Blood Hill Long Island, New York. 800-009-0009, wow fancy writing. Something the Queen of England would have, Naruto comment. Grover, Percy said, what exactly are you trying to protect us from? However before Grover could answer there was a huge grinding noise under our feet. Black smoke began to pour out from the dashboard and the whole bus filled with a smell like rotten eggs. Everyone out. The bus driver called out causing everyone to groan as he pulled over to the side of the road. Well this is a pain, Naruto said as the trio stepped out onto the road. He looked around to see them on a country road. Hey what are they staring at? Percy said getting Naruto's attention. Percy pointed over to the side of the road and Naruto saw what looked like an old fruit stand. There were a whole variety of fruits on it and were all very colorful giving it a very tropical look. However next to it were three old ladies sitting on rocking chairs sewing one humongous sock. All three women looked very ancient in everyone's eyes, with pale faces wrinkled like fruit leather, silver hair tied back in white bandanas, bony arms sticking out of bleached cotton dresses. However Naruto could swear they were looking right at Percy. No 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 no, Grover muttered under his breath as a look of terror appeared on his face. Tell me they're not looking at you Percy, they are, aren't they? Yeah. Weird, huh? Percy said in a disbelieving tone. You think those socks would fit me? I think those socks might be for Bigfoot by the looks of it, Naruto commented getting a chuckle from Percy. This isn't the time to joke. Come on let's get back on the bus, Grover said grabbing both boys arms. Hey watch it, they both said before an audible snip could be heard. They looked over to see the yarn that one of the elderly ladies had in her hands was now cut by a giant pair of scissors another was carrying. No no no. Grover kept muttering before he scuffled to the front of the bus kicked it as hard he could. Surprisingly the bus shuddered, and the engine roared back to life. The passengers cheered. Darn right, yelled the driver. He slapped the bus with his hat. Everybody back on board. Good thinking kid, he said giving Grover a pat on the back. Come on let's get back on the bus, Grover encouraged dragging the two boys with him. When Naruto and Percy looked back to where the elderly ladies were sitting they were surprised to see that the three old ladies had completely disappeared leaving no trace that they were even there. What the hell? Percy thought in shock. I saw them there, I know I did. Something is not right here. Whoever they were they had Grover freak out big time. By that guess they must be more dangerous than they let on. As everyone got back on the bus and retook their seats Grover was muttering quietly to himself but Naruto and Percy who were sat behind him could hear everything he was saying. This is not happening. This can't be like last time. I cannot fail this again. I already let Talia down I can't let them down too. Percy and Naruto looked at each other. Let who down? Who is this Talia girl? You got a girlfriend we don't know about Grover? No no. He said waving his arms in front of him. It's nothing but Percy, Naruto you guys have to be careful please. I can't protect you when you ask too many questions. They both looked at him like he grew a second head, it was always them that protected him, not that they didn't think he couldn't protect them but it just seemed very unlikely due to past experiences and Grover crippled legs. Grover what the hell are you talking about? Percy asked getting a little scared and frustrated. What do you mean protect us? Naruto now sad butting in getting frustrated as well with not getting the answer he wanted. Let me walk you home from the bus station, promise me. He looked at the two boys mournfully, like he was already picking the kind of flowers they would like best for their funeral, so they both agreed since they figured if they declined he would just freak out some more and would start to draw attention to them. The rest of the journey back was silent before they finally arrived at the bus terminal. I'm just going to the bathroom. You guys wait here. 
Grover said before he hopped off towards the bathroom. Once he was gone Percy gripped Naruto's arm. We have to go. I have to get home and see my mom and Grover is freaking me out, Percy said surprising Naruto. We can't do that to Grover. He is seriously worried, Naruto said trying to persuade Percy to reconsider. Look I know it's not right but I have to see my mom. All this weird stuff that has gone on with Mrs. Dodds and then those weird old ladies, I just want to go home. Percy then went to the side of the street walk and waved his arm, as soon as he did a taxi pulled up. Damn it, Naruto thought. He looked around to see if anyone was looking at them but thankfully most were inside the bus terminal or were leaving so no one was paying any attention to him. Shadow Clone Jutsu. He whispered and a clone quickly poofed into existence next to him. When Grover comes out, Follow him wherever he goes and dispel when you think the time is right. Got it boss. The clone said giving Naruto a salute before and running off to a hidden location where he could watch Grover from afar without raising suspicion. Naruto then ran over to where Percy was and got into the taxi. The taxi drove off and headed towards the home of Sally Jackson. Jackson residence once the taxi drive was over and the two boys feeling slightly bad about leaving Grover behind. Percy especially they arrived at East 104th and 1st. There stood a relatively decent looking apartment complex. Naruto had been here only a few time before, most notably was at Christmas where he spent the Christmas with Percy, Sally and unfortunately Gabe. But nonetheless Sally was very welcoming towards Naruto and whenever she rode to Percy she would ask how Naruto was and if he needed anything. Not only that but when she sent over free samples of candy that she got from her job at the candy store at Grand Central Station. She and Percy had this weird blue food running gig, from what they told him it was mainly just to annoy Gabe. So whenever she sent Percy some boxed sample to Yancey Academy, she made sure to involve some bright orange candy just for Naruto since she knew how much he loved the color. The duo walked inside the apartment complex and made their way up the stairs lugging their bags behind them. Once they got to their floor they went to the front door and Percy's opened it with his key. They were treated to pretty stomach churning sight. There was Gabe who looked like he had put on a ton of weight with his thin receding hair and bulging belly busting out of his greasy, dirty shirt. Naruto whispered to Percy that he looked like a giant tusk less walrus causing Percy to cover his mouth from laughing. Gabe was in the living room, playing poker with his buddies. The television was blaring with ESPN yet no one was actually watching it since Gabe and his buddies were more focuses with playing their card game. Naruto remembered when Gabe told everyone no one could beat him at poker so Naruto took him on. Naruto went on to win every game and made 300 bucks. Of course Gabe was livid that he lost to a kid and claimed he must have been cheating in some way but Naruto just told him he was a sore loser. That and Naruto didn't tell him he had enough luck to bankrupt all the casinos in Vegas. Chips and beer cans were strewn all over the carpet, the place looked like it had not be cleaned it a good while. That was a shame since both knew Sally could be a bit of neat freak when she wanted but with Gabe as one of the tenants, the cleanliness would never last. When the two boys entered the living room Gabe looked up from the cards in his hands and scowled slightly. So you're back and you brought your punk ass friend with you again. Always nice to see you too Gabe. Hope me cleaning you out of your money didn't hit you too bad. Naruto said tauntingly with a small smirk on his face. Shut it you little punk, you got lucky that's all. Sure and what you're wearing doesn't make you look like a walrus. Gabe stood up from his seat. Why you little, is my mom here? Percy said trying to quickly defuse the situation. He knew Naruto could kick Gabe all the way to San Francisco and back but for now he was trying to avoid a bloodbath. Gabe's friends was giving Naruto the evil eye, they obviously did not like him all that much. That and they were hoping he was not going to get involved in their poker game since they did not want to lose their money to a kid. She's still working, Gabe said sitting back down at his seat, you got any cash? He just got home and you're asking him for cash. I wasn't talking to you blondie. You got any cash, Gabe said again towards Percy. No I don't have any, Percy said but Gabe didn't look like he believed him. You took a taxi from the bus station, he said. You probably paid with a twenty. You got six, seven bucks in change. Somebody expects to live under this roof. He ought to carry his own weight. Am I right, Eddie? Come on, Gabe, he said. The kid just got here. Am I right? Gabe repeated. Naruto growled slightly towards Gabe, looking slightly more animalistic than before, 
His eye flickered from blue to red. However he knew what was happening and closed his eyes and began to take small deep breaths getting his anger to swell and calmed himself down. Fine, Percy said. He dug a wad of dollars out of his pocket and threw the money on the table and it fluttered towards Gabe. I hope you lose. The two boys then turned their backs to the table and headed towards Percy's room. They heard Gabe tell him not to act so snooty and call him brain boy, obviously taking a jab at the two for both being dyslexic and having ADHD. They could also hear Gabe's friends pass wind and small chuckled to be heard. It made both boy want to vomit and Naruto think about how pigs were better mannered than them. When they got to Percy's room it had magazines and stale beer littered around as they put the bags down. I didn't think it was possible but Gabe has become an even bigger ass than before. Tell me about it, Percy said sitting at the edge of the bed. My mom deserves so much better. She does, Naruto said agreeing with Percy. From the time he spent with Sally he knew she really was one of the nicest people you could ever meet and was slightly envious of Percy that he had such a great mom. It had been over seven months and still his mom had not been in contact with him. It made him think whether what she wrote in the letter was true or not. Maybe it was just a spur of the moment thing, Naruto thought. Percy you hear, Sally Jackson's voice rang out before she appeared in the doorway of the room. Percy she said before he enveloped him in a big hug you have grown so much since i last saw you and naruto it's nice to see you again she said giving the blonde a hug as well which was warmly accepted i hope you enjoyed the candy i sent over it's nice to see you to mrs j and the candy were greatly appreciated well come and sit down and tell me how everything went so the two did but they purposely left out the mrs dodds debacle and the weird old ladies mainly because they doubted she would have believed them that and they didn't want her to send them to a psyche ward. Did something scare you? Sally asked looking at the chalked up Percy. It was then that Naruto realized just how much Percy had missed his mom, it was hard not to. No, mom, Percy said continuing to lie and not wanting to make his mom worried. Well all right then, she said but Naruto had a feeling the conversation was not quite over yet. I have a surprise for you, she said looking at Percy, we're going to the beach. Naruto saw Percy's eyes widen. Montauk? Three days, same cabin, she said. When do we leave? Right when I get change. Naruto will you be joining us? O-U-R-M, Naruto said stammering a little. Is that okay? I mean wouldn't you rather it just be you and Percy so you can catch up? I don't want to be in the way. Not at all, you're more than welcome, Sally said giving him a pat on the shoulder and Percy giving Naruto a nod. Well in that case sure I would love to go but let me pay my own way. Naruto responded feeling happiness wrap him but it was quick to end. Okay fair enough. Such a gentleman, she said causing Naruto to go slightly red. It was then that Gabe appeared in the doorway and growled, bean dip, Sally, didn't you hear me? Naruto and Percy both growled at Gabe but it was Naruto who voiced his opinion. You have legs don't you, get it yourself. Shut it punk. I work too hard and I don't need some stray coming here telling me what to do. If you call sitting on your ass all day then yeah what hard work that is. I was on my way, honey, Sally told Gabe trying to defuse the situation, we were just talking about the trip. Gabe's eyes got small, the trip? You mean you were serious about that? We were but don't worry about your dip. I'll make a seven layer dup just for you. That should last you all the weekend. That way you won't even need me to be here. Gabe's eyes softened slightly but Naruto knew he was not happy about it. This better be coming out of your clothes budget. It is, don't worry, and you won't take my car anywhere but there and back. We'll be very careful. Maybe if you hurry with that seven layer dip, and maybe if the kid apologizes for interrupting my poker game. That was the breaking point. Naruto had now pretty much had enough of Gabe's attitude. Hey Sally why don't you and Percy go get ready. There's something I would like to talk to Gabe about in private, it won't take more than a minute. Both Jacksons looked hesitant, especially Sally. She knew Gabe would get physical if pushed the wrong way, but Naruto gave them both a look that said he would be fine and Percy knew it to be true. Come on mom, Naruto will be fine, he said giving her a reassuring smile before the two made their way out of the room. You got something to say to me punk, Gabe asked walking right up to Naruto. Yeah this. 
Naruto said before he punched Gabe right in the stomach causing the man to drop to his knee and hold his stomach in agony while trying to catch his breath. You little, be quiet, Naruto said in a deadly voice. He grabbed Gabe's arm and put in behind his head causing shoots of pain to run up Gabe's arm. Listen up and listen well. Sally deserves far better than you by a long shot and I don't like the way you treat her. To be honest it's downright disgusting for any man to treat a woman in such a way. So from now you will start giving her a hell of a lot more respect and you will not insult her or Percy ever again. Clean up this apartment because it's downright disgusting at how you can make her live in such a way. If you don't I promise you there will be hell to pay. If there anything you should know about me it's that I always keep my promises. Naruto let his arm go and Gabe dropped to the ground in pain. The man didn't say anything but Naruto could clearly see the scared look on his face and how pale he looked. Don't ever let me catch you treating Sally or any other girl like that again, he said before he exited the room. For the next hour Naruto waiting in the living room as Sally got her stuff ready while Percy caught up with his mom in private. Gabe walked back in 10 minutes later and was a lot quieter than before. He just sat down at the poker table and got on with the game hardly saying a word and not daring to take a look at Naruto. Gabe's self-esteem had obviously taken a blow since he got beat and threatened by a 14-year-old. It was a little while later that Naruto and Percy were loading up the car with Sally getting behind the driver's wheel. Gabe had not bothered to come out and see his car off much to Sally and Percy's surprise. When they looked back at Naruto and saw the grin on his face he just said, we had words. Sally was a little worried while Percy now had a shit-eating grin on his face and mouthed, thank you, to Naruto. Any time, he mouthed back before he put his headphones on and began listening to his iPod. The car drove off and now the trio were making their way to Montauk. Naruto nodded his head as he listened to his iPod as he sat comfortably in the back of the Camaro while Percy and Sally talked leisurely. He guessed that they wanted to talk more and discuss everything Percy has been doing in the last couple of months. So he figured listening to his iPod was the smart thing to do so that he didn't eavesdrop on their conversation and gave them some privacy. Ever since he came to this world Naruto had changed and not just physically, he felt more at peace in this world than he did back in the elemental nation, but then again he didn't have people glaring at him left, right and center. Not only had that he learnt the value of patience and thinking before speaking and acting. He had matured a great deal and was now so much different to what he used to be. If anyone from the elemental nation ever saw him again they would probably ask him what he did with the real Naruto. All he would have to tell them was that he grew up. Right now the car was pulling in next to a wooden cabin that was located right on the beach. The cabin looked a little old but seemed to be in decent condition. The beach itself was very beautiful. The white sand and clean blue ocean that sparkled as the sun hit it made Naruto fall in love with the place. He could now understand why Percy and Sally loved the place so much. It looked like they were the only ones there since there were no other cars pulled up beside the other cabins. In fact it looked as if the place was rarely used. But the look on Percy and Sally's faces when they saw the place made him realize just how special this place was to them. Okay boys why don't you unpack the car while I go pay and let the owners know that we have arrived. Right then here you go Sally, Naruto said getting a small wad of cash out of his pocket. I promised I would pay my own way and I intend on doing that, he said placing the money in Sally's hand. Sally looked at Naruto gratefully before she headed off. The two boys got out the car and began unloading and taking everything into the cabin. When they got in Naruto looked out around the place. It was pretty basic with a couple of cupboards, a small kitchen, a bathroom and a couple of beds. Thankfully there was a bunk bed and a double bed so they would not have to worry about anyone sharing or sleeping on the floor. There were a few cobwebs around but Naruto just figured that was because the place was not used much. It's not much. Percy setting his bag down and looking around the cabin, but I have loved coming here ever since I was little. I can see why. The beach outside and with the ocean. A warm campfire just outside with marshmallows. It sounds pretty perfect if you ask me. It reminded Naruto slightly of nights he would be out of missions with Team 7 and they would camp out in the forests. It always made Naruto feel good and he enjoyed the feel of the wind in his face as the night's cool breeze would hit his face making his whole body tingle. Yeah it is but for my mom there was always another reason, Percy said as he looked out the window and saw his mom walking towards the cabin. This is where she met my dad, he said getting a look of surprise from Naruto. I see, 
You don't talk about him much? I never met him. Not that I can remember meeting him anyway. Maybe the barest trace of a smile but that it. From what my mom told me he was a very rich and powerful but he was very sweet. Apparently I have his eyes and his hair. They spent their time here on the beach but when my mom found out she was carrying me he had to leave on business, he went over sea and never came back. She said he was lost at sea, not dead, just lost at sea, she doesn't like to talk about him much, it makes her sad. Naruto looked at the incoming figure of Sally and couldn't help but feel a little bit of sadness for her. She was a good woman who unfortunately had a lot of bad things happen to her in her life. From what he saw she never got angry and she welcomed Naruto with open arms. Something he would always be grateful for. Looking at her now on this beach she looked happy. Like years had been taken of her and made her younger. I guess places that make you happy just have that effect on you, Naruto thought before he went to unpack. When Sally got back the trio quickly unpacked and made their way outside so they could enjoy the cool air. Since it was summer the sand was warm when stepped on but the moment they dipped their feet in the water it was as cold as ice. It made Naruto want to run back onto the beach but yet Percy and Sally were both perfectly fine with it. He figured the two were just used to it. After some swimming in the ocean they went back onto the beach and played a little baseball. They took turns at who batted, who pitched and played the field. Naruto easily won that since with his shinobi training and great athleticism it made him a pretty great athlete all around. Even Percy did pretty well too surprising Naruto since Percy never really showed any interest in sport back at Yancey. After that the day changed to night and the moon was high in the sky causing the ocean to glitter and gleam just like it did during the day. But Naruto found it to be more beautiful under the gaze of the moon. He felt energized being under it, like he could go 10 rounds Gara and Shukaku again and come out on top. The trio sat around a cozy campfire as they roasted marshmallows on the end of a stick and made idle chat. Mom, what was dad like? Percy asked with some courage. Sally put down her stick with the marshmallow gently on the ground trying to avoid getting sand on the marshmallows. The look on her face told Naruto that Percy must have asked that question a lot. Plus being here where they met just spurred it on. He was kind, Percy. He was tall, handsome, and powerful. But he was also very gentle, too. You have his eyes and hair. How old was I? Percy asked pushing for more answers. I mean, when he left. Sally watched the flames as they flickered around. He was only with me for one summer, Percy. It was right here on this beach where we spent our time together. But he knew me as a baby right? No, honey. He knew I was expecting a baby, but he never saw you. He had to leave before you were born. Percy nodded obviously feeling a little hurt that his father never really met him. What about you Naruto? Sally asked catching the blonde's attention. You never talk about your parents. What were they like? She was curious about the blonde's parentage since he never spoke about them. She knew he was an orphan but that was it. Even Percy didn't fully know the details on Naruto's parentage. It was a touchy subject for the blonde. I wish I knew. From what I have been told my father died the day I was born. Apparently he did love me and he held me in his arms once but then afterwards he had to leave and he died later that day. I was told my mom died but then from others I was told she abandoned me. It was never easy not knowing who your parents are. I only discovered who mine were a few months ago, he said surprising the two Jacksons. You didn't know who your own parents were? Sally said in slight disbelief. Naruto shook his head. The people I stayed with thought it was best that I didn't know who they were. But that completely unfair. Why should you be denied knowing your parents? Percy asked, even he didn't know that. He could not imagine ever not knowing who his mom was. Naruto shrugged. I never understood why they did it either but there you go. But they are people that I will most likely never see again. They're in the past. He said with Percy nodding understanding why while Sally kept quiet. Then just before I joined Yancey I got a letter from my mom telling me how sorry she was that she had to leave me and that we would meet one day but I would have to be patient. She said something about her family having rules about not being able to raise their children. While Percy thought that was a little odd Sally mind was reeling and just stared at Naruto. Is it possible Naruto is like Percy? She thought. The conversation went quiet for a bit before things picked up. Percy asked Sally what they were going to since Percy would need to find a new school. Sally told them they would have to find something for him. 
while Percy was beginning to wonder whether Sally actually wanted him around which caused Sally to get a little teary-eyed and hug her son close Naruto just sat and ate his marshmallow. What he wouldn't give just to be able to spend a little bit of time with his mom just like Percy and Sally. Naruto. Sally said getting the blonde's attention. He saw Sally standing in front of him and Percy getting up. We're going to head in now. Don't be too late, she said giving him a quick peck to the forehead. Sure, he said blushing a little. I'll be in a little while. I just want to enjoy the night for a little while longer. The two nodded before they walked inside the cabin and gently shut the door. Naruto took a breath before he got of the log he was sitting on and laid down on the sand and looked up at the stars in the sky. It had felt like forever since he just looked up at the stars but with training, studying and school it took up most of his time. The stars in the sky was slightly different to the ones back in the elemental nations and he took an interest in learning the different constellations. The stars all twinkled brightly as he stared up at them from his spot. He saw the Andromeda, Orion, Virgo, Ursa Major, Hercules, Scorpius constellations and smiled. He wondered if his mom enjoyed looking at the stars just like he did and thought if they ever met which he was hoping they would someday, she would stargaze with him. All parents had a something that they and their children did and shared together. Perhaps looking up at the night sky and watching the stars could be theirs. After what felt like forever Naruto got up a stretch before taking one last look at the moon high in the sky. I hope we meet soon, Naruto said quietly before he trudged along the sand and went inside the cabin. He got some pajamas from one of the drawers and quietly went to the bathroom and got changed. Afterwards he went to the free bottom bunk of the bunk bed since Percy had the top and Sally was on the small double bed. He closed his eyes and let sleep take over, however little did he know that as he walked away from the fire and entered the cabin, a pair of warm chocolate brown eyes formed in the fire and watched him go with care evident in her eyes. You will see her soon my dear Naruto. You just need to wait a little longer, a quiet feminine voice said before disappearing completely and left only a small fire left burning. Later on that night Naruto's eyes shot open and he pushed himself up from the bed and through the covers of his body. His eyes widened when a lot of information began pouring into his head for a few seconds before it eventually stopped. The clone that he had sent to follow and keep track of Grover had finally dispelled and it made his eyes widen. He shot him off the bed making a thud that woke Sally along with Percy. However Percy had a slightly freaked out expression on his face making Naruto think he just had some kind of nightmare. Naruto is everything okay? Sally asked before Naruto shot towards the door. Naruto swung the door wide open only to reveal a huffing Grover that had his arm ready to knock on the cabin door. He looked at Naruto a little surprised. I have been searching all night, he gasped. What were you both thinking? He made me, Naruto said pointing towards Percy who looked like he was still waking up. However when Naruto stepped back and took a proper look at Grover his eyes widened lightly. He got the memories of the clone but couldn't quite believe it, yet here Grover was with the bottom of a goat for legs. You want to explain this? Naruto said pointing down at Grover's furry legs and towards the hoofs where his feet should be. Later right now we have to get you and Percy out of here. Just then a thunderstorm sounded out through the area and the winds began picking up. Sally was out of bed with a long blue robe covering her pajamas. She took one look at Grover before a face of terror made its way to her. She quickly turned around and looked straight at Percy. Percy, she said, shouting to be heard over the rain. What happened at school, what didn't you tell me? We don't have time to talk, it's right behind me, we have to go now. Sally continued to look straight at Percy and then glanced over towards Naruto. What did you boys not tell me? Percy was still too shocked to speak so Naruto began to tell her about the incident with Mrs. Dodds, overhearing Grover and Mr. Brunner talk about them in Mr. Brunner's office and then the weird old ladies that they saw when the bus broke down. If possible Sally went even paler before she ran over and grabbed her purse, boys go and get in the car now. Grover ran over towards the car though it was more like he was trotting over, he quickly opened all the doors to let people in as Sally, Percy and Naruto came running out of the cabin all still wearing their pajamas. They hopped into the car and once Sally got behind the wheel she floored it leaving a small trail of dust in her wake. Naruto was sitting in the front seat beside her while Grover and Percy sat in the back. They tore through the night as they made their way along the dark country roads. Wind was slamming against the Camaro. Rain lashed the windshield. 
No one was sure how Sally could see where she was going but she continued to drive like she was on autopilot. So you are M. Grover you and my mom know each other? Percy asked finally finding his voice. Sort of. She doesn't exactly know me but she knew I was watching over you, both of you, he said looking at Naruto and the blonde nodding back. Little creepy but sure, Naruto said getting a mild glare from Grover. I was keeping tabs on you both, making sure you were both okay, but I was not faking being your friend. I am your friend, Grover answered to the two boys. So Grover what exactly are you? Naruto asked looking down at Grover's furry legs. I mean when my clone dispelled I was a little shocked. It doesn't wait clone, he asked slightly confused. Sally did the same but Naruto waved it off. I'll explain later. Fine but to answer your question. Well I'm a goat waist down, he said getting odd looked from Percy and Naruto before Naruto shrugged it off. I have seen weirder. If you're a goat waist down then you must be a satyr right? Now Grover looked a little surprised, yeah, how did you know? In the letter I got from my mom she told me to brush up on Greek mythology. Well that and before my clone dispelled it heard you mumbling about satyrs so I kind of put two and two together. Wait wait wait, Percy said shaking his head. What is going on? I don't understand what is happening. Percy, Sally said, there's too much to explain and not enough time. We have to get you and Naruto to safety. Safety from what? Oh, nobody much, Grover said while looking out the back window checking if anything was following them. Just the Lord of the Dead and a few of his bloodthirstiest minions. Come again, Naruto asked not quite believing what he heard. Well mainly Percy since he is in the most danger but we need to get you away as well, he said before Grover realized what he said. Percy and Naruto tried to wrap their mind around what was happening, but Percy couldn't do it. He was trying to convince himself that it was just a dream, but knew this wasn't a dream. He had no imagination. He knew he could never dream up something that was this weird. It was then that Sally made a hard left along the road before the group found themselves driving past a large strawberry farm that had large wooden houses that looked darkened. There was also a large picket sign that said pick your own strawberries. We're nearly there, Naruto and Percy heard Grover and Sally mutter to themselves. Where are we going? Percy asked getting everyone's attention. The summer camp one told you about. Sally's voice was tight. Naruto looked at her face and could see her eyes beginning to get a little wet. He could tell she was struggling not to cry, not that he couldn't blame her. The place you said you didn't want me to go, Percy said causing Naruto to face palm. That was just going to make Sally feel bad. Please, dear, Sally begged. This is hard enough, try to understand, you're in danger. Because some old ladies cut some yarn. Those weren't old ladies, Grover said. Those were the fates. Do you know what it means? The fact they appeared in front of you. They only do that when you're about to. When someone's about to die. Well that's just peachy, Naruto said rubbing his eyes while Percy and Grover began going over what Grover meant by him dying. Sally looked over at Naruto. Are you okay Naruto? She asked in a worried tone. Ha oh yeah I'm okay. Just when I went to sleep a few hours ago the last thing I was expecting was to be driving down a road full throttle with my friend who turns out as satyr that was supposed to be a Greek myth. Though with my luck, I'm not completely surprised. Weird things seem to follow me around. I know this is. Sally Cut got cut off when she made a sharp turn when a large figure suddenly appeared beside the car. She narrowly missed it. What was that? Percy asked but no one answered him. It was all silent until a blinding flash lit up the area before the car suddenly went boom and caused the car to flip over and land on the ground upside down. Ow, Naruto said as he rubbed his head, he had hit the top of the car pretty hard and was sure that he was going to find a nice bump there later. Oh that can't be good, he muttered while he heard Sally ask if everyone was okay. Naruto looked down at the roof and now saw a large smoldering hole on the roof that had blackened edges around it and was still giving off small traces of smoke. Did we just get hit by lightning? He thought to himself and saw everyone else thinking the same thing except for Grover who looked like he was knocked out from the hit. He had small drips of blood making its way out of his mouth. Naruto checked his pulse and sighed happily that his friend was still breathing and his pulse was still beating. Boys we have to get out of here, Sally said before the sound of loud stomping could be heard coming down the road. The group looked down the road to see a very large figure lumbering towards them. 
It looked as if something was covering his head and had their arms up high in the air like sharp points. Everyone out of the car now! Sally yelled as she and Naruto kicked their doors open and scrambled outside. Sally went round to help Percy out while Naruto got Grover out and Fireman carried him. Boys do you see that giant tree on top of the hill? She said as she pointed over to a large pine tree that towered over all the other trees. Head straight for it and don't stop. Get over that hill and you'll see a big farmhouse down in the valley. Run and don't look back. Yell for help. Don't stop until you reach the door. Mom you're coming too. Percy said as he grabbed his mom's arm. Sally looked at him sadly. Mrs. J we are not leaving you behind so don't even think about doing something stupid, Naruto said as he began to make his way towards the hill with Grover still on his back. Come on, Percy said as his hand grasped his mom's and they began to follow after Naruto and Grover. Food, Grover groaned causing Naruto to chuckle. It's nice to know you're having a good dream buddy. But you seriously need to cut down on the enchiladas. R -o, 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 -a -a -r, -r, r r The running group slowed slightly when they heard the giant roar and when they turned their heads around to see what was happening they saw Gabe's car getting thrown out of the way like a ragdoll. The large man kept running towards them causing small shockwaves through the earth and was making loud grunting and snorting noises. As he got closer Naruto and Percy saw that the man was easily over seven foot and had large meaty hands swaying from his side. His upper half was all furry and fuzzy. His head was very large and bulky and was also covered in fur and fuzz. There was a shining ring going through its nose and on its head were two very large horns with very sharp points on the ends. Oh no, Sally said before she began to pick up the pace, we have to go. It's after Percy but there is a chance it could be after you too Naruto. We have to be quick. Mom that thing. That looks like, don't say its name Percy, names have power. Pacifi's son. Naruto said. Just like in the story of Theseus and the well bull man he said since names apparently had power. B but how can it be real? Those were just myths. Percy said as he ran alongside Naruto his hands still grasping Sally's. Percy have you noticed yet that I'm currently carrying a satyr on my back whose bottom half is that of a goat? Plus you know all about me being a shinobi. If they are real and I am real then all the rest must be. I think I'm beginning to see why my mom had me brush up on Greek mythology. The group looked ahead and saw the pine tree was still way too far, a hundred yards uphill at least. Naruto was doing fine due to his shinobi training but Percy and Sally were beginning to struggle meanwhile the minotaur was now beginning to catch up to the group as it was sniffing the air tracing after their scents. His sight and hearing are terrible, Sally said. He is going by smell, but soon he'll figure out where we are soon enough. On cue the bull man roared out in rage. Yeah like now, Naruto said as he got closer to the tree line. Wait until the last second, then jump out of the way, directly sideways. He can't change directions very well once he's charging. Both buys nodded though Percy nodded a little hesitantly. Looking behind them they saw the bull man was picking up pace and getting closer and closer to them. The tree was still a little ways off but Naruto was almost there. Naruto turned his head and his eyes widened when the minotaur suddenly appeared behind Percy. Percy jump out the way now, Naruto shouted. Not needing to be told twice Percy did just like instructed and duck and rolled to the right. The minotaur went straight past him and ended up slamming into a tree. Still running Naruto finally made it to the tree and placed Grover at the bottom of it before he turned around and began to make his way back down the hill to help Percy and Sally. He saw Percy making his way up but looked in horror when he saw Sally running in the opposite direction and back towards the road. Go, Sally shouted. I can't go with you, I will keep it distracted. Mom please don't, Percy shouted when he saw what his mom was trying to do. However the Minotaur also saw what she was doing and charged right for her. As it got closer Sally tried to duck out of the way but the Minotaur had learned its lesson and caught her in its giant hands. No mom, MRSJ. The boys called out but it was already too late. Sally looked at the boys one last time before the minotaur squeezed and Sally disappeared in a golden light. Percy looked in horror as he saw his mom disappeared in front of him and dropped to his knees while Naruto looked on in anger. I could have saved her if I had just been a bit quicker, he thought before he quickly snapped himself out of those thoughts. Come on we have to go. We can't let her sacrifice be in vain, 
Naruto said as he grabbed Percy by the arm and began to rush him over towards the tree where Grover was still currently lying. However the Minotaur had turned its attention back to them and began to charge once again towards them. This thing does not give up, Naruto thought before he did a series of hand sighs. Wind style grade breakthrough, he shouted as he created a powerful force of wind to blow out of his mouth and slam into the Minotaur causing it to fall onto its back and hit into a tree. However the Bullman didn't stay down for before it got back on its legs and charged. As it got closer Naruto jumped out of the way but Percy was frozen solid with fear. Percy get out the way, Naruto shouted, however just as the Minotaur got close Percy did something incredible. He tensed his legs and jumped into the air and used its head as a springboard and then wrapped his legs around its neck. Naruto who saw the whole thing looked at Percy quite impressed while Percy began tugging on the Minotaur's right horn. It looked like a bit of tug of war was going on until an audible snap was heard and Percy found himself on the ground with a minotaur horn in his hands. Damn Percy! Naruto said before he saw the minotaur look at Percy in rage. He was about to attack Percy while he was down but Naruto suddenly appeared above the minotaur and delivered a deadly kick to the other minotaur's horn snapping the left one off now as well. However it began swinging its arms around in a mad frenzy and its hand smacked into Naruto's chest and Naruto defiantly heard a cracking sound. There goes a rib, he thought. Naruto thankfully managed to land safely on the ground despite his chest hurting and he shot his right hand out and a blue spiral ball began to form. Once it got to the size of a basketball Naruto shot forward and delivered it to the creature abdomen. Rasengan. He shouted as it impacted and blasted the creature right of the ground and sprawling on the ground smashing through multiple trees before it finally stopped skidding along the ground. Right where its abdomen was there was now a giant hole the size of a basketball. However despite the wound the bullman was beginning to get back up. Naruto saw Percy was close to where it landed and shouted. Percy finish it. He then made a stabbing reference and pointed to Percy hand. Percy looked at Naruto and then the horn in his hands before he put two and two together, he ran and appeared in front of the Minotaur which was still in the process of getting up before he swung the horn right into the Minotaur's chest. The giant bull man roared out in pain before it slumped to the ground and disappeared and turned into golden dust. That was close, Percy thought but ran over to Naruto when he saw Naruto clutching his chest. Naruto are you okay? He said before he suddenly found himself becoming very drowsy and was struggling to keep his eyes open. Just as he got to Naruto he slumped down to the ground blacked out. Naruto was no better with the pain in his chest before he too fell to the ground and found himself looking up at the night sky. It was only minutes later when he heard footsteps and a clopping sound coming from behind him. He could just about make out two figures with slender bodies. He figured they must have been two girls with a much larger figure behind them but he couldn't quite make it out. One girl with blonde hair walked over to Percy and started muttering words he couldn't make out while the other girl walked towards him. She knelt down and Naruto could see that she had raven black hair and had blue eyes. All Naruto could think about was how pretty she was. Chiron this one's hurt, he heard her say and heard clopping coming towards him. She was the last thing he saw before he blacked out. The light from an open window shone brightly on Naruto's face causing his eyes to flicker before they groggily and slowly opened. Just like seven months ago he found himself staring up at a ceiling he did not recognize. The events of the previous night began to make its way back to his memory. Grover being a satyr from the old Greek times, being attacked by the Minotaur before he and Percy managed to kill it, Sally gone and being found by that raven haired girl. He blushed slightly at the memory of the girl before he heard a voice coming from next to him. He looked over to see Percy lying on a bed similar to him with a blonde haired girl feeding him some weird liquid looking substance. Damn it it what was stolen? He heard her mutter as she put the spoon into Percy's mouth. Your guess is as good as mine, he said catching the girl off guard and making her turn around to face him with a startled look on her face. The girl looked about the same age as Percy and was very pretty. She had tanned skin with long blonde hair that curled at the back. She had gray eyes and wore an orange shirt that said Camp Half Blood on it along with a blue skirt that stopped just above her knees and blue sneakers. Whoa don't scare me like that, she said slightly startled at hearing Naruto's voice and watched him as he began to sit up. Naruto felt a little stiff as he sat up but his ribs didn't hurt anymore so he could only presume the fox had healed him by now. He began to stretch a little getting the knots out of his joints. 
How are you up? You shouldn't be awake for another day at least, let alone fully healed, she said in surprise. I have always been a fast healer, he said looking at the girl. Is he going to be okay? He asked nodding over to Percy. Oh you are um, yeah he will be fine. He just needs to rest, he should be up by tomorrow. That's good, he said as he rubbed his eyes before he extended his hand out to the girl. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, it's nice to meet you. The girl looked at him slightly as if she was studying him before a smile made its way to her face and shook his hand. I'm Annabeth Chase. It's nice to meet you too. So you are M can you tell me where I am? He asked looking around. You're at Camp Half-Blood. Come on I'll take you to Chiron and Mr. D they will be better at explaining everything to you. She said before leading Naruto out the room. You're in the medic wing at the moment. You and your friend were brought in late last night. Caused a bit of a ruckus. She said as Naruto looked all around as he saw Greek lettering all above the wall and on the door. Yet somehow she found he could read it pretty perfectly. Yeah sorry about that. We would have been quieter if Pacifi's son didn't try to turn us into a shish kebab. You know your Greek history, she said looking slightly impressed. I was told to brush up on my Greek history over the past months. My mom wanted me to learn it when I arrived in New York. She sounds smart, Annabeth said. What's she like? Naruto shrugged. No idea. I have never met her. She has seen me but I haven't seen her. Oh what about your dad? She asked pushing for more question. He felt as if she was interrogating him but he felt comfortable around her so he didn't really mind answering. He died the day I was born. I never met him either. Oh I'm sorry to hear that. Don't worry about it. I'm used to it, he said getting a nod from the girl. Annabeth meanwhile was taking glances back at Naruto and was studying his features. He has the blonde hair and the tanned skin and he said he never met his mom, but the eyes are all wrong. I wonder whose he is? She thought. Plus are those whisker marks on his cheeks. When the two made it outside Naruto looked around and felt slightly stumped and let his mouth open slightly as he scanned the place. From what he saw the landscape was dotted with buildings that looked like ancient Greek architecture. There was an open-air pavilion, a large amphitheater, a circular arena that had a lot of training dummies scattered over it with a few kids hacking away at them with swords. There were white marble columns sparkling in the sun. In a nearby sandpit, a dozen high school-age kids and satyrs played volleyball. Canoes glided across a small lake. Kids in bright orange t-shirts like Grovers were chasing each other around a cluster of cabins nestled in the woods. Some shot targets at an archery range. Others rode horses down a wooded trail while some flew on horses with wings. This place is incredible. It even more amazing than the Leaf Village, he said getting a curious look for him Annabeth. I'll explain later. She nodded and accepted the answer for now before they headed over to a large building bigger than the rest that had an open porch on it and there were two people sitting at a small table playing some kind of game. When he neared he saw the first guy was in a wheelchair and immediately recognized. Mr. Brunner, Naruto said surprised causing the man head to look over to him before he smiled. Naruto my boy it's good to see you're up, he said wheeling over towards them. I was not expecting you to be up until tomorrow. You heal quickly. Yeah I get that a lot, he said shaking Mr. Brunner hands. You must have questions. Come take a seat, he said pointing to a chair next to him, plus here I am known as Chiron. Mr. Brunner was just an alias. Naruto nodded before the now named Chiron looked over to his right and shouted, Grover come here please. Naruto looked over and saw Grover sprinting towards him and had a shoebox in his hand. His running with his goat legs made him as fast as a track star since he left a small trail of dust behind him. Naruto, he said putting the box down before giving the blonde a hug, it good to see you up and about. Thanks Grover. Good to see you're okay. You gave you quite a scare when the car went over. Naruto, Chiron said as Naruto took a seat around the table. I would like to introduce you to the camp director Mr. D. Naruto looked over and looked at the other man who was sat around the table with a coke can in his hand. He wore a leopard print shirt and had messy black hair and was a little on the chubby side and is rocking the bearded look. He looked like someone who coached a peewee soccer team. Right right well welcome to camp one guess, Mr. D said with very little care in his voice. Thank you for bringing him over Annabeth, Chiron said before Annabeth gave a nod and jumped off the porch and ran off. 
Naruto watched her go before he turned his head around towards Kyren and Mr. D. So far I'm at a camp that is God knows where. Last night I found out my friend was a satyr and we were attacked Mr. Halfman Half Bullright. He said getting a nod from Kyren and Grover and a burp from Mr. D. Okay just give it to me straight. Don't give me any watered down version. Just tell me what I need to know. I can take it, he said getting another nod from Kyren. Very well. To start off Naruto you are not an ordinary person. You have come to believe that you are immortal. Just a regular person just like everyone else however that is untrue and far from the truth. You are what is known as a half-blood or as you may know it from Latin class as a demigod. The Greek gods from the old stories and from what are believed to be myths are very real and still exist to this very day. Over the years they moved from country to country, continent to continent until they eventually wound up in America. From time to time they come down to earth and as you so delicately put it on the trip to the museum, they hook up with mortals. Chiron said getting a chuckle all round even from Mr. D. This camp is a place where many demigods just like yourself come to train, meet other demigods and form close friendships. From time to time even a quest is issued though one has not been issued for some time. For many camp half-blood is a place that many have come to call their home do not being able to live in the mortal worlds due to their scent which attract monsters just like the one you encountered last night or they simply don't have anyone to go back to. Naruto sat there taking it all in. If he had been told this about a year ago, right now he would probably be jumping of the walls rubbing it in people's faces and saying how awesome he was. Thankfully now that he had matured he simply nodded his head and kept his surprise and shock inside. Whoa! Naruto said leaning back on his chair putting his hand through his hair. That's a lot to take in. I know this is a big change and it will be a little strange at first but you will get used to it and you will adjust. Many here were just like you and given time they settled in and got used to it. I'm sure you shall too. So you're basically saying the old Greek gods of old really do exist and live here in America and in the son of one of them? Pretty much, Grover answered. Right. In that case since one of my parents is a god or goddess do you know which one? He asked. I'm afraid not. We won't know until your Olympian parent claims you. Which could honestly be at any given time. However I have to admit you are taking this rather well. I am used to weird stuff. It just seems to follow me, and about my godly parent, I think it's my mom, he said getting looks from everyone else. Why do you think that? Grover asked leaning in. Well since you were honest with me and told me all of this I should be honest with you and tell you things about me neither of you know, he said towards Chiron and Grover and getting odd looks from all three men. Have you ever heard of a place called the Elemental Nation? He asked getting surprised looks from Chiron and Mr. D while Grover just looked plain confused. We are aware of the other world. From time to time we gods visit that world but it's awful rare. How do you know of it? Mr. D asked suspiciously. Well you see wait us gods? Are you telling me you're a god? Naruto asked eyeing Mr. D. Is it that surprising? This is just the look I am going for while I'm here? He said before he summoned a glass of wine on the table and was about to drink it before Chiron spoke up. Mr. D your restrictions Chiron said getting rolled eyes from Mr. D. Right right forgot. Father really enjoys punishing me, he said before it disappeared. Naruto saw the wine and the father comment. It clicked in his head and who this guy was. You're the wine god aren't you? You're Dionysus, he said getting a nod from Mr. D who also looked a little impressed. That is correct. Nice to see not all the demigods that first arrive here are idiots. Er thanks I think. You were saying Naruto before we trailed off, Chiron spoke. Oh right I was telling you about the elemental nations right? He said getting a nod from the man. Well the reason I know about it is because I'm from the elemental nations. He said as Chiron got a gob smacked look on his face while Mr. D looked very surprised. How do I know you're telling the truth? He asked before Naruto smirked a little. He stuck out his hand and formed a Rasengan causing both Grover and Chiron to gasp at the sight of it while Mr. D inspected. Yep that's chakra alright, he said getting an amused look on his face. Now this is a first. We have never had a demigod from the elemental nations before in the camp. Really I'm the first? He said getting a nod from Mr. D. Since those in the elemental nations are capable of using chakra they already become quite powerful people in their own right. Also since monsters don't to go to that world, they would never pick up their scent so they would not need to come here. However I would like to know how you got to this world. 
Well my mom found me and she brought me over. She hated the way I was treated by the village and brought me to this world. Which is why you believe your mom is a goddess? Chiron said getting a confirmed nod from Naruto. That would make sense since only a god or goddess has the power to cross worlds. This pretty much confirms Naruto's Olympian parent is one of the goddesses. Hold on. What is this place you're talking about? What's chakra and what was that blue orb thing Naruto just made? Grover asked since he was confused about what they were talking about. So for the next five minutes Chiron filled Grover in while Naruto added any extra info if Chiron missed anything out. By the end of it Grover was left sat in his seat with a gobsmacked expression on his face. To think a world like that exists. Who knew, he said slumping back. Now you know how I felt when I came to this world, Naruto said chuckling a little. Why were you brought to this world then? I don't quite understand why your mother brought you to this world if that world never got any monsters. You said she did not like how the village you. Naruto rubbed his neck a little sheepishly. Well now that is another little confession I need to tell you about. Mr. D. Chiron has either of you heard of a creature called the Nine-Tailed Fox? He asked now getting odd glances from the two. I have. The Nine-Tailed Fox or Kyubi for short is a giant fox-like creature as tall as a New York skyscraper that is effectively a giant mass of chakra. It's so powerful it's said it could destroy mountains and cause tsunamis with a flick of its tail. From what my father Zeus says it could be as powerful as Typhon. Why do you ask? Mr. D asked as he studied Naruto's expression on his face and the way he was nervously moving around in his seat. It was then that Mr. D figured it out. You're a Jinchuriki aren't you? He said looking at Naruto who gave him a nervous nod. Mr. D then got up from his seat and stood in front of Naruto. Let me see the seal, he said getting a surprised look from Naruto but quickly complied. He lifted up his shirt and channeled chakra through his body and after a few seconds the seal appeared on his stomach which got curious looks from Chiron and Grover. Mr. D however got down on one knee and started looking over the seal and was muttering things that Naruto couldn't hear. I take it you have met another Jinchuriki before then? Naruto asked. Only once a long time ago. He was a young boy when I met him though, maybe a little younger than you. His name was Roshi and he carried the four tails. The boy seemed nice enough but he was not treated all that well due to his burden which unfortunately is a given due to carrying one of the beasts, Mr. D said before he finished looking over the seal. That is quite the seal. During one of my trips to the elemental nations I got a little interested in the art for sealing and studied it a little. While I'm no seal master like those in the elemental nations or like my sister Athena, I can spot a good seal and this is one of the best I have seen. Whoever did it was a genius. It's something that could make Athena jealous over, he muttered before he got up and sat back down on his chair. The person that made it was the fourth Hokage who was my father, Naruto said also returning to his seat. I see, Mr. D said. I will have to keep an eye on you since we have never had a shinobi let alone a Jinchuriki demigod at camp before. I doubt you will have any episodes since the seal is keeping the beast at bay and seems to be able to channel its energy into you when needed but nevertheless I will need to keep a close eye on you to be on the safe side. We don. T need a giant fox terrorizing the place. Naruto nodded in understanding while Mr. D explained to Chiron what Jinchuriki were, before he looked over at Grover. Grover what's in the box? He said pointing to the cardboard box on Grover lap. Alright I almost forgot. He said picking it up and handing it to Naruto. This belongs to you. Naruto looked at Grover curiously before he turned his attention to the box. He lifted up the lid and was a little surprised to see the minotaur horn that he kicked off the beast lying there. I went back to the site where you and Percy defeated Mr. Harry and Scary and collected them. Percy has the other one. They're spoils of war. Trophies if you will. It's to show that you defeated it and it shows your strength. Wow that's great. Thanks Grover, he said patting the satyr on the shoulder. Well it's the least I could do since you and Percy got me here. I should have protected you but I failed. Grover's head looked down but Chiron clasped him on the shoulder. You did a good job Grover. That is two more you have bought to safety. It should have been five, he whispered causing Chiron to get a sad look on his face. Grover why don't you take Naruto on a tour of the camp? I'm sure he is eager to see what is around here. Chiron suggested. Sure, he said getting up and motioning Naruto to follow. Hey Chiron, Naruto asked, 
since your name is Chiron I don't suppose you're the URM. The centaur from the old legends, that I am my boy, I was given immortality by the gods so that I could continue training the generation of heroes. Oh wow URM okay. Naruto said a little flabbergasted, not only did he just meet the wine god but his teacher turned out to be a centaur that was over 2000 years old. I'll see you guys later then, Naruto said before quickly asking Chiron whether he could look after the minotaur horn while he was on the tour which the man said was fine. With Naruto and Grover Naruto quickly caught up to Grover as he began the tour. Well first the building we were just at is known as the big house. Basically that is the HQ of the camp and where you will most likely find Chiron or Mr. D, he said getting a nod from Naruto. As Grover showed Naruto around the blonde haired teen saw many kid around his age and a few that were older and younger running around all wearing their bright orange shirts. Some were running around with sword, bow or other assorted weapons in their hands. Others had maps or books while others carried around tools. Many of the other campers glanced at Naruto when he walked past mainly to see what the new camper was like. They had already heard about how Naruto and Percy defeated the Minotaur during the night. While some were impressed, others were a little jealous that they got the opportunity and they didn't. Grover then led them through the giant strawberry field. Naruto took a long whiff at the area and found himself sighing happily. The place smelled heavenly. With fresh cut grass and the smell of strawberries in the air it made Naruto want to fall to the ground and take nap. All around there were satyrs and other children who were tending to the strawberry fields. Grover explained that the demigod children of Demeter took up the task of keeping the strawberry field in good condition along with satyrs playing their magical songs to help them grow. Not only that but also the strawberries helped pay some funds towards the camp. It might have been a secret camp for demigods but it still needed money from the mortal world. So Grover how did you get picked to go find me and Percy? Naruto asked striking up conversation with Grover as they walked through the huge strawberry fields. Well satyrs are sent out into the mortal world to find demigods and then bring them back to camp once the time was right, going to Yancey was kind of my second chance. Second chance? You did this before? He said getting a solemn looking nod from Grover. Yeah a couple of years ago but I'd rather not talk about it. Let's just say I didn't do my job properly and there was a casualty. Anyway as I was saying I went to Yancey and then I found Percy. Originally I thought it was only Percy there but then I discovered you too. That's when I called Chiron and he came to Yancey as well. Why did Chiron come over? Was there something the matter? It wasn't necessarily a bad thing, it's just you and Percy were each giving off a very strong scent. It was much stronger than other normal half-bloods. Though yours may be due to being a shinobi half-blood. Man that's weird. I still can't believe a world like that exists. You will have to tell me more about it sometime, he said getting a nod from Naruto. Once they exited the strawberry field they went past an archery range that had a large group of children varying from ages wielding bows and arrows shooting at the targets. They seemed pretty good since most were hitting just around the center. Over there is the canoeing lake. We have canoe races from time to time, he said pointing towards a giant lake that had small dock located on the edge with a row of canoes and smaller looking boats around it. And over there is the stables, he said pointing over to a large stable just over by the hill. That's where the horses and pegasuses are, he said as Grover saw it had caught Naruto's attention. However it was not the stables or the mention of pegasuses that caught his attention but the girl who was walking towards it. When Naruto took a good look the girl had long raven black hair and was wearing a skirt similar to Annabeth and had an orange tank top on. That's the girl from last night, he said but just as he was about to head over Grover caught him and dragged him off. Come on Naruto much to see he said getting a whine of displeasure from Naruto before the blonde gave in. He looked over and the girl had disappeared into the stables. They continued looking around the camp with Grover next showing the amphitheater and then a giant wooden arena. Grover explained that the arena was where they had practice fights and special games while the amphitheater was where they had big sing-alongs and told stories. Naruto thought that was something he could enjoy. Ah here we are. Grover said as they exited the strawberry field and Naruto found himself staring at an assortment of cabins that were all in a U shape. They were cabins of all shapes and sizes and all looked much different from one another. Right in the center of the U shape was a stone lined fire pit. Sitting next to the pit was a girl who looked around 8 years old. She had brown hair with a small bandana covering her hair and wore a brown dress that went down to her knees. 
She turned and looked at him with a pair of warm chocolate-colored eyes before she gave him a warm smile. When she looked at him he saw her mouth a few words to him. It looked like she said, I'll see you soon, before she got up and stood in the fire before she disappeared leaving a slightly shocked Naruto staring at where she once sat. He was taken out of it when he heard Grover's voice. These are the cabins where you will stay. Each cabin represents one of the twelve Olympians and when you get claimed by your parent you will stay in their cabin. But for now you will stay in cabin 11 the Hermes cabin since you have not been claimed yet. That's where everyone has not been claimed go, he said pointing over towards a cabin that looked the most like an actual cabin. Naruto stared at all the cabins. There was one that had tomato vines growing on the side of it with a grass made roof. Another was bright pink with pink frilly curtains showing through the windows. Then there was one that looked like it was made of solid gold. It hurt just to look at it due to the sun bouncing of it. Why are so many empty? He asked pointing towards a select few that looked great but he could see they were bare and empty on the inside. Oh well Hera is the goddess of marriage so she doesn't have affairs with mortals. Therefore she has no demigod children. It's just there is an honorary thing. The Zeus cabin won't have any due to the big three, Zeus, Poseidon and Hades making a pact for no more demigod children due to some bad past events. The same with the Poseidon cabin, he said pointing towards three cabins 1, 2 and 3. Cabin 1 was a marble building looking like a mausoleum, with heavy columns. The doors were made of bronze and had symbols of lightning bolts on the side. Cabin 2 was similar to Cabin 1 but had P-like design on the walls and columns while Cabin 3 was a low building made that had walls made of some kind of grey looking rock material and had seashells plastered all around it. On the front door there was a large symbol of a trident on it. How come Hades or Hestia Dosen, T have a cabin? He asked. Well Hades is not really welcome up on Olympus so they didn't see a need for a cabin here. Hestia took an oath to remain a virgin like Artemis and Athena plus she is one of the friendly gods. She doesn't see the need for a cabin since she has no children. Though I am surprised you asked that, many forget about Lady Hestia which is a shame. She truly is the most likable of the gods. Naruto nodded at Grover's words and looked at the assortment of cabins. However despite how amazing they looked it was the only other empty cabin that caught Naruto's eye and to him looked like the most beautiful of the twelve cabins. Naruto slowly walked towards the cabin recognized as cabin 8. The cabin was silver in color and had silver curtains showing through the windows. On the outside there was intricate vine-like design as well as animals like stags and wolves decorated on them. On the front door there was a symbol of a bow and a crescent moon. Naruto got closer to the cabin. He reached his hand out and was about to touch the cabin before Grover's hand shot onto his wrist. I seriously would not do that if I were you. That's Lady Artemis's cabin, she hates all men and is one of the three virgin goddesses, so I would not touch or go near this cabin unless you have death wish. Lady Artemis has a habit of turning males into Jack Lopez. That sucks, so the cabin just sits here like the other empty cabins. Naruto asked feeling a little disappointed that such a beautiful cabin would get no one to live in it. Actually when the hunters, Lady Artemis's group of all female warriors visits the camp they stay in her cabin. Since she has no kids it would only make sense that they stay in here. Though they're not overly friendly with the campers here and they prefer to stay within their group. They rarely come here though. But when they do there usually ends up being some sort of fight or disagreement between them and the campers. Remind me not to get on their bad side, Naruto said with Grover give a chuckle. Well that's about it man, that's the gist of the camp. I should get back to Chiron and then check in on Percy. Naruto nodded, sure I think I might keep looking around if that's okay. You know get a lay of the land. Sure that's no problem, I'll see you later. Find me if you have any questions or anything, Grover said before he sprinted away back through the strawberry fields. As Grover ran of Naruto looked around the area wrapping his head around everything he had heard today. Cross dimensions, gods, monsters, he may have come from a world full of shinobi that could wield the elements but even this was a little shocking to Naruto. It was definitely going to take the blonde a bit of time to adjust. But he adjusted well coming to this world so he knew he would be fine. He turned his head and once again he found himself staring at cabin 8. There was something about that cabin that made him feel drawn to it. 
It was just like what he felt back in the museum with the statue to Artemis. It was a little mind-boggling for Naruto. Hey let go. Naruto was brought out for thinking when he heard shouting that he thought came from a girl and it sounded close by. He looked around before he saw just at the edge of the strawberry field two boys wearing blood red shirts with camo jackets had boxed in a younger girl who looked around eleven. All that Naruto could make out from her was that she had brown hair. When he saw them snatch the basket the girl was carrying and put it high in the air out of her reach Naruto started to walk over with the intention of teaching both boys a lesson. Give it back, those strawberries are supposed to be sent off in a couple of days, the girl said but the two boys who towered above her just snickered and were using their sizes to intimidate her. Both boys looks around 13 to 14 but were a very chunky looking. Naruto couldn't tell whether it was from too much muscle or too much fat. But both had baby like faces. You think we care weakling? Why don't you try and fight us? Maybe we will give you them back then. Ugly number one said causing them both to laugh and the girl's eyes began to water. Hey ugly, Naruto called causing the three to turn and look at him. Who the hell are you blondie? Can't you use we are busy are you looking for trouble? Busy huh, all I see is two overgrown chimps picking on a little girl. If you want to fight someone so bad, how about you fight me? Unless you're too chicken. Chicken, chicken, who the hell are you calling chicken? Ugly number two said as he ran towards Naruto. He brought his fist with the intention of pummeling Naruto but Naruto simply sidestepped. Man you're slow, he said before delivering a strong punch to the gut of ugly number two before getting behind him and giving the kid a giant wedgie and pulled his underpants all the way across his face. Ugly number two started running around in a circle before he ran into a tree and knocked himself out. Naruto then turned around to ugly number one. How about you? You want to go, he said doing the come on sign with his hands. But just before ugly number one could do anything Naruto appeared and whacked him on the back of the head before kneeing him in the gut. However when he hit him and the boy went down the basket in his hands that had the strawberries went flying into the air. Luckily Naruto caught the basket and as the strawberries fell back to the ground he began catching them back in the basket before the basket was full again. He turned around to face the young girl who was gaping like a wet fish at him. I believe these are yours, he said handing them over with the girl receiving them with a small blush on her face. Gee thank you, that was really nice of you. I have not seen you around before. Is this your first year at camp? Yes it is, I just got here last night. I just finished the tour of the place when I saw you were in a bit of trouble. I hate bullies, especially when big idiots like them pick on girls just makes my blood boil yes those aries kids are just a bunch of bullies and i doubt they will try and mess with you after what you did to them i'm katie gardner daughter of demeter it's my first year too it's nice to meet you i'm naruto uzumaki son of unknown he said making her giggle a little he got a better look at her she had leaf green eyes and mild tanned skin she wore the usual orange shirt but had a dark green skirt that went just above her knees and wore green converses how long have you been claimed if this is your first year? Naruto asked wondering how long it usually took since he would now be eating for when his mother would claim him. I was only claimed a few days ago. Apparently it varies from different gods but I was claimed pretty quickly. That's pretty often from what my siblings tell me since Demeter claims her kids pretty quickly. I'm sure you will be claimed soon. Katie. A voice called and both turned to see a boy halfway down in the strawberry field shout to her. He was telling her they had to take the strawberries they picked to the big house to get ready for shipping. I have to go, thank you for helping me again. I would really like to be your friend since you helped me. I'll see you soon Naruto, she said giving him a quick hug before running off swaying her basket full of strawberries. No problem, he said smiling. He felt like he just made a new friend in camp which made him feel pretty good inside since currently his only friend were really Percy and Grover. So he spent the next couple of hours looking around the camp, making sure he knew where everything was. He went down to the beach only for a group of women with elfish feature to flirt with him. It made him feel pretty uncomfortable so he hightailed it out of there leaving the girls there a little disappointed. As the sun began to set among the camp he had walked up onto the hill and sat underneath the giant tree and watched as the sun began to set. 
The orange-yellow colors from the sunset lit showed the camp in a beautiful light and reflected and glimmered of the ocean and rivers. I should try and get hammock set up here he thought as the day slowly began to change to night. He heard a conch horn bellow out but he didn't think anything of it. Here are you are Naruto. Naruto whipped his head around to see Chiron galloping over now in his centaur form. Naruto had to whistle in amazement. His horse half was white in color with a few scar that in various places on his horse half. No doubt from training past heroes and fighting in battles. I trust Grover gave you the tour. He asked getting a nod of confirmation from Naruto. That's good. Come the horn that went off was to let people know dinner was ready. We are heading over to the dining pavilion. That's where Mr. D will introduce you to everyone. You and Percy have caused quite the stir and many are interested in meeting you. Yeah I bet, he muttered to himself as he and Chiron made their way down the hill. Chiron and Naruto neared the giant outdoor dining pavilion which they could both see and hear was already filled with all the campers. Naruto could hear people talking, laughing, burping, and even a few playful arguments. So Grover mentioned I would be staying at the Hermes cabin, he said striking up conversation with veteran centaur. That's correct, it's where all the unclaimed demigods go since Lord Hermes is happy to look after those who are unclaimed which makes him a favorite and well-respected member of the Twelve Olympians. Wells that's good of him, how long do you have to wait to be claimed? Chiron had a somber look cross his face. Ah well it varies, some get claimed straight away within a few days, some maybe a few months, some a few years but some unfortunately never get claimed. Unfortunately not all demigods are recognized by their godly parent and are simply forgotten about. Then why would they have them if they weren't going to at least claim them? Show them they at least care for them. Well that is a question I think many want answered but in my experience it's best not to ask. The gods can be very temperamental when they want to be. Fair enough, Naruto said. The two lapsed into a quick silence before Naruto asked another question. Can I ask why does Hera have an honorary cabin when Lady Hestia doesn't? From what I have heard about Hestia it's that she is a favorite and likable goddess. Shouldn't she have a cabin in her honor as well? Naruto asked. Chiron sighed. Well it is quite unfortunate really. Lady Hestia was once one of the twelve Olympians but when Dionysus came along it's caused a bit of an uproar. She willingly gave up her seat to him when she saw how far things were beginning to escalate and to avoid a war happening but slowly over time people just began to forget about her. Even some of her family rarely notice her these days. That's really really sad, Naruto thought. He felt some kind of connection with Hestia in some sort of weird way. He guessed it was perhaps because they were both rarely looked upon by others and were not really care much for. He hated that when he was growing up so he could only imagine how Hestia had it living for over 3000 years. They arrived at the dining pavilion but just as Naruto was about to head over Chiron put a hand on his shoulder and looked down at him. Naruto Mr. D told me about the hardship that a Jinchuriki has had to face and I just want you to know that you won't have to face those kinds of hardships here and the camp welcomes you with open arms. Do not feel like you need to hide yourself from people here. If or when you decide to tell people about the fox know that although they may be a little weary of you, they will accept you. They all know what it's like to be looked down on and we all consider each other friends and family here. So know that when you want to tell everyone we will accept you for who you are. Hearing Chiron telling him that he would be accepted here made Naruto slightly near up before he quickly wiped a straw tear away. Thank you Chiron, you don't know how much I appreciate hearing that. Chiron gave him a kind smile before the two continued walking in. When Mr. D introduces you to everyone he will let them know that you come from the elemental nations but will keep the fox secret until you want to tell them. Naruto nodded and the two headed towards it. The first thing Naruto noticed when he walked in was how many campers there were. There must have been around 200 all varying from different ages. They all sat at specific stone picnic tables. One was masked with a huge number of people that was beginning to overflow with people on it. Another made Naruto blush when he saw that all the people sitting at the table were incredibly pretty. They all had perfect skins and all wore makeup, some more than others. The girls were the definition of girly girls, even the boys. At another table he saw Annabeth sitting with a group that all had similar features to her. The blonde hair and the tanned skin with grey eyes. 
she spotted him looking over and gave him a small wave which he returned. But then he noticed there was about four tables that were completely unoccupied which to Naruto looked like a complete waste. He had a feeling this was like the cabins. Every child of a certain god or goddess goes to a specific table. The overcrowded one had to be the Hermes table and guessed many of them there were kids who had not been claimed yet. He then looked around to see if he could find the raven-haired girl but with all the people in the room and no not exactly recognizing the face properly since his vision was a little blurry he struggled to find her. When they walked in the commotion all seemed to stop and they all looked over towards him and began to whisper. Hey that's him. One of the two that be the you know. I wonder if he is a good fighter. He must be if what we heard was right, right. Look those whiskers on his face. He looks so cute. Hot damn. Naruto blushed at the last two comments since he was not exactly used to those kind of comments being made to him. Luke could you come over here for a second? Chiron called out which made a one of the boys from the cramped table walk over. The boy was a lot older than everyone else he had seen so far, around 19 at most. He had sandy blonde hair with light blue eyes with very elfish-like features and a pointy face. But the most notable feature was a long white scar that went down his right cheek. Luke this is Naruto Uzumaki one of the new campers who arrived last night. I'll leave him with you, Chiron said before he trotted over to where Mr. D was sitting. Well it's nice to meet you Naruto. Odd name if you don't mind me saying. It sounds kind of Japanese for an American. I'm Luke son of Hermes and the head of the Hermes cabin. It's nice to meet you, he said shaking Luke's hand. Yeah I get that a lot. My name means Maelstrom and if you ever look it up don't believe what anyone tells you. It does not mean fishcake, he said getting a chuckle from Luke. I'll try to remember that, he said before he led Naruto over to the Hermes table. Make room guys, he said causing the table to shift a little as Naruto took a seat next to Luke. Well welcome to Camp Half-Blood. We have to admit we are all quite impressed by your action with the other boy last night. Defeating the bull man is quite the achievement, especially from those who have not had any training. Well I wouldn't say I didn't have any training exactly but I have found a bit of teamwork can go far. True I guess, Luke said not looking to convinced but Naruto shrugged it off. Ah it looks like Mr. D is about to speak. Mr. D got up from his seat rather reluctantly if the face he was giving was any indication. He cracked his knuckle before he stood in front of everyone as the whole pavilion went quiet to hear what he was about to say. All right brats listen up because I will only say this once, he said in a bored tone. As you all know we had two new arrivals last night. One is with us tonight while the other is still unconscious and is healing. I'm sure you have all been wondering whether the rumor about them defeating the Minotaur was true. Well I'm here to clarify that it is indeed true. That caused many to begin whispering before Mr. gave them a look that quickly shut them all up. He clicked his finger and the shoebox containing Naruto's minotaur horn appeared in front of him. Naruto opened it up and many gasped a little when they saw the horn knowing now full well that it was true. Many on the Hermes table marveled at it while Naruto could see that over at one of the other tables that was filled with big and burly kids they were looking at him with a bit of jealousy in their eyes. Don't worry, Luke said whispering to him. That's just the Ares table. They are probably just mad that they didn't get a chance to fight it, he said getting a nod from Naruto before Mr. D began speaking again. The one who joined us tonight is Naruto Uzumaki, he said which caused many to whisper. The whispers were a little odd since they were saying whether it was his real name or if Mr. D was just messing with names again like he always was. It was quickly cleared up when Luke stood up and told them it was his actual name. Naruto asked what that was about but Luke just waved it off. Anyway Mr. Uzumaki is not like normal demigods and is quite a bit different from all of you, he said causing them all to glance at him with curiosity. By different I mean he is from a different world. That immediately shut everyone up and all began to listen intently. Unknown to many there is a separate dimension, an alternate world if you will known as the elemental nations. There the landscape is completely different and they have their own history that dates back thousands of years if not longer. There they have warriors known as shinobi or as you might all know them as ninja. They are a part of everyday society and shinobis are mortals who can perform amazing feats by using an energy known as chakra. It lets them have the ability to bend the elements, they are masters of hand-to-hand -hand combat and swordsmanship among others. 
Their society is different from the one you all know in this world. Naruto is the first demigod shinobi to ever come to this camp and therefore please welcome him with open arms, Mr. D said dryly before he turned around and sat back down. For the next few minutes the whole room was silent as every camper had their eyes directed towards Naruto who was once again beginning to shift uncomfortably in his seat. Many looked gobsmacked while he couldn't help but notice the table Annabeth was sitting at all looked like Christmas had just come early. And Naruto is that true? Luke asked voicing the question everyone wanted answered. Naruto just nodded his head confirming everything Mr. D just said was true. Do you think you could show us a shinobi trick? Luke asked. You are am sure, he said standing up as everyone turned in their seat to get a good look at what he was about to do. He quickly thought about what to do before he decided on walking up one of the stone pillars. He applied chakra before he put one foot up against one of the pillar and began walking vertically up it. It immediately caused everyone to make a little gasp. Whoa looks at that, he's like Spider-Man, I wonder what else he could do. Hearing the other last voice Naruto jumped down all the way from the ceiling and stood in front of everyone. I can also do this, he said making a quick hand sign before he erupted in a cloud of smoke. When the smoke cleared many gasp and fall out their seat when they saw a carbon copy of Mr. D standing where Naruto used to be. All the campers were moving their heads back and forth between the real Mr. D and the copy. Mr. D looked it over before nodding at how well the copy was. So Naruto then made another hand sign and he quickly turned back. When he changed back he was immediately swarmed by the other campers all wanting to ask him question about his world, how he came to their world and what other tricks could he do. He swore he even heard some ask whether he had a girlfriend. Luckily for him Chiron quickly called everything back to order and everyone returned to their seats. Well now that the introduction is done we can all eat. Chiron then stamped his hooves and shouted out, to the gods. To the gods, everyone shouted including Naruto before everyone began to fill their plates. Wood nymphs then came out with more platters of food which was filled with grapes, apples, strawberries, cheese, fresh bread, a whole variety of food. Naruto looked it over and had to admit the food all looked amazing. But there was just something missing. I wonder if they do ramen, he said aloud which was heard by one of the passing wood nymphs. She clicked her fingers and big bowl of ramen filled with noodles and pieces of pork appeared in front of him. He felt like wrapping the wood nymph in a hug and asking her to marry him but he kept his cool and gave her a pleasant thank you to which she appreciated before making her rounds. He poured some of the ramen into a smaller bowl and made sure to have plenty of pork and noodles in it. He was about to chow down before Luke got up and motioned for him to follow him. Before we start eating we take a portion of our food and scrape it into the pot over the fire as an offering to them. The gods love the smell of burnt food so we offer them a small bit of each of ours. Oh okay. Little weird but I won't judge, Naruto said getting a small chuckle from those around him. He waited patiently as everyone scraped a portion of their food into the pot, made a small prayer before going back to their seat. Luke who was just in front of him had finished his offering by sliding some apple pieces into the pot before Naruto stepped up for his turn. Well I have never done something like this before so here it goes. If you can hear me mom then this offering is for you. If you're anything like me then you will like the smell of ramen. Enjoy, he said as he poured some of the ramen in with a few bits of noodles and pork going with it. He turned around and was about to leave before he remembered something both Chiron and Grover said. So he quickly scooped a little bit more into the pot before whispering. This is for you too Lady Hestia. Just to show that you're not forgotten. The fire underneath the pot suddenly got higher and flickered brightly as if it was saying thank you. He walked back over to the table and sat back next to Luke before he dug into his meal. For the next hour he spoke and idly chatted with Luke about the camp and joked around with two of Luke's brothers the twins Travis and Connor stole. Both boys had taken a liking to Naruto when he told them he was a bit of a prankster extraordinaire. He told them about some of the pranks he did back at Yancey and the infamous painting on the Hokage monument. When the boys heard how he painted a giant monument in broad daylight wearing kill me orange both boys burst out laughing and began bowing down to Naruto. Even Luke and some of the other Hermes kids gave a chuckle. Thought they weren't pranking crazy like the twins were, they were still children of Hermes so it just ran through their blood. Eventually dinner ended and everyone made their way down to the amphitheater where the children of Apollo were singing an a cappella version of a variety of songs. 
He looked around and saw everyone laughing and smiling with marshmallows on the end of a stick in front of a large fire while others were joking around or telling each other stories. It was only the first day and already Naruto was beginning to feel at home here. He sensed a presence sit next to him and looked over and saw Annabeth sitting next to him with stars in her eyes and a small notebook and pencil in her hand. I take it you want to know a bit more about my world? He said getting her nodding her head like a mad person which caused him to chuckle. All right then, Naruto said as he began to explain to Annabeth the concept of shinobis and why they exist. That they were the military forces for the hidden villages and that they could wield an energy known as chakra. When she asked whether it was chakra he used to do those feats he did in the dining pavilion Naruto nodded his head. He then went on to describe the five major nations which caused Annabeth to start writing and jotting things down like crazy. That each one was different in landscape like the land of wind was one giant desert while the land of fire was a giant forest. When he said that, some of the wood nymphs and satyrs overheard him and looked over in wonder before they zoned off into a dreamlike state. In each village we have a leader which is known as a cage. In the village I'm from, the village hidden in the leaves Konoha we have the Hokage. The current Hokage is the fifth Hokage Tsunade Senju. She is also a member of the Sanin. The leader of your village is a woman? She said a little surprised since most high class leaders were normally men but to hear of a woman who was the leader and was recognized as the strongest in the village slightly surprised her. It got a nod of confirmation from Naruto. What's a Sanin? She then asked not recognizing the word. Ah well the Sanin are titles given to a group of shinobi from the Leaf Village. The group was a team that was trained by the third Hokage Hiruzen Serutobi and they played a pivotal role in the second shinobi war. In the second war they fought and managed to survive against a man known as Hanzo the Salamander. He was recognized at the time as the strongest shinobi in the world. At seeing how strong they were he let them live for giving him a good fight before giving them the title of Sanin. The three Sanin are Suande Senju, Jiraiya the Toad Sage and Orochimaru. He said as he said the last name with venom in his voice which Annabeth caught on too but let it drop. This is incredible. Annabeth muttered as she was scribbling away on her notepad. A whole other world. A completely different civilization. It's amazing, there's so much to learn. I take it you like to learn, Naruto said which got Annabeth rapidly nodding her head. I love it, as a child of Athena I'm pretty much expected to love to learn. Reading especially. Athena, as in the goddess of wisdom and battle, he said getting a nod from Annabeth. That's awesome. Thanks. You never know she could be your Olympian parents too since you're unclaimed. Well if I am then I guess that would kinda make me your brother, he said causing Annabeth to smile brightly. Before the two could continue their conversation Chiron's voice sounded out through the amphitheater telling everyone it was time to head back to their cabins. As everyone got up Naruto was about to join before a thought quickly appeared in his head. He tapped Annabeth's shoulder getting her attention. Annabeth you were the one who found Grover. Percy and I with Chiron last night right? He asked getting a nod from the girl. Could you tell me who the other girl was? Oh sure, the other girl was Selina Beauregard. She's a daughter of Aphrodite and the one that helped you back to camp while I helped your friend Percy. She urm, ah she is just over there, she said pointing over towards a group of girls that were just leaving the amphitheater. They were all stunning beautiful but Annabeth pointed to the one in the middle of the group. Naruto breathing hitched slightly when he saw her. She was by far the most stunning of the group and must have been only a year younger than him since she looked about the same age. Her raven black hair blended in with the night sky perfectly while her dazzling blue eyes seemed to sparkle in the night. Her skin was slightly tanned but a little lighter than Annabeth's tanned skin. All in all Naruto couldn't take his eyes away from her. Said girl then looked over and spotted him looking in her direction which caused a hint of pink to appear on her face before she gave a small wave to him. Naruto waved back which caused the girls all around Selina to notice and begin to giggle at the little action before the group all left the amphitheater. Come on Naruto, he heard as two pairs of arm appeared on his shoulder which belonged to Connor and Travis. Let's head back. We don't want to be out here when those harpies are around, they said as they began leading him out with the others from the Hermes cabin. He waved goodbye to Annabeth before he set off. It only took a few minutes before he found himself standing outside the Hermes cabin. It's not much but it's home, the twins said together before they led Naruto inside. When he walked in the first thing he noticed was how cramped it was. 
All the beds and bunk beds had been taken and there were sleeping bags littered all around the room. Here you go, Naruto Luke said appearing in front of him handing over a sleeping bag and some toiletries. Pound take this spot, no one's using it yet so you're welcome to it, he said pointing over to a spot next to the bunk beds that Connor and Travis slept on. Just as Naruto was about to head over Luke tapped his shoulder. Don't forget these, since you're part of this camp now you're pretty much required to have these, he said as he handed over a bright orange shirt with the words Camp Half-Blood written in black along with a bare leather necklace. We all have the necklace, he said showing his that had five multicolored beads on its. Each bead represents one summer that we have been at camp. The little mark or picture on the bead shows what all the head counselors have agreed was the biggest event of that summer. Naruto nodded in understanding and looked at Luke's necklace. So since you have five beads on yours I guess you have been here for five summers right? He said getting a nod from Luke. That's right. Though a few stay here all year around due to their scent being strong enough that attracts monster or they simply don't have anywhere to go. Annabeth and I are year rounders so we have stayed here all round for the past five years. I guess you and Annabeth know each other pretty well then, he mentioned getting a nod from Luke. Yeah we arrived here together. Guess she is kind of like a little sister to me in a way and we have been through a lot. Especially with Talia, he said whispering out the last part. Talia, Naruto said to himself. He remembered that name form the bus ride from Yancey Academy. He and Percy had heard Grover mention that name before. Who is this Talia if you don't mind me asking? I heard Grover mention that name before. When Naruto asked he noticed a dark look gross Luke's face as his hair slightly covered his eyes and his hand shake slightly next to his sides. It's nothing. It's not a story many like to talk about especially myself, Grover and Annabeth. Let's just say there should have been another that arrived with me and Annabeth but that didn't happen, he said as Naruto caught him looking out the window and out at the big tree on top of the hill. When Naruto turned around Luke was across the room. Since both Grover and Luke knew the name and Grover got sad over it while Luke was angry he guessed this Talia person must have been a friend of theirs. Since they were talking in past tense he guessed something bad must have happened to her. Naruto shook his head of the negative thoughts and went to wash. After he brushed his teeth and washed his face, he changed into a pair of shorts and t-shirt and got in his sleeping bag. He made sure Connor or Travis hadn't done anything to his sleeping bag before he lay down and just looked up at the ceiling. Light out everyone, Luke voice said ringing out before the light went off. There were a lot of good nights while others grumble before Naruto shut his eyes. It defiantly was the greatest place to sleep but he made do before he quickly soup bed to sleep. Next day Naruto had woken up fairly early since everyone else in the cabin was still sleeping so he went to bathroom, washed up, got changed with his new half-blood t-shirt on before he exited the cabin. The sun had barely just come up so the morning mist around the camp was still there. He saw a few of the wood nymphs heading over towards the dining pavilion, no doubt they were preparing for the morning breakfast. Some of them looked over a little surprised to see him up already but he gave them a friendly smile and wave which they happily gave back. He cracked his neck and did a few warm up stretches before he went for a morning run around the camp and put his iPod in his ears. As he ran around the camp he looked at his surroundings and marveled at how beautiful it looked under the first rays of the sun everything seemed to glimmer and shine especially the big golden cabin. He quickly looked it away when he feared he would go blind from looking at it for too long. The run around camp didn't take long for him to finish before he wound up in front of the big house. He doubted anyone else was up but was surprised when he saw Chiron trotting up toward the big house with a surprised look on his face. My it is a bit early for you to be up Naruto. Couldn't sleep well? He asked but Naruto shook his head. No believe it or not this is a usual time for me to wake up. Thought I would get some early morning training done before breakfast. Chiron nodded pleased to see how quickly Naruto had adapted to camp. Well then I will leave you to it. Remember when the conch horn calls out breakfast will be ready, he said before he disappeared inside. Naruto watched the centaur go before he made his way around camp and entered the big arena that he was told most went to so they could train. He entered and found the place was a lot like the Chunin exam arena in a way. The training ground was a large oval shape with wooden dummies planted all over the place. There were wooden stand wrapped around it where people could most likely watch. He guessed it was used for other events due to how many could be seated in the stands. Well let's get started, 
he said before he called out his patented shadow clone jutsu and 40 clones appeared in front of him before he got into a fighting stance. All right guys come at me with everything you got, he said making the come on motion with his hands. Yes boss, they all saluted before they all charged at him. Two hours later Luke made his way to the arena where Chiron had sent him to retrieve Naruto since the conch horn was about to blow any minute. The taller blonde was surprised to see Naruto had already woken up and gone out for a bit of morning training which left him a little impressed at the dedication. However when he walked into the arena and saw Naruto fighting over a dozen copies of himself his jaw was left slightly open. He was amazed at the feats these shinobi could do and watching Naruto fighting hand to hand with them all and winning was amazing. Luke realized then that Naruto may have just become a strong contender for the camp's strongest demigod. When Naruto beat the last clone of the third wave he spotted Luke watching him and figured it was time to end the morning training so he wiped the sweat of his brow before he walked over. Morning, he said as he chuckled at Luke's gobsmacked look. How? Naruto tapped his nose. Shinobi trick, he said before the two walked off. The morning from then on went pretty smoothly. When he got back to the Hermes cabin he took a quick shower getting rid of the sweat and smell he attained from training. He also rinsed his orange shirt before drying it with a quick wind jutsu which made the shirt as good as new. Breakfast went smoothly except for the part where everyone heard Luke ask him about the copies he made. This got another information gathering session from Annabeth who had a brand new notepad in her hands. He told her about the technique before telling her would tell her more later to which agreed too. After breakfast where Naruto ate enough for four people he went with the Hermes cabin for a Greek lesson. He was surprised when he found Annabeth was the teacher but Connor and Travis told him she was the best at speaking and talking Greek since she was a daughter of Athena. When the lesson got underway Naruto was amazed that he could understand everything in the Greek textbook and marveled at finally being able to read properly which caused many in the room to chuckle. Half the reason he hated reading the past was due to not being able to read the text in books but now he might just give it a chance. After an interesting lesson to which Annabeth told him he did well for his first time as two exited the classroom. But before they could both leave Grover came running up to them. Naruto, Chiron wanted me to let you know Percy is awake and is at the big house. Naruto's eyes widened slightly before he grinned and made his way towards the big house. Grover and Annabeth followed too. When he arrived he saw Percy was sitting in the same seat he was the day before with Chiron now back in his wheelchair. However Mr. D didn't look too happy since his eyes looked like they were on fire with purple wisps coming out from them. The camp director saw Naruto coming over and gave the blonde a quick nod which Naruto did back. Geez Percy what did you do to piss Mr. D off? He asked coming up being the black haired boy and getting a jump of surprise from Percy whose eyes widened when he saw his blonde friend. Naruto. He said leaping of the chair to give his friend a quick hug. Thank God you're okay. What is going on? I'm so confused and. Calm down Percy. Naruto said patting Percy on the shoulder. I know it's a lot to take in but everything that Chiron and Mr. D have said is the truth. You mean the gods being real and my mom being. Yeah it's all real. I'm sorry about your mom Percy, he said. Percy looked down obviously trying to keep his tears at bay. The others had a look of sympathy especially Grover since he felt like it was his fault and that he should have protected them better while Mr. looked like he didn't really care. Naruto saw Annabeth and decided to quickly change the topic. Ah Percy this is Annabeth. She's the one who found us and brought you to camp. Percy looked up and Naruto could see a small shade of pink appear on Percy's face causing Naruto to inwardly smirk. It was silent for a few seconds as Naruto saw Annabeth gray eyes scanning Percy over as if she was trying to figure out the best way to take him down. You drool when you sleep. She said ending the silence causing Percy to face fault and Naruto to burst out laughing at how blunt she was. Grover and Chiron also chuckled while Percy looked like his pride had just taken a bit of a hit. You are am sorry, was all he managed to say before he decided to just stay quiet as Chiron who now leapt out of the wheelchair causing Percy's eyes to go all bug-eyed. Come Percy I'll take you on a tour of the camp, he said as Annabeth then sprinted off along with Grover. However Naruto decided he would go with Percy just to make the boy feel better and so he had another familiar face with him. Chiron took them on the same route Grover had taken them the day before. Naruto had already seen it all and was either daydreaming away or watching the other campers go about their day. 
He listened in when Percy claimed to have seen something move the curtain from the attic window but Chiron quickly shot it down to it being nothing which Naruto found a little suspicious but let it go for now. After about half an hour of Percy asking question after question they eventually got to the cabins. When they got there Naruto looked around and saw that a tall well-built girl about his age was staring at Percy as if he was fresh meat. She wore a red bandana on her head and had straggly brown hair. Over her orange shirt she wore a camo flak jacket. The girl was lean but muscular. A lot more muscular than all the other girls he had seen around here. But Naruto had to admit she did look pretty. He thought she must have been one of the more rough and tumble kind of girls that isn't afraid to lay out a few punches and receive them back if the few old scars on her arms were any indication. She was standing outside the red cabin with barbed wire on the roof. If Naruto could remember what Grover told him the other day that was the Ares cabin therefore making that girl a daughter of Ares. Ah and this is where you will be staying until you are claimed, Chiron said as he led Percy towards the Hermes cabin. Naruto was about to follow before he saw the stables just a little way off and decided to go check it out. I'm heading off, I'll see you later, Percy he called getting a timid nod from Percy. Percy knew he couldn't expect Naruto to stay with him all the time and was grateful for sticking with him this far. As Percy walked toward the Hermes cabin where he saw Annabeth was waiting for him and Chiron Naruto made his way over to the stables. The stables were made of wood that was white in color though some of the wood had clearly begun to fade while it also had a mix of brick and stone. There was bit of hay and vegetables lying over the place though it did look cleaner than most stable he had gone to which were not that many. When he walked in he looked in amazement when he saw a long line of horse pens which housed the most beautiful creature he had seen to date. The pegasi varied in color from white, brown and gray. Their wing folded up on their sides just like that of a bird but they look magnificent. He walked down the line and stopped in front of a beautiful pegasus with snow white fur and wings and had an almost silver looking mane along its neck. When he got close to the pen it was in it moved its head and looked right at him its brown eyes staring deeply into his sapphire ones. Naruto wasn't sure highway but he felt like the horse was studying. Making sure he was not a threat to it and that it wouldn't hurt it. A little shakily Naruto extended his arm out towards the pegasus and outstretched his fingers. The pegasus didn't move for about half a minute as it looked at his fingers before slowly it trotted towards him. Naruto held in his breath when it got close until the pegasus's head now grazed the tips of his fingers. Light and carefully he put his palm onto the pegasus's head and gently stroked the animal. The pegasus obviously liked the feeling since it whinnied a little and had an almost peaceful look across its face and eyes. Naruto was amazed at how comfortable the animal felt around him, it was like the animal just had an automatic trust in him. Beautiful isn't she, a voice called out causing Naruto's head to whip around and eyes widen slightly when none other than the girl he had been trying to talk to all day yesterday was standing there looking towards him and the pegasus with a small smile on her face. She walked over and patted the pegasus on the neck. Yeah she is, she is quite possible the most amazing animal I have ever seen, Naruto said getting a nod in agreement from Selena. I'm surprised she has taken to you so quickly. It took me a few weeks before she felt comfortable to be around me. Guess you have a way with animals, she said as she gazed at Naruto who blushed slightly at her stare. Maybe, I guess she just recognizes I am no threat to her, he said getting a satisfied nod from Selena. I'm Naruto by the way. Selena giggled, oh I know who you are. You have been quite the talk of the camp especially with your little display last night. I'm Selena Beauregard, daughter of Aphrodite. It nice to meet you, he said sticking his hand out to which Selina quickly shook along with a little giggle escaping from her mouth. You were the one who found me on the hill that night weren't you? He said getting a confirming nod from Selina. I just want to thank you for helping me. I was pretty out of it with Mr. Beefcake whacking me in the chest. You're welcome, she said politely getting a small hint of pink appear on her cheeks from the thanks. Naruto looked her over and saw she was wearing almost the same as the day before except her skirt was now light blue and she had silver colored sandals on her feet. Her nails and toenails were colored a light blue to match her skirt and her eyes. One thought was going through Naruto's head at this point in time. The girls in the leaf village have nothing on her. At the same time Selina was looking him over from the corner of her eyes. 
She saw that the camp half-blood shirt fitted him perfectly and framed his lean but muscular frame perfectly and was impressed with the black long shorts he was wearing and the black converses. I can see why so many of my sisters are falling for him already, she thought. I do hope he isn't a son of Aphrodite. That would break a lot of hearts. Both then caught each other staring sat one another before they quickly turned their heads hiding the pink on their cheeks before they both let out a little laugh. Naruto saw the necklace on around her neck and saw the one bead on it that was colored blue. You have been here one year I guess from the bead, he said motioning to her necklace. Yeah I came here last summer when I was twelve. I spent about a week in the Hermes cabin before my mom claimed me. When most people look at me they just see this pretty girl who is a daughter of Aphrodite and that all I do is look in the mirror and talk about clothes and love and stuff. So I tried to branch myself out from that. I took up Pegasus riding lesson which I found I excelled out. I'm pretty confident in saying I'm one of the best Pegasus riders in the camp. If you like I could teach you how to ride one, she said tucking a strand of hair behind her ear a little nervously. S sure I'd really like that, Naruto said back stuttering a little at first and causing a big smile to cross Selena's face. The Pegasus was looking between the two and if Naruto didn't know any better he could have sworn she was smirking. However before the two could talk any more a blast that sounded like a small explosion sounded out through the air. Both Naruto and Selina looked at each other before they headed out of the stables to see what the commotion was. Naruto and Selina ran out of the stables as quick as they could as they made it outside and looked in the direction where they heard the explosion come from. However what they saw was not exactly what they expected. Standing outside one of the restrooms was none other than Percy who was looking a little worse for wear but other than that he was fine. It was those around him that seemed to have been affected. In a huge puddle of muddy water in front of the building was the girl who was eyeing Percy from the Ares cabin. She was sitting in the giant puddle drenched in water yelling at her two boys that stood next to her. No doubt they were from the Ares cabin too. However Annabeth was also there and unfortunately she was not as lucky either. She was drenched from head to toe and was not looking too happy at Percy who for some reason was completely dry. When Naruto and Selina saw it Naruto had to bite his lip to stop from laughing out loud while Selina covered her mouth but Naruto could clearly hear small giggling sounds slipping through. The two made their way over and when they got close the group noticed them. So what happened Percy? Was the bathroom not to your liking? He said taking a look inside the bathrooms and seeing all of the piping had been pretty much destroyed and burst all over the place. He got a snort from Annabeth and a nervous chuckle from Percy while Clarice glared slightly at Naruto. Come on Clarice, I'm guessing your camp welcome didn't exactly go as planned, Selina said walking up to the downed girl who stuck out her hand. The tall girl looked at her a little hesitantly before she accepted. Something like that. She said as she got up and flapped her arms about trying to dry her sleeves of us a bit and get the mud stains off. Her eyes slowly drifted over towards Naruto who was standing next to Selina before she narrowed her eyes. So Ninja Boy is here too, she said study him just like Annabeth had been with Percy. She was looking him over and saw a few scars on his arms showing that he really is a fighter and was guessing that he must have had a few decent fights. She extended her hand out. I'm Clarice daughter of Ares. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, he said accepting the handshake. Nice to meet you war girl, he said getting a little look of surprise from Clarice and those around him before she grinned. Nice nickname, I have to say those little ninja tricks you performed last night were interesting. Those can definitely help on the battlefield. And beating the Minotaur is no easy feat. You made quite a few people a little jealous from around camp at the chance you got, myself included. You I can believe beating it, him not so much, she said pointing towards Percy who pouted and looked a little angry. Perhaps we could spar sometime to see if it's your not all talk that is. Naruto was now the one who grinned at her. That sounds great, though from a daughter of the war god my expectations will be a little higher than normal. Then I'll make sure I don't disappoint ninja boy, she said before she looked at her clothes. I don't suppose you have a little ninja trick that could make my clothes dry. She said in a jokey manner. Sure, he said shrugging which got a little look of disbelief from those around him. He made a few quick hand signs before he pushed a warm current of air over Clarice in her wet clothes. 
After about a minute of silence as everyone watched her clothes dry Naruto stopped the jutsu as Clarice and everyone else checked her clothes over which were now completely dry and like they weren't wet in the first place. Whoa, was on the thought on everyone's mind while Naruto looked as if what he did was an everyday thing. Everyone looked at him in amazement while Annabeth had stars in her eyes again. Naruto knew she would have about a hundred more questions already lined up for him so he figured he would explain. Where I'm from every ninja had a nature affinity meaning we can manipulate the element that we are most in tuned with. As you can see mine is wind. Since I have practiced my control over it I can use the wind to do little tasks like drying clothes. It's pretty handy with chores. Clarice whistled in amazement just like the others did and nodded her thanks to him before looked over and glared at Percy. Don't think you will get off lightly Prissy, she said with venom in her tone. I won't forget this and I will make you pay. That is a promise, she said before she stomped off with the other two silent members of her group following behind her but gave a nod to Naruto and Selina before she walked past. I better go too, I have some writing lesson in a few minutes, Selina said. Remember Naruto if you ever want to learn how to ride a Pegasus just ask and I will be happy to show you the ropes, she said before giving Percy and Annabeth a wave and a little wink towards Naruto which made him blush a little before heading back towards the stables. Well that was eventful, what did you do to piss war girl off? He asked Percy and Annabeth who then went on to explain. Percy told him she just came up to him and said he couldn't have been one of the two who beat the Minotaur and then went on to pick a fight with him. She was about to give him a swirly in the toilets when all of a sudden the pipes all burst and the water collided into Clarice and knocked her outside. Naruto listened intently but frowned a little when he heard about the water. The way Percy explained it made it sound like someone was controlling the water. He then wondered if it could have been Percy since his emotions was no doubt going wild from the fight with Clarice that he caused it before he put it in the back of his mind. She is a bully, Annabeth said. She just enjoys making people's lives hell around here, she said while Naruto shrugged. I thought she was alright. A little rough around the edges but friendly enough. That's because you seem to have her respect. She respects anyone who can fight well enough and it's very rare to come by. The way Annabeth spoke about her told Naruto that she obviously did not get on with the older girl and the two had come into conflict before in the past. Oh well, Naruto said. Let's get Percy back to the Hermes cabin. I'm sure there is still much for him to see. The group nodded before Annabeth asked. Naruto do you think you could URM? She said motioning to her still drenched clothes to which Naruto nodded. He did the same to Annabeth as he did to Clarice and after a minute Annabeth was completely dry again. Thank you, she said smiling at him while Naruto gave her a grateful nod. The day went on smoothly from there. As they walked back Percy repeatedly apologized to Annabeth who simply told him to drop it. They also began discussing about whom Percy's godly parent could be. Since both Naruto and Percy knew his mom was very mortal, it could only mean his day was his Olympian parent. Percy was still in disbelief about the fact that the gods were real but he was slowly coming around. Then Annabeth told them about the time she and a few others from camp got the chance to go to Mount Olympus during the winter solstice. Both boys were amazed that she actually got to go there which she then told them that Mount Olympus was accessible to get to by going to the Empire State Building. Percy shook his head in disbelief while Naruto laughed. They were near Mount Olympus the whole time they were in New York and they did not even realize it. Thought when Percy had asked Annabeth about her parents or more particularly her dad. That didn't go over well with the girl and immediately told Percy to drop it and not to ask. The rest of the day went pretty quickly and smoothly as the two spend most of the day in the Hermes cabin talking and Naruto introducing him to Connor and Travis who seemed to like Percy at first glance. Then when dinner came around Luke did the same with Percy as he did with Naruto with telling him the rules and about the offerings to the gods. Naruto once again made his offering to his mom and Lady Hestia. Afterwards they went to the amphitheater again and the Apollo cabin once again started singing, this time singing songs that others were sure dated back into the 90s. Thankfully Naruto saw that Percy had calmed down now and was finally beginning to settle in, even if it was only slightly. He laughed during the campout and helped himself to a few marshmallows around the fire. Naruto was happy to see that his friend was beginning to feel more comfortable at their new home. 
As the day came to an end Percy and Naruto took their spots in the Hermes cabin with Naruto back next to Connor and Travis's bunk bed while Percy was a little ways away and next to one of the windows at the front of the cabin. From then on both Naruto and Percy went along with the day-to-day -day activities. On the Wednesday was Naruto's first archery lesson which he along with some of the others from the Hermes cabin took part in as well as Percy and a few from the Apollo cabin. First archery lesson Chiron took that lesson and had the camper line up in front of the targets. Thankfully there were enough targets for everyone to have one each. Naruto and Percy took the targets next to each other as they listened to Chiron explain how bow is used and explained how to use them properly and safely without hurting themselves in the process. While Naruto managed it without problems Percy was another story. Somehow he managed to get the bowstring hooked on his necklace around his neck and then chipped the edge of the bow while trying to get it off. When eventually he managed to get it free he took a deep breath and followed Chiron's instruction as did Naruto. Pull the string back but don't force it back. Keep calm, keep your breathing steady and pull back gently. Aim and then take the shot. Naruto did so and put his index finger and middle finger around the quiver of the arrow while his thumbs held the shot together. He kept his breathing light and steady and could hear the delicate sound of his heartbeat in his ears. It felt like everything else around him had gone silent and was focused solely on the target. Percy was attempting to do the same but was struggling to focus on the target and his grip on the arrow kept loosening. Then at the same time both boys let the arrow rip through the air and hit their target. Chiron trotted over and first looked at Percy's and winced slightly when he saw the arrow had not even hit the target and instead hit one of the trees by the forest with the arrow embedded in the bark. A wood nymph then appeared next to the tree and began shouting out Greek curse words to Percy who had an embarrassed look on his face. Sorry, he shouted but the wood nymph just glared at him before shaking her fist in the air before disappearing into the tree. Sorry Chiron. Percy said as he looked at the centaur as he delicately put the bow back onto the ground. Don't worry Percy, it's your first try and you will improve, he said trying to keep Percy in high spirits. He then turned to Naruto and looked at the target. He was pleasantly surprised when he saw the arrow was embedded right in the center of the bull's eye. Very good Naruto, he said applauding the blonde who was just as surprised as he was to get a bull's eye on his first ever try. It not often one gets a bull's eye on his first try. Not even some of the Apollo's children manage that. Maybe it was beginner's luck he said getting a small nod from Chiron but Naruto knew that what he just said was a lie. Naruto looked towards the target and just stared at the arrow. It felt like the world had just stopped when he fired the arrow. He didn't understand why but with the bow in his hand and firing the arrow it had just felt so natural to him, like he was born to use a bow. Like his body had all of a sudden gone on autopilot and was discovering a skill he didn't even know he had. He thought perhaps past target practice with Kanai and Shurikens had helped but he was not so sure. Naruto looked behind him to see there were four more arrows in the pile behind him. He got them and placed them next to him, wanting to try something out. What happened next left those watching quite shocked and mouths opened slightly. As quick as lightning and one after the other Naruto fired the arrows towards the targets that it almost looked like a blur. It happened within the space of 10 seconds but when everyone looked over at the target board the four new arrows were all on the bull's eye all embedded into each other and causing the first and second arrow to split in half from the force of the other three. Chiron whistled while some of the other campers applauded. It was not every day you saw something like that and Naruto was continuing to surprise them. Percy gave Naruto a thumb up for a job well done which Naruto nodded back thankfully. My word Naruto if I had not known you before you came here I would have said you were a professional at this. Chiron said examine the target again thinking at the rate Naruto was going he could be one of the best archers the camp has ever had. I can't really explain it, Naruto said getting Chiron's attention. When the bow was in my hand it just felt right. Like I knew exactly what to do and my body just went on autopilot. Chiron nodded. He had heard that before from some of the Apollo demigods but they had never quite been able to perform something as incredible as Naruto on his first try. Currently Chiron along with Grover and Mr. D were the only ones aware that Naruto's godly parent was his mom. And out of all the goddesses Chiron knew of only one who could do something like that with a bow. However the thought was quickly erased from the centaur's thoughts since the thought itself was completely ludicrous and the chance of her having a child was all but zero. Well nevertheless you did amazing for your first time with a bow Naruto, he said before he trotted off to help Percy who had somehow got the bowstring stuck in his pants zipper. 
Naruto looked at the bow in his hands before shaking his head and went to get some more arrows. After that lesson word quickly spread at how great Naruto turned out to be with a bow which gave him a lot of attention from the Apollo cabin. A member from the Apollo cabin Lee Fletcher congratulated Naruto on his great five arrow bull's eye and told him he was welcome to train with the Apollo cabin whenever he liked since the camp doesn't get that many prodigies in archery other than those in the Apollo cabin. Naruto happily accepted and quickly made another new friend with the son of Apollo. After that later in the afternoon everyone was down at the beach. Since it was a warm day Chiron thought it would be a good idea to have canoe racing. Since Percy and Naruto were new they thought they would give it a shot. Chiron mainly wanted to see I how the two boys did since they both showed different strength and weaknesses with Naruto being great with a bow while Percy not so much. Naruto sat in the canoe as he paddled with the oar on the right side of the canoe. His limits in patience were being slightly tested here since Naruto had quickly discovered he was not that great at canoeing. He was not terrible but he was struggling with keeping the canoe to go straight. Thankfully he was glad he was not as bad as those from the Apollo and Dionysus cabin who were just paddling around in circles. On the shore everyone from Campy were on the beach either watching the race or in the daughters of Aphrodite's case lounging on the sand sun bathing in their bikinis. Only Selina was the only one from her cabin not wearing swimwear but did opt to wear more sun-worthy clothes and was paying attention to the race and was giggling at how flustered and annoyed Naruto was getting. This is getting ridiculous, he grumbled. Far ahead in front was Percy who seemed to be in his element. Naruto couldn't help but notice that anything water-based Percy just seems to excel at. Whether it was swimming, diving, or now canoeing. Percy's face was elated that he finally had something he could show everyone he was good at. While canoeing would not have been his first choice it was still a good feeling to be first at something for once like Naruto had been earlier that day. Meanwhile as Naruto paddled coming up from behind him and passing him was Clarice who had a victorious smirk on her face. Looks like canoeing is not one of your strong suits huh ninja boy, she said chucking as she splashed a bit of water at him with the oar. Fed up Naruto threw the oar into the canoe getting a few looks from those watching on the shore. That's it I'm doing this my way, he said and then stood up a little shakily, sent some chakra to his feet before stepping out of the canoe and onto the water. When he stood on the water all those on the beach stopped what they were doing and looked at him with disbelief on their face. No frickin way. He heard one person say as Naruto took his shirt off since he was beginning to sweat a lot from the heat and then picked up the canoe, put it over his head before he began running on the water. Back on the shore Mr. D who was sitting in a deck chair with Diet Coke in his hands began laughing at the look on everyone's face and mentally congratulated Naruto on putting on a good show for them since canoe racing was usually very dull. Percy who had just crossed the finished line and was being congratulated by Chiron saw Chiron's look of surprise and turned around and couldn't help but burst out laughing when he saw Naruto running on the water coming in second and giving Clarice a sly grin causing said girl to throw her oar in the ocean and throw a bit of a tantrum. Once finished he and Percy then walked towards the beach and Naruto had to blush slightly when he saw many of the girls from all different cabins have a predator-like look on their face while Selina was blushing madly. It was then that he remembered he was not wearing a shirt and quickly took off to put one on causing a groan of disappointment from said girls. However those that weren't fawning over Naruto physique were left slightly put back when they saw the big fist sized scare on his chest that was a few inches above his heart. Annabeth was studying the scar with wide eyes trying to figure out what weapon could make such a scar. Even Clarice who had finally finished and was walking back saw the scar and winced at the sight of it. Many were left wondering how he received it and more importantly how on earth he managed to survive an injury like that. They wanted to go and ask Naruto about it but a stern look from Mr. D and Chiron told them to leave it be. After that many of the campers had questions for Naruto but subtly he managed to get out of them by either changing the subject or giving them an answer but not the one they were looking for or that answered the question. His scar was becoming a fast topic amongst the campers, mainly the Ares cabin who had told him what a badass scar it was. Clarice told him also that anyone who could survive a scar like that and keep on fighting was okay in her books. The two had a spar later that night that was swords only and despite not quite being on the same level of swordsmanship as Clarice was she had to admit for someone who never used a sword before she was slightly impressed that he managed to keep up. Plus she knew if it was an all out fight or hand to hand combat Naruto would have the advantage. That surprised her but she gave him a nod of respect. 
Clarice despite not being overly friendly with many in camp other than Selina who Naruto still saw as having a very strange friendship since they were the complete opposite was slightly beginning to see Naruto as a friend though she would not admit it. Then the next day while Percy was having a sword fighting lesson with the Hermes cabin, Naruto passed on it since he practiced with Clarice the day before and decided to take the offer of Pegasus riding from Selina. Naruto stood in the stables with Selina as he watched her demonstrate how to put a saddle on the back of a Pegasus. She had been demonstrating for the last 10 minutes and while Naruto was paying attention he couldn't but get a little sidetracked when he ended up staring at how pretty she was. Of all the girls in the Aphrodite cabin, despite the girls being very nice and friendly they could all be a little high maintenance and needy and all they ever seemed to do was check their reflection in anything with a mirror service. But yet Selina was a little different and preferred to walk her own path than the one she was expected off from a daughter of Aphrodite. You understand everything I just said? She asked Naruto whose mind was elsewhere at that moment before shaking his head. Sorry say that again? He said but Selina rolled her eyes. Never mind, come on let's go flying, she said in a cheery voice as she and Naruto led to Pegasi out of the stables. Selina would be riding the beautiful white horse that Naruto had petted the other day who Selina had named Moonshine which got a laugh from Naruto. But it was nothing compared to the horse he would be riding. He was riding a beautiful light brown horse with chestnut brown eyes that was named Porkpie. When they were out of the stables and were in a nice clear area both slowly and carefully mounted their pegasi. Selina was on it on seconds since she was pretty much a professional by now but Naruto took a bit longer since he wanted to be careful and not mess up. After about a minute both were mounted. Naruto was a little nervous since this would not only be his first time on a pegasus but also his first time flying. Selina could see that he was a little nervous so she trotted up next to him and put her hand on his shoulder. It's okay. I was a little nervous at first too. Just trust in your pegasus and you will be fine. She said with Naruto giving her a grateful nod. For Selina it was a little nice seeing Naruto look a little more human since ever since he came here he always seemed so fearless and superhuman. It was refreshing to see that despite him being a little more powerful and different from the other demigods, he was still just like all of them in the end. Just watch me and then copy it, she said. Before Naruto could ask any questions Moonshine had already started running. Then their wings spread out and started flapping and then was gliding upwards into the air. Naruto watched intently as they took off before he looked dead ahead of him. I can do this, he said before looking down at the Pegasus. Take care of me here buddy, it's my first time. The Pegasus whinnied as if saying, no problem. He took a deep breath and before he knew it pork pie was galloping. Then the Pegasus's brown wings extended and began flapping. He could hear the hoofs of the Pegasus hitting the ground before all of a sudden there was nothing. He then looked around amazed when he saw he was now off the ground and Porkpie was getting higher in the air. Selina then appeared next to them and gave Naruto a big smile which Naruto happily returned. The route they took went all over the camp and Naruto saw just how big the camp was. He saw all the campers rushing around and looked like tiny ants. He then looked over to the arena. If he squinted enough he swore he could see Percy. Then Porkpie broke off from Selina and Moonshine and headed over towards the ocean. It flew over and began lowering itself until its hoofs were just about scratching the surface of the ocean. Naruto looked around all amazed and felt the cool wind hitting his face. He extended his arms out just like the Pegasus was doing before shouting, This is amazing. The only word he could use right now was that it was exhilarating. They flew around for another 30 minutes before Naruto looked over towards the stables and saw Selina had landed and thought that maybe it was time to come down too. The Pegasus whinnied as if it understood him before it began to lower to the ground, after a minute of circling the area it touched back down on the ground and when it stopped Naruto carefully and slowly got off. Amazing huh? Selina said appearing next to Naruto. That was amazing. Being in the air like that, I have honestly never felt so alive. It's an amazing feeling. Now you know why I love it so much, I hope we can ride together again soon she said. Sure I would like that, he said getting a small twinge of pink to appear on his face which also happened to Selina. The two then headed back into the stable. After that the day went pretty quickly. When he went back to the Hermes cabin he met with Percy who just finished his sword lesson. He said how he fought Luke who had been named the best swordsman in the last 300 years which impressed Naruto. 
Then Percy told Naruto how he suddenly had this surge of energy after drinking water. This made Naruto think. This was the second time in the past few days that Percy had done something amazing with water. Plus there was also the incident back at the museum and the fact that Percy was just amazing with her in water. Naruto for now put it to the back of his mind for something to think about later. It was now evening time in the camp and everyone had just finished their dinner at the pavilion and everyone one was once again located in the amphitheater. As usual the Apollo kids were going to start singing but were debating about what songs they should sing this time around. Even Mr. D had decided to join them although he didn't look too happy and scowled most of the time. Just as the Apollo kids were about to get up and start singing Clarice voice called out. Wait, she shouted getting odd looks from everyone. Is everything okay Clarice? Chiron asked trotting next to the girl. It's fine but I thought maybe we could do something a little different tonight, she said getting interesting glances from everyone. Hum, Chiron said tapping his chin. What did you have in mind exactly? He asked hoping it was not anything that involved bloodshed but then saw Clarice point over to Naruto causing the blonde to look at her in confusion. Naruto you said that you're a shinobi from this other world right? She said getting a nod from him. Then you must have gone on some pretty cool mission or quests right? Now that caused everyone to perk up and look towards Naruto who was thinking. Hmm well there were a few pretty high class missions I went on before I came to this world. If you want me to tell you about any mission then I could tell you about the mission in Wave Country. That was one hell of a mission and will get your heart pumping. I don't mind telling you all since it had quite a dramatic effect on me. Would this be okay Chiron? Chiron looks thoughtful for a moment before he gave the nod that it was okay. Everyone cheered as Naruto got up and decided to take a seat next to the fire giving it that more storytelling effect. Every one of the campers began huddling together getting ready to hear the story. Annabeth and Grover sat next to Percy why while everyone else was with their cabin. Even Mr. D glanced over. Then from the woods the nymphs and some other satyrs came over to listen to the story. Naruto looked around seeing everyone looking at him before he took a deep breath. The mission was very simple. It was a C-ranked mission that required us to simply escort a bridge builder by the name of Tazuna from the Leaf Village to his hometown in a neighboring country called Wave Country. The team consisted of myself a boy called Sasuke Uchiha, a pink-haired girl called Sakura Haruno and our team sensei and leader Kakashi Hitaki. As you would expect we were all excited since this was the first time we would be out of the village and the trip would take at least three days to get there and three days to get back. So we set off and within a few hours we already ran into some trouble, he said getting excited looks from everyone. A duo of missing shinobi from water country called the Demon Brothers were lying in wait and used an illusion to hide themselves. When we went past they revealed themselves. They attacked and ripped Kakashi to shreds with spiked chains. He said getting small gasps from people that there was a death this early. He was about to continue before the fire next to him erupted causing many to jump. In the flames there were little figures and Naruto recognized that they were people from the story. Naruto grinned a little that the fire would help him tell the story. He had a feeling that everyone sitting around him were not the only ones listening to the story. I tried to fight but seeing them take care of Kakashi caused me to freeze up but Sasuke attacked and kept them at bay. It was then that Kakashi appeared and took them out with no trouble. But you just said, let me explain. Kakashi knew they were there and saw the illusion and made a clone of himself before hiding in the forest to observe what they were after. They were after the bridge builder. He had lied about the rank of the mission because his home down didn't have the money. He explained to us that a big business tycoon called Gadu had pretty much taken control of the town and was making people pay fines and taxes leaving them without money and food and leaving many on the streets and left to starve. He had mercenaries do his dirty work for him. After we heard the story we decided to press on and continue with the mission with it now being an A-ranked mission instead of C-ranked. After two days of travel we were just outside Tazuna's hometown, it was then that we met him. Who? Everyone asked at the edge of their seats, even Mr. D. We were met by another missing shinobi but he was an A-ranked shinobi and therefore very powerful that was hired by Gaidu. A man who earned his shinobi status by killing all his classmates in school, he said getting looks of horror from everyone. A man who was a member of the seven shinobi swordsmen of the mist and therefore was an elite swordsman in his own right as he wielded a six-foot butcher's knife and had earned the name Demon of the Bloody Mist. His name was Zabuza Mamochi. 
In the fire the figure of a very bulked up man wearing a mask that covered his lower face and wielding a sword as big as his body appeared. Those that weren't shivering before were now. The mere sight of his sword was terrifying. Even Clarice had that look that said she would think twice before going up against that. So Kakashi engaged Zabuza and they fought through a mist Zabuza created that made Kakashi have to rely on his Sharingan. A bloodline from the Uchiha clan that let the user copy moves and see someone's chakra network. They fought while we guarded Tazuna but then Kakashi fell into a trap and was imprisoned in water. Gasps rung out since they knew with Kakashi trapped the others would have to fight him. We knew we couldn't beat straight forward so we came up with a plan. I disguised myself as a giant shuriken with the transformation jutsu and Sasuke threw me along with another towards Zabuza. Since he had to keep his hand on the water prison to keep Kakashi trapped he could not move but managed to avoid them. However when I went past I transformed back and threw a kanai at him. Zabuza couldn't dodge it like before and had to let go of the jutsu. When he did Kakashi was freed. Cheers rang out through the arena since now with Kakashi free he could get some payback. They returned to their fighting and finally with help from his Sharingan Kakashi managed to defeat Zabuza but was left exhausted afterwards. When he was about to make the final blow a hunter shinobi came in and finished it saying he had been hunting Zabuza. He took the body and disappeared and we continued with our mission and got to Tazana's home where we met his daughter Tsunami and grandson Inari. We learned the hardships they went through since Gadu had killed Inari's father figure and had publicly crucified him in front of everyone simply because he stood up to Gadu. Also we thought about the hunter Nin who took Zabaza's body. When a hunter Nin kills someone they are supposed to destroy the body on the spot and take back evidence of the kill but this one took the body with him. It was then that we realized. Zabuza was alive. Annabeth said beating Naruto to the punch while Naruto nodded and more gasps were heard. So for the next week we trained to be ready for Zabuza and the hunter Nin who we thought must have been his accomplice. During one of those days I met someone in the woods where I trained and they asked me if I knew what true strength was. The person told me their name was Haku and lived nearby. Haku told me that true strength came when protecting someone precious to you. It was not until later that I realized just how right Haku was. The fire then showed the person Naruto was referring to as Haku and many of the boys blushed. Naruto saw this and smirked. By the way Haku was a boy. He said shocking all the boys who had been blushing and were now looking away which included Mr. D while some of the girls were even a little envious off his girly features. On the last day of the week I rested while my team went to the bridge to protect Tazuna. It was then that two mercenaries tried to break in and hurt Tsunami and Inari but Inari was standing up to them trying to protect his mom. I showed up and managed to fight them off. Known something was wrong I went to the bridge and found Zabuza had returned and was fighting Kakashi while Sasuke was fighting the hunter Nin. I went to help Sasuke but the opponent was strong. The masked figure had a bloodline that let them control ice and could move at great speed through the ice mirrors that they created that formed a dome of ice around us. We fought and fought but Sasuke got badly hurt and I believed he was dead. In my rage my power peaked and I managed to land a deadly punch to their face and knocked him out of the ice dome. The mask then cracked and in front of me was none other than Haku. He said making many eyes widened at the revelation including Mr. D's and Chiron's. Haku explained why he was with Zabuza. That Zabuza had given him a purpose in life when Haku lost his family and was a tool to be used for Zabuza to accomplish his dream of defeating the corrupt Mizukage, leader of the hidden mist village. He wanted me to kill him since he called himself a broken tool but he saw that Zabuza was in trouble. He disappeared and appeared in front of Zabuza and protected him from a killing move from Kakashi. The attack went right through his chest and killed him on impact, Naruto said sadly causing many to have tears beginning to form at Haku's tragic death of just wanting what's best for Zabuza and saw in the fire the figures which reenacted everything Naruto just said. It was then that Gatu appeared on the bridge with over a hundred mercenaries and was betraying Zabuza. He said growling which many of the other campers did. Zabuza after seeing Haku's sacrifice and finally realizing the bond he shared with him began to cry and declared us no longer his enemies. With nothing but a kanai in his mouth since his arms were disabled from Kakashi he charged through the mercenaries hoping to create a small piece of redemption. He tore through the mercenaries while getting multiple swords stuck in his back before getting to Gadu and killing him. 
The fire depicted the whole scene which entranced everyone who watched the ferocious warrior fight to his last breath which many campers marveled at. When the mercenaries tried to start a fight for Zabuza killing Gadu the entire town turned up and forced them out with our help sending the mercenaries off with their tails between their legs. He said as everyone began cheering but quickly ended when they looked at Naruto's sad face. Zabuza was souping to his wounds and asked to lie next to Haku's body wanting to die next to the person who followed him to the very end. It even began snowing and we thought the snow was Haku crying for the death of Zabuza. Zabuza asked to go to the place Haku went to before he died. We took their bodies and buried them on a hill overlooking the town with Zabuza's sword marking their graves. We stayed for a few more days to heal and complete the mission before we finally went home, he said signaling it was the end. Naruto looked up and his eyes widened a little when he saw almost everyone crying at the end of the story. Even Clarice wiped away a stray tear at Zabuza's sacrifice and Haku's tragic death. I learned something very important during that mission, he said getting everyone attention. You can get strong through training and with willpower and determination but you will never be as strong as when you are protecting the people that are precious to you. Whether they are a friend or a family member or even a teacher. The bonds we make with everyone help define us as people. Cherish everyone you form bonds with and live life to the fullest every day. Naruto walked back but then saw everyone stand up, look at him and give him a round of applause for both the amazing story and for the little speech which caused many to look a little differently at people and realize what really mattered in the world. They all thanked him for sharing that story and Chiron patted him on the shoulder and thanking him for sharing that with everyone. Naruto rejoined Percy and talked with Grover and Annabeth as the evening then continued on as everyone spoke about the story they heard and what a defining moment that mission must have been and felt like they all knew Naruto a little better now. Unknown to all, high on Mount Olympus two women were staring into a window like object that showed the camp and were staring down at Naruto with pride evident in their eyes as they smiled with care and love at him happy with the person he had become. The next day after Naruto retold his experiences from the wave mission that went over great with the entire camp, everyone began gearing up for the big event of the day. The capture the flag match. From what Naruto and Percy understood about the game it was held every Friday and there were two teams each with their own flag and the goal was to capture the other team's flag and bring it across the border. The game would be held in the forest where anything was allowed. Any weapons, magic items, skills, Everything was legal except no killing and if possible no maiming which didn't exactly help Percy's nerves. Though when Naruto heard he was excited, it had been a while since he had a good decent match or mission and this capture the flag was just what he needed to cut loose a bit. Chiron said the capture the flag came help give campers first hand experience in combat and it is beneficial because it provides the demigods with real life training needed in order to survive in the world. Right now lunch had just passed and all activates had stopped since Chiron let the two separate teams begin preparing for the evening game and discuss tactics and who would do what job. The blue team was comprised off the Athena cabin, the Hermes cabin and the Apollo cabin. By the looks of things their team had the best archers, the brains and the sneaky tactics. That and they knew with Naruto they had an advantage since he actually had real life experience in battle. The Hermes and Apollo cabin were the two biggest cabins and therefore made up for the numbers on each team. Then on the red team were all the other cabins which was made up off the Aphrodite, Demeter, Hephaestus, Dionysus and the Ares cabin. With those cabins they had defiantly had the most physical fighter if the size of most of the Ares and Hephaestus cabin was anything to go by. However from what Annabeth told him about the cabins the Aphrodite cabin would mostly sit out and watch along with some of the Demeter cabin. There were only two in the Dionysus cabin and four in the Hephaestus cabin. This mainly meant that the main obstacle would be the Ares kids who were led by Clarice. Right now Percy had left to go and talk to Grover trying to calm his nerves for the game later tonight while Annabeth and Naruto were walking in the opposite direction side by side. So I take it you have a plan? Naruto asked Annabeth as they walked towards the small HQ the blue team had set up with the Athena cabin supplying maps of the area that they would be fighting in. He saw many of Annabeth's brothers and sisters huddle around maps trying to decide which was the best method of taking the red team's flag while a group from the Hermes cabin were discussing what traps they should lay for the other team. Of course, she replied back with a grin on her face, Athena always has a plan. Well that's reassuring, he said getting a playful slap on the arm from Annabeth. The two headed into the small setup camp and walked over to Luke who was sitting by himself practicing with a small knife in his hand. 
Hey Annabeth, Naruto. You ready for later Naruto? It's yours and Percy's big debut and to capture the flag, he said grinning. You know it. I have been itching for something like this since I got here. Well I'm sure we won't disappoint. It can get pretty lively but thankfully we have not had any casualties. Well not for few years anyway. Annabeth deadpan get small sweat drops appear behind Naruto and Luke's head. Annabeth then laid out a similar map that the other Athena group was looking at and she and Luke began discussing how to go about getting to the flag. They both knew that Clarice would no doubt be their biggest obstacle. Then they mentioned another boy they called Beckendorf who was a member of the Hephaestus cabin and apparently was the next big threat towards them due to have both the muscle and brains. We can't make any foolproof plans until we actually start the game. We have to find a way to discover who is in which group. Who is defending and who is attacking. Luke nodded whilst Naruto overheard what they said and a big grin made its way to his face. If intelligence gathering is what you need then I'm the man for the job he said getting odd looks from the two blonde. Luke you know that clone jutsu I used the other day when you found me sparring in the arena, he asked getting a nod in response. That particular move was mainly designed for intelligence gathering. Meaning I can create as many clones as I want and I can send them off to get information for us. When they dispel everything they learn comes right back to me, the original, he said tapping his head get wide eyes from the two. Annabeth stared at him with a million things buzzing around in her head and she played scenario after scenario of tactics and plans they could use. Then her face broke out into a giant smile and began hugging Naruto to death. That's perfect. There are so many things we could sew with this kind of skill. The information we gather could be crucial. You're a genius, she said. He he that's a first. Never been called that before, Naruto said as he scratched the back of his head a little embarrassed at being called a genius. Luke do you know what this mean? She said. When the hunters come over Naruto will be our trump card. We might finally beat them, she said with excitement getting confused looks from Naruto so she quickly explained. The hunters are a group of all girl warriors under the command of Artemis. They visit from time to time and when they do we always have a capture the flag match against them. The hunters have won the last 55 times. Ouch, Naruto said. Losing that many times could not have been easy and was no doubt a hit to everyone in the camp's pride. They're that good? He asked. Despite us having the home advantage the hunters fight and survive in the forests. That and they know teamwork and are trained by Lady Artemis herself. They're all immortal due to being bound to Lady Artemis and therefore they fight monsters for a living and many have decades or even centuries worth of experience. Naruto whistled. Deadly was the only thing he could think of that described the hunters. The way Annabeth described them they sounded like a well-oiled machine. Plus being trained by a goddess would no doubt have its perks. But when Naruto looked over at Luke he noticed Luke had a dark look on his face when Annabeth mentioned the hunters. No doubt Luke must have had a run-in with them in the past and it did not go to well. Whilst Annabeth began letting her siblings know about the new skill their team had Luke took Naruto to where the weapons and armor was being kept. This is yours. He said picking up some bronze colored armor that covered his chest and stomach but left the shoulders and arms bare. Naruto looked it over. It was simple but effective. He put it on and fastened the straps. It felt a little tight around his chest and it was slightly heavy but that didn't really bother him all that much since he guessed it was supposed to be like that. We all have one. Chiron had both yours and Percy made since your armor is specially fitted for you and only you. Also here is your helmet he said pointing over to one of the old Greek helmets Naruto saw at the museum with the long blue horse tail plume on top. Naruto looked at it before turning back to Luke. I think I'll take my chance without the helmet, he said getting a chuckle from Luke. Yeah you're not the only one, he said before giving Naruto a bow, here since Chiron said you did so great with a bow you can use this. Hermes cabin aren't the best with bows and we don't use them much so you're welcome to use it he said while also handing over a quiver stocked with arrows. Thank man. Appreciate it, he said before asking another question. You don't by any chance have any long hunting knives do you? He asked getting an odd look from Luke. Hunting knives huh? He said before walking over to a stock pile up swords and axes and began rummaging through them. After about a minute and a few hisses of pain from Luke he pulled out an old pair of hunting knives. They looked simple and standard with black hilts with about 20 inch blade on the end. They were not as long as the ones he had used in the museum against the fury but they would do. 
If anything they were like a slightly larger pair of kanai. Thanks, I'm still getting used to using a sword and these are close enough to kanai that I should be able to use them pretty well, he said getting a nod of understanding form Luke. Stick with what you're best at until you can improve on the other skills, Luke said getting a nod from Naruto. Makes sense and it's smart. No point in taking chances, especially when we're up against Clarice and the Ares cabin. They're not children of the war god for nothing. You want me to get Percy so he can try his on? Naruto asked but the older blonde shook his head. He can try them later. I should go back with Annabeth and start thinking of plans for that little clone thing you can do. Naruto nodded and Luke exited and went back to the HQ tent. Naruto carefully took of the bronze-colored armor and put it back on the weapons bench with the other pieces of armor for everyone else. He walked out and headed back over to the cabins. As he made his way back he got waves and hellos from those from the other cabins, even ones that were not on his team. Naruto. A voice called getting his attention and smiled when he saw Katie skipping over to him once again with a basket in her hand. Hey there Katie. Now should you really be talking to me since we are on the opposite teams? He said teasingly getting a bright smile from Katie. It's okay. I'm not playing. Not really my thing so I just watch with some of the other Demeter girls and the Aphrodite cabin. Naruto nodded in understanding. Katie was only 11 and he didn't really want to have to fight her if it came down to it. If she was and he came across her he would make sure he was the one that fought her so that he could easily knock her out so she wouldn't have to feel any pain or get any wounds. It just was not in him to hurt kids like that, especially little girls. I just wanted to wish you luck. I know you will do great since you are a ninja after all. You will kick all kinds of butt. She said causing Naruto to break out into a smile as he ruffled her hair causing her to now have an adorable pout on her face. Ooh I'll get you for that Naruto, you're just lucky I have to get these over to the big house, she said shaking the basket of strawberries. Oh I'm sure if you didn't I would be in a world of trouble, he said getting a nod from Katie. She gave him a quick hug before running over to the big house. By the way your friend Percy is at the docks, she said before leaving. Naruto said his thanks before making his way over to the docks. It only took a few minutes before he saw Percy sitting there with his legs swinging over the side with Grover sitting next to him. Yo, Naruto said sitting down next to them with them saying hi back, what you doing? Panicking over tonight, Percy answered with a nervous look on his face. You will be fine. You're not fighting alone you know. You'll have me, Annabeth, Luke and the others all with you. Yeah but you don't have a giant daughter of Ares gunning after you and who wants to pound you into the ground. I guess that's true, Naruto said making Percy face palm. But don't worry so much, there will be so many battles going on she won't even notice you, so calm down. The more you get worked up, the worse you will do in the game. You're getting yourself worked up over nothing, he said. Grover agreed and the two began calming Percy's nerves which the 12 year old was thankful for. Most people forgot that he was new to this and he was only 12. Annabeth was confident because she has experience and had been here a lot longer than Percy had. Just because Naruto was okay with everything and fitting in well, didn't mean Percy was doing it as quickly. The three sat in silence before Percy began asking about the cabins and why so many were empty. Grover explained to him about the pact of the big three and that none of them had any kids in the last 60 years, well almost everyone. When Percy mentioned the Zeus cabin a sad look crossed Grover's face. Not quite. A few years ago everyone found that Zeus fell off the wagon and had a child with a mortal woman. Some 80s TV star that was too good for the god of the sky to pass up. They had a little girl who they called Talia. Talia, Naruto thought and immediately recognized the name. That's the name you said on the bus the day we left Yancey Academy. Then Luke mentioned a Talia that he was coming to camp with along with Annabeth. Is this the same Talia? He asked surprising Grover by what he knew while Percy was listening intently. Yeah it's the same Talia. Talia met with Luke and Annabeth and the three became close, like family close. I was assigned to get them and bring them to the camp. But we ran into problems along the way. Hades found out about Talia being Zeus's daughter and was enraged. He sent the worst creature from the underworld after her. All three kindly ones and masses of hellhounds were sent out after her. They chased us all the way to the camp. Just when we thought we were safe a huge horde came out of nowhere and attacked us. Talia told us to run and that she would fight them off on her own since it was her they were after. 
I didn't want to leave her but I had Luke and Annabeth to worry about. She fought with everything she had but eventually she was overwhelmed. Afterwards Zeus came down and found her near death and took pity on her. He turned her into the tree that's on top of Half Blood Hill and it protects the magical borders. Talia, Naruto whispered as he said her name and stared up at the great pine tree on top of the hill with both sorrow and amazement. Sorrow for how the girl had to meet her untimely death since he would be about the same age as she was when she made her sacrifice. And amazement at her bravery and courage. He would have liked to have met her. Very few have the guts to give up their own life for others and true friendships were something Naruto valued greatly. I wish I could have met her, she would have been a cool friend, he said getting a grateful nod from Grover while Percy didn't say a thing and just continued to think over the story. Naruto's gaze then went from the pine tree on the hill back to the cabins, or more importantly right back to cabin 8. The cabin just kept drawing him in and he felt more and more eager to actually go inside. At night he noticed the entire cabin glowed silver just like the moon. It was beautiful and it only added to Naruto's amazement. Grover who glanced at Naruto looked at where he was gazing before he gave a dry chuckle. You have to stop staring at that cabin. Nothing good can come to a boy who stares at that cabin. Percy then joined into the conversation. Is that the goddess who doesn't like boys and doesn't have kids right? He asked getting nods from both Grover and Naruto. Well not biological kids anyway but I guess she would see her hunters as her own children since she usually lives with them and trains them which is sort of what a parent would do, Grover said. It's good of her to do that. I doubt many of the other gods would do that right? He said getting a nervous nod from Grover. For her to take in girls and give them a home and a purpose is beyond kind and generous. She has my respect for that even if it's just girls she does it for. I guess, Percy said not really all that into it but Grover was a little surprised. It was not often to see a boy who would talk about Artemis with respect like that since most boys frowned at her name due to her prejudice against boys. But then again Naruto was different to most, especially since Grover had heard Mr. D had even taken a liking to Naruto and actually showed the boy some respect and some manners. The three didn't stay at the docks for much longer before they moved off. Grover went into the strawberry field to help with growing strawberries with his reed pipes despite not being all that good with them while Naruto and Percy just hung out and made conversation for the rest of the day. Soon the day became the evening and the time for the capture the flag game was near. After dinner a loud horn called out through the camp and Chiron stood at the front of the pavilion everyone telling them that the game would soon begin. Everyone stood around theirs tables and the plates magically disappeared. First came the blue team flag which had Annabeth and two of her siblings running in with a ten-foot banner. It was made of silk and was glistening grey, with a painting of a barn owl above an olive tree. All in all it was a very beautiful banner. Then came the red team flag which was being led in by Clarice along with two of her siblings. Their banner was the same in length except it was blood red that was painted with a bloody spear and a boar's head. Creative was the thought running through Naruto's head when he saw it. Everyone began cheering when the flags came in and many of the taunting was beginning again just like earlier in the day. Chiron who was watching with both pride and amusement clapped his hands before the tables filled up with equipment. In front of Naruto was the armor he had tried on earlier, the bow and arrows Luke gave him along with the pair of hunting knives. He looked them over again and nodded knowing they were good enough to use. He strapped on his armor and strapped the quiver of arrows to his back along with his bow. He sheathed his hunting knives to his sides. He looked over to see Percy struggling to put his armor on so he helped the younger boy into them. Thanks, he said before his hand traced over the armor, it's really heavy, do we have to wear these? he asked. It's either wear that or get yourself killed Percy, Luke said appearing next to him. Here's your helmet, he said giving handing over a helmet with the blue horsehair plume on top. Great, he said taking it from Luke's hand and putting it on. He couldn't help but feel silly wearing it. He looked at Naruto and saw he was not wearing one. Where's yours? If you think I'm going to be wearing one of those helmets then you have another thing coming, he said getting a chuckle from Luke and a dead panned look from Percy. It was then that Chiron hammered his hoof on the marble floor drawing everyone's attention to him. Heroes, he announced. You know the rules. The creek is the boundary line. The entire forest is fair game. All magic items are allowed. The team's banner must be prominently displayed, and have no more than two guards. Prisoners may be disarmed, but may not be bound or gagged. No killing or maiming is allowed. 
Naruto heard a lot of groaning and mumbling from that and noticed it was mostly the Aries cabin that said it. He also noticed that Clarice and a few of her siblings were glaring right at Percy with smirks on their faces. He knew that was not a good sign. He then heard Chiron mention that he would be the field medic and wished everyone good luck in the game before everyone marched off to their side of the forest. The blue team had the south side of the forest while the red team had the north side. Percy was walking next to Annabeth no doubt asking what the plan was and saw a small scowl appear on his face. He removed away and retreated next to Luke. Naruto took this chance to appear next to Annabeth which startled her a little. When she saw the look in Naruto's eyes she knew something was up. What is it? She asked. He looked over at Percy which she caught on to and then motioned over to Clarice's retreating form. She quickly put two and two together and understood what he was implying. She then groaned as if knowing something like this was bound to happen. She said she would get her revenge for the bathroom incident. I'm guessing now is the time, Naruto said getting a nod of agreement from Annabeth. We will figure it out when the game starts, she said before the two lapsed into a comfortable silence as they made their way over. Mount Olympus high above the clouds on Mount Olympus one certain goddess was sitting in her temple as she had a window-like object project a video feed of the about to begin capture the flag game at Camp Half-Blood and had it focused on Naruto. She was currently wearing a simple white Greek dress that stopped just above her knees and wore silver sandals with moon symbols on them. She had auburn-colored hair that flowed down to the middle of her back and had silver-colored eyes. She looked about 18 years old altogether. Her hands were settled in her lap as she sat down on a silver couch. She took a deep breath since she had been waiting for this day for a very long time, the day that she could finally reveal to the world who Naruto was and show them all that he was hers. Although she was excited she was also nervous. She knew full well many of the other gods were also watching like Apollo, Ares, Athena, Hephaestus, and Demeter. She was not sure about the rest but she tried not to think about it. A hand appeared on her shoulder and she looked up and smiled gratefully at who she saw. The newly arrived goddess looked about the same age as she did but she had this aura of wisdom and warmth around her. She had brownish colored hair that had a red tint to it and had brown doe like eyes. Her skin was slightly tanned compared to the other goddess's milky white skin and wore a simple brown dress. It's going to be okay, she said getting a smile from the auburn haired goddess and linked their hands together for support. Despite knowing things would be okay, she was also very nervous not only about the gods' reactions but about the reaction of another certain group since she was not sure how they were going to take this. She closed her eyes and mentally asked Iris, the goddess of rainbows to create a viewing window for said group so that they could watch this game. Yellowstone National Park in the middle of the Yellowstone wilderness in a forest that was unseen by mortals was a large campsite that contained various different sized silver tents pocketing the area with a big campfire in the middle. There was a pen that had a pack of wolves stationing in it while in the trees all around them were all sorts of different birds of prey that looked as if they acting like scouts and lookouts. All around the campfire were girls all wearing silver parker jackets that were huddled together eating away at their meal. There was about 20 of them all together and they all ranged from the ages of 10 to 16. At the head of the campfire was a girl with copper-like skin with black lush hair that was tied into a braid that draped over her right shoulder. She also had brown eyes and unlike the other girls she wore a silver circlet around her head. The girls were talking away quietly as they ate while the copper-skinned girl watched with a smile on her face before they were interrupted by a light in front of them. When the light died down they saw the same viewing-like window that the goddesses were using however they all scowled when they saw it was off camp half-blood about to have their next capture the flag game. Why is it showing us that ridiculous camp? One girl screamed out. Someone get rid of it. I don't want to look at any boys while I am eating, another shouted out. Enough, the copper-skinned girl said with a voice of authority quickly silencing the shouting group of girls. But Zoe, but nothing, there is no doubt in my mind that thou lady is showing us this for a reason. Therefore we shall watch and we will not complain. Understood? The girl revealed as Zoe said. Quick murmurs of understood came from the girls before they sat and watched the game many with frowns on their face and not happy with it. Back at camp Naruto stood with Annabeth and Luke as the horn signaling for the game to begin sounded out through the forest. Naruto had learnt that Percy had been given patrol duty over at one of the creeks. Annabeth figured since Clarice was going after him, if he was out of the way it would draw her away from the main fighting. 
While Naruto agreed he didn't like the thought of Percy having to fight Clarice and some of her siblings alone so he told Annabeth once he finished the scouting and relayed the information to her he would go and watch over Percy and help him with Clarice and the other Ares kids. As soon as the horn went off Annabeth gave Naruto the nod. Naruto nodded back before he brought his hands up to make the ram sign before saying shadow clone jutsu. In a few puffs of smoke, ten Naruto's were now standing in front of him shocking everyone except Luke since he had already seen it. You guys know what to do, he said to the clones who all gave him a salute and shouted of yes sir before they leapt up into the trees and sped off. Now we wait, he said as everyone behind him began to get ready. While Naruto did that many of the gods that were watching along with the hunters were in disbelief at what he just did. The gods realizing that he was from the elemental nation had surprised them all except for two and wondered how he ended up in their world. Meanwhile the girls in yellow stone were staring wide eyed having never seen anything like that before. A boy who could make copies of himself would not be on their favorite list. Back with the blue team they patiently waited for Naruto to receive the information while a few were beginning to get angsty. Annabeth who was stood next to Naruto tapped him on the shoulder. Naruto how much, got it, he said and immediately everyone began paying attention to what he said. Okay there are four different groups. One group is going down the left side of the forest in a group of twelve. They're being led by that big Hephaestus camper, he said making everyone realize that was Beckendorf leading them since he was the biggest of the Hephaestus kids. Another team of the same amount is going to come from the right side. It looks like they're going to try and sandwich us in when they get to the flag. The third is what we suspected, he said glancing towards Annabeth. Clarice and four of her sibling from the Ares cabin have gone straight on to search for Percy. Other than that the rest appear to be guarding the flag, he said while everyone else was beaming at him. Naruto this is fantastic. Thank the gods you're on our team. Annabeth said giving him a quick grateful hug before she began formulating plans and separating people into groups to combat the opposing groups. One group that was going to be led by Annabeth's brother Malcolm would go against Beckendorf and his group to the left of the forest. Connor and Travis would lead another group against the group from the right while Annabeth and Luke would lead a battalion against the forces around the flag. Naruto would go and watch over Percy and help him when needed while the rest guarded their flag. All right everyone good luck. Annabeth said before everyone split up while Naruto dashed into the forest and went to where Percy was located. He leapt into the trees and headed over to Percy's location which thankfully was not that far. It was just on the boundary between the blue team's territory and the red team's at a small creek. Naruto arrived after a few minutes and saw Percy standing there with his sword and shield. The shield looked far too big for Percy and the helmet with the giant blue horse hair plume just looked ridiculous in his eyes but he kept quiet. He would watch over Percy from the shadows in the trees and step in when necessary. He wanted Percy to learn to fight his own battles and Naruto not have to come in and save him. Naruto knew he was not always going to be there to save him and when that time came Percy would have to rely on his own strength to survive. While Naruto watched over Percy he made a few clones and sent them out to see how the other groups were doing. He could hear the sounds of metal clashing and shouts and taunts being thrown around. When he got the memories back he saw that Annabeth's brother and his squad had ambushed Beckendorf's group and while they managed to take down his group easily enough, Beckendorf was putting up a resilient fight. Connor and Travis and their group were still engaged with theirs but were gaining the advantage quick. Annabeth and her group with Luke were about to surprise attack and get the flag but he could not quite find Clarice and her small group. As the memories ended he was brought out his musings when he heard twigs being snapped from the thick bushes coming from the left of Percy. Percy also seemed to hear it since his head edged over to the side. Then what sounded like a growl ripped through the air before Naruto heard big footsteps heading away from the creek. Both Percy and Naruto wanted to go and see what was making those noises before five figures suddenly jumped out wearing red shirts and helmets with red horsehair plumes on top. Both Naruto and Percy immediately recognized it was Clarice who was at the front wielding a long spear. Cream the punk. Clarice screamed as she and her siblings charged in but as soon as they got close Naruto dropped out of the trees and stood side by side with Percy who jumped a little when he appeared. Whoa Naruto, where did you appear from? Percy asked greatly thankful that his friend was here with him. The trees. I was making aura you were okay and when I saw war girl and her sibling turn up I thought you could use a hand. This makes it a little more fair don't you think, he said unsheathing the knives from his their sheaths. 
Out of the way ninja boy. This is between us and him, she said pointing her spear at them with the spear tip crackling with lightning. Sorry war girl I can't do that, he said causing Clarice to growl a little. Fine then. You four take him. Prissy is mine, she said but frowned when she saw them hesitate, fighting Naruto had not exactly been on the to-do list. Stop being cowards and get him, she shouted as the four charged Naruto. Let's go, he said as jumped back making room to fight as Clarice immediately went after Percy. The group of Ares sibling charged and one brought his sword up to Naruto's head. Naruto ducked the swing and kicked him in the stomach sending him stumbling back, while a second thrust his sword towards him but Naruto managed to stop it with one of his knives. He twisted the sword around in the Ares boy's hand where it eventually fell out of his hand and Naruto punched him in the stomach before kicking him to the other side of the creek. The first Ares boy recovered from the punch to the gut and went to attack Naruto again but Naruto used his superior speed to appear behind him and whacked him on the back of the head with the hilt of his knife knocking the boy out. He looked over to see how Percy was doing and saw he was now standing in the creek with a few scratching on his face and a big cut on the top of his right arm that had blood flowing freely down it. He was brought of his musing when the remaining two Ares kids attacked him and swung their swords at him which got deflected by both his hunting knives. He managed to equal them in strength thanks to the numbers of hours of rigorous training he was doing. He pushed one away causing him to stumble while he kicked the other one away. When the two stood next to each other he quickly put his knives in way and got his bow out. Within second he shot four arrows towards the boys with two arrows each piercing through the fabric of their clothes and pinning them to the tree behind them. When they tried to get out Naruto appeared in front of them with his two knives back out and held them to their throats. If you knows what good for you, you won't try and move, he said giving both boys a cold glare which immediately caused the two to go pale and shut while nodding in acceptance knowing they were beaten. Naruto took a deep breath. The four Ares kids had been easy enough to beat since they just rushed him and didn't think things through and hardly used any teamwork either. You idiot, you corpse breath worm, Clarice suddenly shouted getting Naruto's attention. He was surprised to see Clarice now holding a broken spear with a look of pure rage on her face. He guessed that was her favorite spear. As she went to attack Percy again Percy dodged the punch she threw before whacking her in the face with the blunt end of his sword. Clarice went down like a sack of potatoes as she landed on her butt next to the creek. As the small battle died down shrieks and shouts could be heard and when they looked over Naruto and Percy grinned when they saw Luke with the Ares flag with about a dozen blue team soldiers around him to fend off any red team soldiers. No, Clarice shouted but it was too late. Luke had managed to arrive in the blue team's territory signaling the blue team had won. The banner then changed from the Red Ares cabin flag into a silver flag with a caduceus symbol on it. The moment it did all the campers around him cheered and picked Luke up on their shoulders. Chiron then wandered over and blew the horn. Blue team wins, he declared getting another round of cheers while the red team all groaned. That was some pretty good fighting boys, a voice said from behind. When Percy and Naruto looked over they saw Annabeth shimmer into existence as she took of a New York Yankees hat. Naruto looked on impressed. Invisibility hat. Cool, he said getting a nod and a smile from Annabeth. You put me here because you knew Clarice would come after me, while you sent Luke to get the flag. You had it all figured out didn't you? Percy said while Annabeth shrugged. Naruto felt a little bad for helping but he did watch over him and make sure he was okay which he was in the end. Annabeth shrugged. I told you, Athena always, always has a plan. A plan to get me pulverized. I came as fast as I could but I knew Naruto was here and let's face it with him with you you're going to be fine. Percy knew that was true but it didn't make him feel any better. How did you do that? Annabeth said walking up to Percy and examining the cut on his arm. Clarissa's spear got me. Naruto walked over and understood why Annabeth looked so surprised. It was because the fresh cut had already begun to heal. There was now just a white scratch. The two watched as the white scratch eventually faded into nothing. Whoa! Was Naruto and Percy's first thought but only Naruto expanded on them. That's similar to the fox's chakra healing me, he thought. Step out of the water! Annabeth demanded to Percy. While Percy looked at her in confusion she grabbed his arm and dragged him out. When she did Percy slumped to the ground but was caught by Annabeth and Naruto. Oh, sticks, she cursed. This is not good. I assumed it would be Zeus. 
Both looked at her in confusion before a light began to shine temporarily blinding everyone. It drew everyone else towards them including those who were only watching and they watched the light above Percy. The light was bluish green and then took the form of a three-tipped spear. A trident. When it did many gasped when they saw it. Even Naruto knew what that symbol was but it was Chiron who voiced it, it has been determined. My father, Percy said getting a nod from Chiron. Poseidon, Chiron said. Earthshaker, Stormbringer, father of horses. Hail, Perseus Jackson, son of the sea god. Many began to kneel to Percy and Naruto figured he should do the same. However just as he was about to he heard twigs being broken. The direction was where he heard it before from the bushes on the edge of the creek. He sniffed the air and could smell small traces of death, embers and dog. Not a good combination. He stood up and looked over towards the bushes and could hear rapid footsteps getting closer. Many saw him stand up and wonder what he was doing. Naruto what are you? Annabeth stopped speaking when Naruto formed a Rasengan in his hand that quickly got everyone's attention. Naruto why are you? Chiron was about to talk before a growl ripped through the silent air causing everyone to tense and look over to where Naruto was looking. Then out of the bushes surprising everyone jumped out what looked like a giant dog that was easily the size of a car and had eyes that looked like pools of lava and fangs easily the size of a dagger. Many panicked while others got out their weapons including Chiron. A hellhound. Someone said as the dog lumbered forward towards them. However Naruto noticed that its eyes were locked onto Percy and knew he had to step in now. It launched towards Percy but just before it got close enough Naruto appeared in front of it and shot the Rasengan forward. Rasengan. He shouted as it impacted right onto the hellhound's face which sent in spiraling back knocking down tree after tree before it stopped when it hit into a boulder. When everyone looked over they saw half the hellhound's face had pretty much been blasted off from the attack and was thrashing around wildly and as its face slowly began to heal since monsters could only be defeated by celestial bronze. However nonetheless that Rasengan to the face had to hurt like hell. Deciding to put the creature out of its misery Naruto pulled off his bow from his back and put two arrows on it. Then as quickly as possible he shot two arrows towards the hellhound and hit the beast in the throat and in the chest. The hellhound stopped moving immediately before its whole body began to sink into the floor before nothing but one of its large fangs was left. Naruto took a deep breath and turned back around to see the gobsmacked looks of the campers. What? he asked raising his eyebrows at them. That was amazing. He heard as so many looked at him in amazement at how quickly he managed to defeat the hellhound and all being awestruck at the move he just performed. Everyone wanted to ask questions and wanted to swarm him before a bright light appeared above Naruto's head just like it did Percy. Am I being claimed? He thought as he realized he could finally find out who his mom was. He's being claimed as well. Annabeth shouted as she looked on in excitement as did everyone else so they could finally see who Naruto's godly parent was since it had been a topic of many conversations through the camp. Especially with the girls since many were hoping they were not related since many were developing crushes for Naruto. Naruto looked at everyone's faces as they stared at the light which slowly began to form into a symbol. When they did however Naruto saw their faces change from amazement, to shock and then to disbelief. He saw all their eyes go as wide as possible including Chiron's who even dropped his bow from disbelief. He looked up and his eyes widened. The symbol that had formed above him was giving off silver flicks of light and Naruto could make out the symbol as a bow and arrow with a crescent moon behind it. He knew that symbol from the textbooks and since it was on the cabin that he stared at almost every day. He knew who it belonged to but he was struggling to find the words. Never did not think this was even possible. He had never even considered that she could be his mother since the chances were all but zero. There has to be some kind of mistake, Clarice said voicing everyone's thoughts. Selina in the crowd looked at Naruto in sheer amazement. He told her his godly parent was his mom and by his features she just assumed he was most likely a child of Athena, but she certain didn't expect this. The entire camp was now there and they just murmured that what they were seeing was not possible. That there must have been some kind of mix up but everyone knew there was never a mix up. It can't be, Annabeth said in a whisper as she stared at Naruto with disbelief written all over her face. He can't be hers. She couldn't. She wouldn't. She has, Chiron said finally speaking up when no one else would. But her oath, she said before being startled by Mr. D appearing. 
Mr. D who had been watching from the big house appeared next to him with sheer amazement on his face. I never imagined I would live to see this. Never in my wildest imagination did I think she would have a child and a son no less. Grover who now appeared next to Annabeth looked at the symbol and immediately dropped to his knees and bowed as far down as he could as did all the other nature spirits and satyrs that had begun appearing. Everyone began to mimic the actions as Chiron voice out, Hail Naruto Uzumaki, son of. But before he could finish another light went off getting everyone's attention again. It was not as large as the first but it appeared above the crescent moon symbol and flickered in an orange light. The symbol was that of a hearth. When that second symbol appeared all remaining color in everyone's faces just drained away and many dropped to the ground in more disbelief. Many knew what they were seeing was a historic moment. Even Mr. D and Chiron who were shocked at the first symbol and from Percy's claiming were not prepared for this either. I don't believe it, to think she too broke her oath and is related to this young man, Chiron said. This this is amazing, Annabeth said while Luke appeared next to her with the same kind of expression on his face. This is beyond what I imagined. What does this mean? Naruto said looking towards Mr. D and Chiron who began to bow again towards Naruto while Mr. D just continued to stare at the two symbols. He was strong before but now he could quite possibly have the same status as a child of the big three, if not greater, Mr. D thought as began imagining what the reactions of his fellow gods would be. Many followed Chiron's example and bowed once again. Chiron's voice then boomed out across the area breaking the silence as he said the words he never in all his years alive imagined he would ever be saying. Hail Naruto Uzumaki, son of Artemis, goddess of the moon and the hunt and descendant of Hestia, goddess of the hearth. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.